Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to FSM One's What and Where to Invest 2022. My name is Ferris. And my name is Alicia Tan. And it's our pleasure to be your host for today. 2021 has been an eventful year for us Malaysians as we were in a lockdown for most of the year. And the only way out was to get vaccinated. As we have achieved almost 100% vaccination rates and borders have been reopening coming into 2022, finally, after two years, of dealing with this pandemic, we can safely say things are looking much better and brighter than they were in the previous years. So to kickstart, our events lineup comprises various topics from sustainable ESG investing to China's new era, Asia-Pacific outlook, as well as the 2022 market outlook from top fund managers across Malaysia. So let's get started on the agenda today, shall we? Yes, we shall. Okay, so to begin with today's show, we have a few house rules to go through with you first. Now, the first one will be lucky draw prizes worth 20,000 ringgit will be given out to what and where to invest 2022 participants. Simply participate in our lucky draw sessions throughout the webinar today and you will stand a chance to win. Do note, however, that lucky draw event is only applicable to participants who join via Zoom. Wow, 20,000 ringgit to be given out? Yep. Do we know how many winners will be eligible and am I be eligible too? <laughs> so for the rest of you watching, yes, you are eligible. But for you, hmm, we have to see about it, okay? So we have 100 lucky winners winning 100 ringgit worth of cash account credit prizes. And on top of that, there will be 10 lucky winners eligible for 1,000 ringgit worth of cash account credits. Wow, could you just pick me as one of the 10 lucky winners? <laughs> that means only nine of you will be winning. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can work that out. <laughs> just kidding, by the way. Yeah, so let's run a simulation for the lucky draw segment right now. A poll will be appearing on your screen now. Just answer the questions correctly and your responses will be recorded. These polls will only appear randomly during speaker sessions, so do not miss out on it. So you have 10 chances to try your luck on the Alaki Draw throughout the entire event. Winners will be chosen based on the number of correct answers for the entire session. Mm. For instance, if you answered 10 questions correctly, you stand a higher chance to win. And on top of that, in conjunction with today's event, there will also be 0% sales charge on all unit trusts from participating fund houses, as well as 0% subscription fees on all our in-house managed portfolios. The promotion is valid from the 22nd of January until the 28th of January, 2022. Should you wish to speak to our FSM1 team, they are reachable via these channels. So lastly, if you are familiar with our FSM1 virtual events, you would know that there will be an allocation of 15 minutes for Q&A sessions after each speaking session. So if you have any questions for our fund managers, please leave them in the Q&A box. Now that we have got all of the house rules out of the way, I'm excited to see what the speaker has to say throughout the day. To kickstart our event today, allow me to introduce Mr. Wong Wei Yi, our General Manager of FSM1 Malaysia, to deliver his opening speech. Wei Yi, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our annual What and Where to Invest event. And thank you for spending your Saturday with us to learn more about the financial markets development. We had previously envisioned a strong economic recovery in 2021, as we had expected the COVID situation to turn endemic and the world start to normalize. While we had seen in strong recovery initially, that recovery was hampered by new strains of COVID variants, uh, such as the Delta and Omicron uh, in the middle of the last year. As a result, markets went through some turbulence. However, if you had uh, exposure to developed markets equities, I believe the returns on your portfolio will still be very decent. Among the various markets that we track, Chinese equities delivered the worst returns, being dragged down by the properties and the tech sector. 
the property developers are in the black sheep currently as they have been over leveraged and a number of them are actually defaulting on their loans. As for the tech companies, the Chinese government has decided to rein them in in the second half of uh, 2021 and therefore we've seen sharp plunge in their share prices. Moving to the last quarter of the year, investors start to seriously consider the impact of rising inflation and that central banks may have to uh, tighten their monetary policies more aggressively. As such, investors were less willing to invest into equities, uh, leading to lackluster performance of equities market in quarter four. Developing markets equities in particular have underperformed their developed markets counterpart by a significant margin. As central banks start to adjust their policies this year, we would just have to be uh, prepared that it may be rocky for both equities as well as fixed income asset classes. Our regional research team has put out a number of articles sharing our in-house views of the various regions for 2022. Please feel free to read them on our website. Just like previous years, today we have lined up a number of great fund managers to share with you their views on various asset classes and different regions in the world. I'm sure this information will be very helpful to you as you tweak your portfolio to deal with the coming challenges. On the FSM1 platform, I'm happy to announce that we have roll out, successfully rolled out our stock trading services uh, in, in last year, starting with Busa in March, followed by the Hong Kong and the US stock exchanges in August, and lastly, the SGX in December. I hope you have tried our stocks trading services and we are definitely grateful for investors who have graciously put up with our teething problems. Going forward, we'll be looking to add more exchanges onto our platform so that investors can continue to invest globally and profitably via FSM1. Other notable features that we'll be rolling out this year would include the regular savings plan for ETF, and with this feature, investors can practice dollar cost averaging on their ETFs at a lower brokerage fee. We will also be introducing Islamic cash accounts so that our Muslim clients can have a better parking tool. Of course, there will also be many other enhancements uh, to be rolled out in due time. And this is to ensure that all of you would continue to have a great investment experience with us. With this, I would like to, I would like to thank all of you for your support of FSM1 in 2021. And we look forward to serving you better this year. Lastly, for our Chinese clients, I would like to wish you a happy new year in advance and of course, wish you prosperity and good health in 2022. Thank you.
Welcome back. Let's kick today's session off with our first speaker. Joining us today is John Lau, and he is a portfolio manager of Afin Huang Asset Management Berhad. John focuses on coverage across the China and Hong Kong market, as well as Taiwan's technology and automation sectors. John has been in the industry for eight years and has four years of experience in equities research when he joined Afin Huang Asset Management. Prior to this, he was a senior equity analyst with Public Mutual Berhad, where he was responsible for covering the Macau Gaming, property, cement, and railway sectors in China and Hong Kong. John graduated with a Bachelor's of Economics from the University of Queensland, Australia, and is a CFA holder. We would now like to invite John with his topic, China, New Era, New Focus. John, take it away. As what we are seeing right now in, in, in the US or probably uh, some parts of Europe as well. So starting with GDP growth, um, as some of you may know, China actually has a very solid target to double their 2022 GDP uh, by 2035. So that means uh, from now to 2035, uh, at least annually, they have to grow um, somewhere between 4 to 4.5 uh, per year from now to, uh, to 2035 uh, on average. So what we think is that it will be a step down kind of five-year growth uh, average uh, move, moving forward. And hence, we are still thinking that at least this year, uh, we are probably going to see above 5% uh, at least uh, GDP growth. So uh, China has this uh, famous uh, saying from, from President Xi Jinping that they are now not focusing on high growth, uh, but instead they are focusing on high quality growth. But for us, we believe that um, the numerical target is, is likely to stay. So the, the growth that we have been uh, seeing in the past are probably driven by mainly consumption and, and, and investment. But 2021 was a unique year where uh, the, the major economies globally, other major economies globally are, are recovering from uh, COVID. Hence, um, the export, uh, the, the exports from China was extraordinarily high. Uh, hence, 2021's GDP growth was actually largely driven by net exports. Um, as you can see from this chart, uh, other than net exports, actually the, the rest of the matrices are pretty weak, uh, especially towards the end of the uh, of the year in 2021. So, in 2022, what we are expecting is that investment growth uh, will come back. In, in, in some way, because Chinese government has, has already committed to front load what they call fiscal policy. And also, uh, they're probably uh, from, from a tax uh, rebate or, or tax burden reducing side, uh, companies might be able to spend a little bit more on uh, investing in their own uh, capex as well. Other than that, uh, we are hopeful that we will see some kind of uh, uh, recovery in, in consumption as well. But that is that also hinges on how China will handle COVID. Uh, moving forward. We'll touch upon that uh, sometime later as well. Okay, so this is a very important matrix that, that we watch out very closely. Uh, it's called credit impulse. For the benefit of all audiences, um, credit impulse is a ratio uh, where in, in a very simple way, uh, very simplistically, it means that for every extra um, credit uh, created, for every extra unit of credit created, how much strength can this in, in, in terms of producing an extra unit of GDP growth? So an extra of unit uh, created, how much strength uh, it can boost uh, extra unit of GDP growth? So you can see that from this chart, 2021, uh, the yellow, yellow orange line uh, plunged into the negative territory towards the second half of 2021. And we are expecting this to rebound in this year. So why is this important? You will see another chart later on that uh, one of our thesis uh, hinges on this credit impulse rebound as well. Moving forward, China is one of the rare major economies in the world that are likely to, to, to be easing. Uh, in fact, they have already started easing. So if you have been following the news, they have been cutting interest rate, they have been cutting uh, triple R uh, for the banks. So um, China, look, looking at this chart, you, you, you can see that uh, Think places like uh, countries like US has already started uh, started tapering. Uh, talking about uh, rate hikes, probably starting from March, uh, even to to the extent of balance sheet reduction or whatnot. But China is one that is 
um, going against that flow, uh, what, what, what we call decoupling, where they are likely to be uh, moving ahead with, uh, with an easing bias uh, in at least in this year. So signs of easing, like I've mentioned, they have started to cut uh, interest rates. Uh, they have started to cut lending rates. So uh, we have seen one just yesterday as well, uh, which is a, a strong signal. Um, hence, moving forward, we do expect that they will continue to do it, uh, uh, albeit that each time they might be doing baby steps, for example, five or 10 basis points kind of cut, uh, because it is not uh, a Chinese style to, to do, uh, in Chinese, what we call or, or flooding the system with credit. It's, it's, not, it's just not their style. So uh, they will probably continue to, uh, with their baby steps and, and, uh, and one step at a time. So we do expect uh, further cuts coming uh, at least in the first half of the year. On inflation, so China, you can see this chart, China is not really facing a huge um, inflationary pressure uh, uh, at, the, at the moment. And we are observing that food prices are actually declining or picking out uh, in China. And on the producer side as well, the cost pressure is also, uh, is also declining. Uh, some of you might notice that uh, the raw materials, um, metals prices were very, very high last year uh, due to several reasons. But uh, we are seeing this raw mat price are, are also turning around. For China equities, uh, so if history does give any lessons, um, it will be a year of hope, as you can see in this very nicely uh, charted uh, picture here. So, but in 2022, we are not expecting that uh, it will be a strong earnings year. I think earnings will still be uh, normalized. Uh, but it will probably be a year more of a um, PE or so-called valuation recovery year for China. So for China itself, where we uh, where, where would we put our money in, we do see that there will be more uh, opportunities in, in the growth sector. So again, back to this credit impulse chart that we have seen just now, uh, historically on your left, the chart on your left, uh, historic, historically MSCI China growth uh, will have a pretty good correlation uh, with credit impulse. So hence, given that our view that uh, credit impulse is likely to rebound in 2022, uh, growth sector should perform better. And looking at valuations perspective, uh, MSI China has actually underperformed its regional peers pretty badly in 2021. Uh, hence the chart on your left, you see that it's a rare case where they underperform so severely. And on your right, uh, from a PE perspective, from valuations perspective, they are uh, pretty uh, attractive as well at an attractive level. So you, you might be thinking that oh, it's probably all because of internet. But if you take out internet from, uh, from the index, actually the valuations is quite okay as well. So key things in 2022, and maybe it will uh, prolong uh, towards 2025, uh, are, are these that uh, we are seeing that for obvious reasons, China is spending a lot of effort in, in, in ramping up the advanced technology. This includes things like uh, robotics, uh, automation, chip makings, um, 5G, uh, and etc. Other than that, uh, China has made a huge commitment in, in, in boosting their, their renewables. Um, we are seeing that China is going to uh, spend a lot of uh, money on smart manufacturing as well to increase productivity. And uh, this is partly because also uh, because they are facing challenging population uh, trajectory moving forward, aging population uh, and, and, and things like that. So uh, you might have heard the term common prosperity. Uh, it is some kind of ideology that's happening in China right now. But what we think uh, it implies is that the middle income group or the middle income uh, population is likely to grow. Hence, the, uh, we, will, we, we will see certain uh, companies or certain sectors to benefit from a rising or a growing middle-income population. And, and lastly, will be a, a resilient staples. So uh, we, we still think that spending power within China is, is pretty solid. And there's uh, things that, that is uh, re, uh, re, what, what we call staples like your food, milk, um, uh, 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 rice, water kind of thing. So all these things are, are still going to see solid uh, demand and, and, and growth uh, moving forward as well. So these are the key five themes uh, that, that we identified uh, in China for, for 2022. What are the key challenges? Um, very quickly to touch upon this. Uh, first of all, 
most of you have heard about the names of Evergrande uh, and increasingly more names that appears in the news that are likely to default uh, in the property space. So indeed, uh, property sector is very, very big. It's estimated to be contributing directly or indirectly uh, at least 25% of China's uh, economy. So when we look at this chart, um, not only that investment is falling, not only that uh, money spending is falling, but also more importantly, the home prices in China, we have seen that it has declined four consecutive months of, uh, 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 of decline. So with home prices declining, the home prices expectation is also pretty weak. Hence, uh, it's, it's sort of a viral um, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a viral circulation. So moving forward, uh, what what we see right now is that government is uh, sort of easing at the margins. They are trying to do targeted specific easing on the property sector. It is still um, yet to be seen. Well, how, how huge or what kind of impact can this bring? But the challenges uh, remains. Uh, if property sector cannot stabilize, uh, Chinese economy will likely to weaken further. And I know we see zero COVID strategy. So, um, this is the daily new cases conference. Thank, thank you everyone for, for, for signing in back again. I thank you very much for sticking by. So where we cut off just now was that what are the key challenges that probably China will be facing uh, this year? So very quickly on property sector, I guess we have run through it just now. So uh, secondly, will be on uh, COVID. So regardless whether you believe what China is reporting, uh, uh, whether it is true or not, I think more importantly is the trend uh, of these new confirmed cases, where looking at this chart, uh, since the second half or towards the end of November last year, the trend has been going up. And in China, they are still sticking by this strategy called a uh, zero COVID strategy, where in any area or any town where they identified just one confirmed cases, they will do strict uh, movement restriction, they will do mass testing, and uh, they will sort of, even for a very short time, shut down uh, that particular area. So this is something that is very detrimental to the economy. Hence, we see that fourth quarter last year, actually GDP growth are weakened uh, quarter on quarter. But uh, the key question here is whether moving forward, will China uh, sort of have uh, softened their, their stance on this zero COVID strategy? And um, what we think is that before the Winter Olympics is very unlikely, but towards post-Winter Olympics in Beijing and uh, moving forward, if they are still unable to contain, especially with this new Omicron uh, variant that is very infectious, uh, they are likely to maybe in some ways soften their stance on this. But if they do not, uh, we do think that consumption as a whole will continue to be uh, hampered uh, in, in this uh, environment. Of course, foreign relationship is also a big challenge for China. For us, uh, we do not believe that a US-China relationship will improve. Um, but at the same time, we don't think that it will probably worsen from here. Both sides have their own agendas domestically. US is going to have their, uh, have, have their midterm election. Uh, China is going to have their so-called uh, NTC by uh, October, where uh, presidency is likely, uh, highly likely to remain uh, for his third term. So both sides have their uh, a, a domestic agenda, so probably they will spend less time fighting. But at the same time, we don't believe that we, we don't think that uh, things will get easier uh, between the two. So, in conclusion, uh, three things: China economy is likely to be okay, uh, to be supported, uh, rightly so. That government currently, from the fiscal policy side, from the monetary policy side, both sides they are uh, more proactive right now. Secondly, it will be that uh, in terms of equities, the market for China uh, specifically, we, we, we do think that a valuation could see a, a recovery, uh, if not full, but then uh, growth will be our preference. And thirdly, which is very important for us, is that be nimble and don't be too stubborn in, in a way. Like some, some things that, that I, I would like to share with our audience is that we, we, can, we can spend a little bit more time thinking like, is the China today and, and, and for the coming five to 10 years the same as the China we, we saw in the past 10 years that, that, that probably many people made a lot of money from? Um, are, the, are the internet guys, are the internet giants rem, uh, going to remain as the key players in the market? Or uh, there could be a new reshuffling or there could be a new uh, focus moving forward. I think that is something that 
probably we, we will not see or notice overnight, but it is a question that we are asking ourselves uh, day in, day out, uh, where the next opportunity lies. And if China is not going to be the same uh, as compared to the past 10 years, what has changed and where are they changing to? And that will be the opportunity that we are going after. So be nimble. Um, and uh, we, we have to change when, when China change because um, we are in the capital market of China trying to play their game. Hence, we have to follow their rules. Hence, uh, we have to be very, very uh, uh, flexible and uh, diversify uh, is, is the way to go, uh, at least for, for the market that is changing pretty quickly. So, um, so that concludes uh, that concludes my presentation uh, today. Uh, we will open up for Q&A for now, if there's any question. Okay, there, there's one uh, question from Sam. Do you see any China index A50 will go up based on the good factor? Mm. Um, A50, I, I assume that you are speaking of the, from, from the Asia, uh, Asia's perspective by the domestic market. So what um, domestic market is very different from, from the head share uh, head share offshore market. I, I believe that if most of you uh, have followed China for a while, you would be aware that the key difference between A50 or, 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 or domestic market versus head share market would be that the, the, the index component is very different. In, on the Asia side, the large caps are still mainly financials, are still largely uh, consumption or uh, consumer related uh, companies. So if the view is that uh, financials is going to outperform. If the, if the view is that uh, uh, um, if the view is that consumption is going to outperform, then A fifty or, or so called domestic market is, is where you would you would want to invest in. So my view is that um, from the head share side, which has done very badly in twenty twenty one, when we talk about valuation recovery, probably the opportunity is is where it lies uh, from a valuation perspective. But I'm not saying that A50 is, is going to perform very badly, but just a relative basis is that I think the opportunity of upside uh, will probably come from a uh, share side. Okay, thank you, John. I think most of the question uh, they are asking about the China, Asia, and head share, which one will be favorable in 2022? Lah. I, think, I think you have answered that as well. Uh, uh, just let me add one point. I think, okay. I think we have to we have to be aware that what will push the head share market. So if you look at uh, Hang Seng or if you look at MSI China as a whole, uh, about 30, uh, at least one third of the index is made out of uh, Chinese internet or new or so-called new media stocks. So if we have the view that um, this will continue, I mean, if we, if we, if we view that, okay, um, internet stocks are continue to dominate, if we expect that, okay, uh, probably regulatory pressure is over, then you can probably uh, stick to this. Otherwise, then if we have the view that, okay, this is uh, probably the best time for them, it's gone, um, then probably we'll see some time in, in adjustments in the index. To, to give you some background perspective, in the past, uh, maybe 30 years ago or, or 20 odd years ago, index uh, for, for China, the largest ones are the telcos, right? Your China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom. And after that, you, you are the banks. They, they, they were the banks with the, the heavyweights. Uh, but 10 years later, it became, it became the internet guys, which became the heavyweights in the index. So the index itself is changing, is adapting, is shifting uh, by, 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 by uh, so, sort of 10 years each. So moving forward, are we expecting a change uh, in, in that side? So I guess that will give you an answer. If, uh, if you are confident that um, China internets are to come back, then that is where you want to be. But if you think that probably not, something might be changing, then we, we have to remind ourselves that probably we have to change in our thinking as well. Okay, thanks, John. There, there will be another question from YouTube. So further on on your answer, would, uh, would that be the China will be still taxing or they will still impose the penalty on those giant uh, technology company going forward? What is your mm -hmm. view? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, my view is that it will it will go on. My, my view is that China internet giants uh, will continue to suffer from um, uh, from regu regulatory pressure. But the nuance here is that the intensity of new regulations might have already been behind us. So what, what, what do I mean by that? So last year, 2021, is that almost every week, 
almost every week we see a new regulation out to, to control this and that from advertising to antitrust uh, to, to platforms and whatnot uh, to take weights. But then moving forward, are we going to see uh, new regulation every week? I think probably not. I think where we are right now is the implement in implementation phase where the, the, the written laws are already there. This year uh, is the year for internet companies to comply and comply strictly. And probably it takes time as well for Chinese regulators to come to step in and, 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 and exec, uh, execute. Because when you have written law, you need to execute it. And it is not something very easy. It's a very huge economy uh, in terms of uh, internet or digital media uh, economy, uh, economy as a whole. For Chinese officials to learn and step up their game uh, in order to control or rein in these big giants, it takes time as well. So moving forward, it will be more likely we will probably see news like who gets fined, who gets caught, who gets named, rather than new regulation every week. Okay, uh, So I think that's what has changed. So in short, I think they will continue to be under pressure. I think that uh, from a bottom-up fundamental perspective, they, they will continue to, we will continue to see changes in their business model uh, in order to comply with what government wants. But in terms of intense, intensity of new regulations, I think we have already gone past that. Okay, thank, thank you, John. So, uh, okay, there, there's another question from uh, one of the attendees here. For China Asia market, what will you comment on the re recent rotation for EV, electrical vehicle or semicon, uh, semiconductor to financial uh, and consumer taper would it be the will it be the last for the whole year, and what is the benefit sector for the interest rate and RR card? Okay, great question. Okay, so one by one, right? We are talking first. I will address value rotation. Okay, what happened uh, in the first three three weeks, right? In in in, in the Chinese market, we see EV sectors uh, being taken off profit, and then they are flo floating money into. Uh, things like financials, like you have mentioned. I think what is happening here is really 2021, in a very, very bad year, investors that had made a lot of money in EVs are taking profit. And I think that is a very wise move. Uh, so we, by taking profit in, at the beginning of the year, it, it gives them the bullet to prepare for the rest of the year. So in China, we have to remember that uh, for, the re, for, for the economy to really kickstart, it actually starts after Chinese New Year. So basically, practically, usually in the first month, uh, is a warm-up phase for, for China economy or China market. So when you prepare your capital for the rest of the year, I think after Chinese New Year is where the, the, is, is where, uh, the, the game really starts. So is this rotation something that will last? Okay, to be honest, I, I, I can't say for sure. I don't, I don't really have a crystal ball. But in my view, um, banks, properties, and things like that, these are very cyclical uh, in, in nature. So in a very general way, cyclicals have, have a timing. So it's not something that you can uh, probably see them go for a very long time. It, it goes in cycles. But things like EV renewables, things like um, 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 uh, 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 energy transformation. So that is where that I think moving forward, China will spend a lot more attention and uh, spend a lot more time and money in. For example, how to uh, effectively or efficiently ration your energy uh, when you are starting to cut off so-called uh, uh, your car carbon car carbon dirty energy, and uh, when we are talking about EVs, uh, penetration rate is higher. How are they going going to continue to have this penetration improve moving forward? Where are they going to spend? Is it the charging stations? Is it the battery improvement? We still have a lot of technology uh, innovation uh, going on in within the EV space itself. Semiconductors. China is definitely going to keep on uh, spending because they are still very far off uh, as compared to their mature peers globally. So they, 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 they don't want to be choked. Uh, hence, they are going to continue to spend. So those are, uh, those are the areas that I think there's a very, very long runway, structural way. Of course, in between, there might be cycles. Uh, but the question here is that, uh, do we want to trade in and out every month or do we, do we really want to find a big direction and let's just uh, invest our money in and, and look, look, look for the long-term gains uh, where, where, where we can reap benefit from. Sorry, you have the second part of the question, right? Uh, yeah, uh, the second part of the question will be, uh, how will this company be affected by the RRR card? Uh, sure. Okay, 
RR, okay, first, firstly, I think probably for the benefit of all audience, what is actually RR? RR is, is a ratio, it's, it's the portion of money where banks have to keep with the central bank. So uh, every uh, commercial bank will have to store some, some money with the central bank. And, once, uh, and when RR is being reduced, means that commercial banks have a little bit more money to lend out to the real economy. So that's, that's what RR really is. So when RR cuts, in some way, it helps ease um, banks, uh, um, um, what's it called? Capital, uh, banks' capital uh, costs, uh, funding costs, okay? But when RR is being cut, but at the same time, lending rate is also being cut, hence actually is pretty neutral for the banks uh, in, in, in our view. It's, it's not going to be really uh, impactful to them. More importantly, RR cut to us is not really a very powerful tool to the economy. Hence, to answer the question directly, no, we don't think that RR cut itself will benefit any specific sector, but RR cut is a very good signal that where government wants, what government is doing. So RR cut shows that government is seeing and acknowledging that uh, yes, the economy needs more liquidity. RR cut plus uh, lending rate cuts also gives a signal to the market that yes, we are going on an easing cycle right now. So I think that's more important to the whole in economy itself. Thank you. Okay, John. So I, I think I will ask uh, one last question over here. Uh, on another aspect, uh, what is your view on the US and China tension? Will we be still continue in 2022? And it will, will we still affect the, uh, either China A or China H market? Sure. Um, I think I sort of touched on this topic, but to elaborate a little bit more. In US itself, um, the Republicans and the Democrats, they disagree with 99.9% .9 of things in the world. But if there's one thing that both of them agree on, is that they are both negative towards China. Hence, in that, from that perspective, they are not going to get easy on China anytime soon. We, we don't think so. From China's perspective, uh, at when, when US is so hostile to them and probably ganging up with other countries, China itself is probably not going to step down as well. So with two sides being pretty hard on their stance, I don't think that there will be any improvement or meaningful improvement uh, moving forward between the two countries. What I will be watching out for is that will there be more conversations, meaning will there be more high-level talks between two sides, even though that sometimes on the surface, we, we, we don't see any big announcements from any side. Sometimes it, it, it feels like that. But the frequency of conversation to me is actually a signal because when two sides, when, when high officials meet together, something must be going on behind the scenes that something might have already been agreed behind the scenes before they come out and, and, and talk to each other uh, before the media. Hence, when the frequency of talks, if the frequency of talks uh, increase, I think that's a good sign for both sides. But uh, at least from an economic perspective, I think both sides have their domestic worries, have their domestic agenda to handle in 2022 itself. So probably not too much action that I think uh, will be going on a bit between the two. I think what is probably more imminent currently will be on the ADRs, which is the Chinese uh, stocks that are listed in the US. Those are facing delisting pressure. I think that is the, uh, the, the one big thing that I think will probably really happen uh, probably in 2023 or 2024. Okay, thank, thank you, John, for answering all those questions. And then I, I think because of time, uh, because of the time, then we we thanks uh, John for sharing on this uh, Chinese market. And then uh, we will pass back to Ferris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Welcome back, everyone. Moving on to our second speaker of the day, Mr. Christopher Kaur. He is the head of equities in Kananga Investor Bahad. Christopher joined Kananga Investor Bahad in January 2014 as a portfolio manager and currently has more than 12 years of experience in financial markets. His responsibilities include portfolio management, macro strategy, as well as research coverage on selected markets and sectors. Previously, he was with Meridian Asset Management, where he was also involved in managing local and regional portfolios. He began his career with M Investment Bank in the Equity Capital Markets Department, where he worked on numerous deals including initial public offerings, full-on equity offerings, secondary placement, and underwriting risk assessments. He graduated from Monash University, Australia, with a Bachelor of Commerce, Accounting and Finance, and he is also a CFA charter holder and a holder of a CMSRL license. We will now invite Mr. Christopher with his topic, Global Market Outlook 2022 Late Cycle Dynamics. We will now turn the time over to Mr. Christopher. The stage is yours. All right, uh, morning everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, I think I'll just get started. So welcome to our market outlook for 2022 uh, entitled Late Cycle Dynamics. Just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Christopher Kok. I'm the head of equities uh, at Kananga. And we have a team of about, I think, uh, 14 people in the equities uh, team at Kananga. I think for those of you who follow us for a while, uh, you all would know. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, without uh, delay, let's, uh, let's take it away. I think for today, I think I'll, I'll give you a very brief uh, overview on uh, what's happening in global markets, uh, as well as Malaysia, and then a bit on the uh, our funds. Uh, of course, I think um, all of you might be aware, I think this week has been a quite uh, bad week for markets, and I'll touch a bit on that towards the end. Okay, global market review. Uh, let's start with uh, what happened uh, last year in 2021. So I think last year, the performance has been actually diverged uh, quite a fair bit. Uh, we saw actually developed markets like um, the US, uh, Europe uh, actually outperforming uh, quite significantly, uh, whereas China uh, actually underperformed uh, quite badly. So if we see the range performance, we see that I think um, between Taiwan and India and Europe, they're up more than 20%. I think uh, if you look at the MSCI China, it was down more than 20%. I think most China funds uh, did fairly poorly last year. As for the KLCI, I think we were slightly negative, um, ar around the range of 3 to 4%. Okay, I think I'll talk about um, going straight into the global cycle. So I think with regards to the global cycle, I think I'll go into the US, uh, Europe, uh, and then China. Um, okay, for the US, I think it fits into the title of our presentation, which is they're moving to late cycle. So after you know the coronavirus crisis, the US bounced back very strongly. Uh, I think they bounced back uh, close to 5.6% uh, in uh, 2021. Um, this is due to the vaccination, uh, which actually led to the reopening and also the record fiscal and monetary stimulus, uh, which, were, which actually contributed to a strong economy. So in 2022, I think growth, growth was slow to about 3.9%. Uh, but the momentum is still strong in the first half. So factors supporting growth uh, include the labor market. I think we saw unemployment come down to a very low level. Um, I think the economy is uh, rebounding strongly because you know the amount of money the government pumped in the last two years. Uh, the inventory and capex upcycle is still uh, you know an uptrend. So a lot of companies that we uh, study and the companies that we analyze actually increased spending uh, in terms of business upgrades uh, this year. Whereas I think towards the middle of this year we'll see. Uh, factors detracting, uh, which include a lower amount of fiscal support. So after a record, you know, budget uh, stimulus in 2020 and 2021, we'll see that uh, declining again, and also rising inflation. So I think the key point to note here is that I think the U.S. Federal Reserve is turning hawkish. Uh, so I think in December we saw actually the CPI uh, inflation at a decade high level of seven percent, and actually this triggered talks of actually, um, you know increased pace of tightening and uh, interest rate hikes. So I think the market is expecting about three to four hikes. Uh, if you look at the uh, probability here on Bloomberg, uh, so market is expecting about three to four hikes. Of course, whether they can actually do this is uh, still yet to be seen, uh, depending on how the economy pans out. Uh, but I think more importantly, they have announced that they have an end to the QE program. So in the last two years, you know, the Fed has been buying 
you know, 50 to 100 billion uh, in terms of assets every month. Right now, they announced that they're going to stop in March. Actually, they might even stop next week in January. And they're also guiding for potentially, uh, you know, a decrease in the balance sheet, which would result in uh, um, actually uh, them actually withdrawing liquidity from the markets uh, instead. Uh, EU, I think EU is uh, maybe a quarter behind the US. Uh, I think its growth is expected to catch up to the USA uh, with a fastest expansion of 6% in the first quarter. Uh, however, Europe is a big importer of energy and then the rising oil and gas prices could be a slight drive on growth. But I think overall what we see is that I think the, the, the European Union is just slightly behind the US in terms of recovery. And I think we'll see the, you know, another strong recovery in the first quarter as well. So I think for the full year, I think you, uh, Europe is still looking at about 3 to 4% in terms of GDP growth. Uh, in terms of the uh, liquidity, uh, I think um, you know, the ECB, the European Central Bank has been following the footsteps of the, uh, the US in terms of pumping money into the economy. So they actually announced last year the uh, EU 1.85 trillion program. Uh, this will end in actually March uh, this year. Um, but then again, they will actually continue on with their other program, which is their asset purchase program. So actually the, the, the key takeaway is that the ECB uh, is actually more, um, you know, um, more supportive compared to the US because they still have this asset purchase program and they will still be pumping in money into the economy uh, at a rate of you know, 40, but then decreasing to about 20 uh, towards the end of the year. So inflation is also uh, picking up, um, but I think ECB, you know, their, um, uh, their view is that inflation is a bit more transitory. So you know, they haven't guided for any rate increases yet. So in terms of monetary policy, Europe is definitely much easier than the US. So moving on to China. So you notice that you know whenever we cover certain regions, we talk a bit about the fundamentals in terms of GDP growth, and then we talk about the monetary policy because we believe that these two are the two main factors that affect markets. Number one, the fundamentals. I think number two, uh, liquidity and monetary policy. So for China, I think last year was uh, a bad year, as you all know. Um, there's been a, a very sharp deceleration. So don't forget that China was the first out of the COVID crisis, and therefore they were actually the first to slow down as well. But not just that, actually, the government has been uh, taking this opportunity to tighten um, various sectors um, due to their desire to have uh, you know, structural reform. So actually, they, they want to actually engineer a more you know, um, equal economy. So actually, last year, the big theme was actually um, you know, equality for all, uh, common prosperity, and so on. So actually, they focus a lot on you know, breaking up uh, monopolies uh, in, you know, in various sectors. They wanted to cool down the property sector by tightening the loans. And they also want to reduce pollution by, uh, you know, decarbonization. So we saw a lot of measures that were actually, you know, impacted listed companies. Uh. So uh, that's why the market declined last year. I think uh, this year growth, um, growth was will, will actually, you know, forecasted at five percent. But you know, if the government doesn't, uh, you know, loosen policy a bit more, it could drop a bit below five. Right. So property uh, sector last year was also a drag. You know, um, I'm sure we all heard about the Evergrande uh, property crisis. So this actually impacted a lot of other subsectors as well. So we see that I think here you can see property sales have been coming off. Um, but I think the good news for China is that you know we are towards the end of the slowdown. And in terms of the GDP, if you look at the GDP year on year uh, growth basis, it actually picks up again from the second quarter of 2022, 4.2 to 4.7 to 5.7. So I think what's interesting to note is that you know, China is moving in the opposite direction of the U.S., whereas U.S. is entering a late cycle, you know, their growth is starting to slow a bit. Um, you know, the Federal Reserve is tightening policy and hiking interest rates. China is going in the opposite direction. China is, you know, growth, growth has been slowing and now it's starting to pick up a little bit. You see the Chinese um, government starting to ease policy and, and growth are expected to rebound this year. So I think in terms of monetary policy, there's been, you know, some easing at the margin. So the PBOC has been cutting the reserve requirement ratio the amount of money the banks uh, need to keep a reserve and not lend out. So by cutting this, the banks have more money to lend out. So basically, they've cut it by 50 bips in December. Um, and I think earlier this year, we saw, you know, China has many different interest rates. So we saw actually uh, some adjustment downwards in a few of these key rates. Uh, um, I mean, one of them is the loan prime rate. Uh, the other term is the medium term lending facility. So uh, I think uh, that was in the news the last two weeks. So I think the overall takeaway is that, the, you know, Chinese wants to reduce the the interest rates and actually uh, put more money into the economy, uh, which should help a little bit <clears throat> to stabilize things. 
So what is the takeaway? So I think the growth outlook was strong across uh, developed economies, US and Europe, but the rate of change is slowing. So after, after a very strong rebound in 2021, we think uh, you know, US will start to slow down. Um, but I think uh, China is uh, in the opposite case. China actually will actually uh, start to pick up, uh, in fact. And this is actually an important factor of having a diversified portfolio, which I'll go into later again. So we expect emerging markets to actually uh, pick up. I think we, I mean, we saw that a lot of these uh, emerging markets like Asia, I think last year, um, was still struggling with COVID, you know, battling with lockdowns. Uh, which is why you know we didn't uh, rebound as strongly as the US. I think this year, you know, hopefully there's no there's no more lockdowns, so we start to see a lot of these uh, Asian uh, Asian countries uh, recover again. So in terms of monetary policy, I think uh, they're being a titan. So US Fed will be the first mover, uh, although the number of uh, hikes is still up for debate. So I think equities, you know, uh, could see high volatility. Uh, you know, we saw US market quite volatile this week. Um, although, you know, the fundamentals in terms of growth is still supportive, but, you know, when monetary policy starts to tighten, we, we, we might see, you know, you know, higher swings both up and down. So in terms of uh, key risks, I think key risk is still inflation, which will prompt the Fed to be, you know, um, continuously tight. And I think the second one, hard landing in China, you know, for now, I think the government seems to uh, recognize that need to stimulate the economy, but you know, if for whatever reason, you know, they backtrack and they did not stimulate enough, then I think uh, China's growth could disappoint. Right, so I think uh, to summarize, we still prefer emerging markets this year. I think um, if you read some of our outlooks that we've been publishing, we've been saying that uh, we, uh, we are overweight uh, Asia in terms of China and ASEAN uh, this year uh, versus developed markets. Okay, uh, going to Malaysia. For Malaysia, I'll spend a bit more time uh, since it's our key market and also our home ground. For Malaysia, a key trends to talk about is I think this year will be a year of economic recovery. Uh, Bank Negara should stay accommodative uh, throughout um, at least the first half. Uh, EPF contribution flows to turn positive and uh, you know, we're starting from a very low foreign shareholding uh, base. And as for risk, I think the risk is the, um, you know, COVID is still a risk on the horizon. You know, hopefully there will not be any more lockdowns. Uh, number two is the rise in taxation. You know, we saw Chupai Mahmo being implemented, which actually uh, is going to impact the profits of, uh, you know, big public sector companies. Um, so, we you know, if there's any more taxes, I think that could also, uh, you know, manage confidence a bit. And of course, number three, uh, monetary tightening in the US. And number four is a possibility of a general election this year. Okay, so uh, moving on to uh, number one, team number one year of recovery. So last year we saw actually growth uh, anemic at about three to four uh, percent, but this year I think the expectations that you'll bounce, bounce to about five to six percent, um, simply you know because of the uh, reopening uh, in, in the economy. And um, you know, given our high vaccination rate, uh, we'll probably see um, you know this uh, reopening progress. Uh, and I think as of early of this year, I think it's close to 79% of the population was fully vaccinated already. And I think about 20% has received uh, booster shots. So I think this um, argues in favor of a continued uh, reopening. Uh, supporting the growth in GDP will be consumer spending. So we think that, you know, there is still a lot of pent up spending in, uh, in consumer. I mean, if you just go out to malls, I think you can see, uh, you know, malls being busy as ever as well. So we think retail sales will actually recover this year. And uh, you know, um, over the last two years, there's been a fair amount of savings uh, being built up uh, in the consumer's balance sheet as well. So this should actually help consumption. And I think the key sector to benefit from this is banks. So I think um, you know, banks are normally a beneficiary when the economy starts to recover and interest rates um, you know, start to move up so that they can actually uh, have better the interest margins. Uh, asset quality is stabilizing. And the loans under repayment assistance is expected to stabilize in the back of economic recovery. Uh, so we think that loans can grow about four to five percent uh, this year, and that will be positive for the banks, which are trading, uh, you know, still fairly cheaply compared to the the last five year mean in terms of price to book, uh, which is the key valuation metric we use for banks. So moving on to point number two, uh, I think Bank Nagara to stay accommodative um, in the uh, first half. So. I think Bank Nagaro will likely follow the US Fed. Um, I think the expectation is that you know there could be one or two uh, rate hikes this year for Bank Nagara, uh, probably by middle of the year, uh, towards the second half. 
Um, but I think in the recent statement, they have mentioned that they are more concerned on the growth outlook, uh, citing that there's risk to both you know, global and domestic economies. And you know, we are, for Malaysia, I think we're still very early in the recovery. <clears throat> so it is not so, um, it is not wise to, to shock the economy with uh, too many rate hikes at the beginning stage. Uh, additionally, the CPI is forecast at 2% for 2022. Yeah, I know 2% seems low if you look at the price of goods and uh, services nowadays. Uh, but you know this is what they are using, and uh, based on this, it it doesn't push for uh, for for many rate hikes uh, at the moment. Number three is that EPF withdrawal schemes are over. Why is this a good thing? Because I think last year um, there have been a lot of withdrawals by the EPF. Um, about one hundred billion was was withdrawn from EPF, and as you know, the EPF is a big investor, uh, both in the local equity and bond market. And when they are hit with withdrawals, they would have to actually sell or maybe even uh, reduce the investments uh, in the local market. So I think that that has been contributing to the weakness uh, in domestic markets as well. So in this year, you know, without the withdrawals, EPF will likely uh, reinvest its inflows uh, into the domestic market um, and actually continue uh, to be a, a factor supporting the market uh, as it has in the, in the, in the years past. Uh, theme number four is low foreign shareholding. Uh, I suppose this, you know, you can look at it both for the glass half full, half empty kind of view. Uh, you know, uh, foreign shareholding is at an all time low right now at about 20%. Uh, this was, you know, even lower, if, or actually close to the 2009 uh, lows. So I think uh, foreign selling uh, has been, uh, has reached a peak already. Um, you know, we saw the actually net outflow start to moderate uh, towards uh, November and December. 2021 uh, net outflow was about 3 billion uh, compared to 2020's outflow of about 24 billion. Uh, so I think if money does come back to emerging markets, I think Malaysia could tend to be a beneficiary as well. So in terms of the risk, I think uh, quite obvious is political risk. Um, you know, although there's been an MOU with the opposition, the MOU would actually, I think, expire in, uh, in July. So, you know, once the MOU expi uh, expires, there could be, you know, talks of uh, election or potentially one being triggered. Uh. Yep. In terms of the ringgit, I think um, um, here not, no strong factor either for or against. I think ringgit, we, we probably think ringgit will trade uh, range bound. Uh, current account is still healthy at about 3.5% of GNI. So the current account actually uh, supports the uh, currency. I think that the ringgit will be driven more by external factors such as the movement in the, the US dollar. So what is our strategy uh, given all of this? I think we know we continue to adopt a barbell investment strategy, uh, you know, with one side uh, focus on the recovery teams uh, and the other focus on the growth stocks. So we continue to like uh, the growth uh, stocks because we think that the structural um, demand trend is still intact. Um, I think. Uh, the EV team is still in its early days. In terms of EV penetration globally, we're still at a low rate. And I think the EV will continue to go, uh, grow at um, you know, 30 40% um, KGA over the next 10 years. Uh, in China, EVs has already forecasted to reach about 12% of total uh, vehicle sales. So we think that um, you know, this demand for semiconductors, uh, um, for EVs, for AI, uh, for for the Internet of Things will continue to drive a lot of these growth stocks and will continue to do so uh, this year. In terms of recovery team, uh, as I mentioned, I think we like uh, financials, the banks, uh, which will be a key play for the domestic recovery uh, this year. Uh, in terms of uh, consumption, uh, the consumer should also uh, rebound strongly this year with like consumer discretionary plays. And in, in terms of construction and property, I think it's more of a situational trading uh, uh, play. Construction, uh, no doubt, uh, will be a beneficiary if there's more jobs um, being awarded, but I think these are these are more tactical in nature. So uh, not a sector wide, but maybe just one or two names um, for the portfolio. Okay, I think um, I'll talk a bit about key fund for, uh, fund performance before talking a bit about you know uh, recent events. So I think key fund uh, key fund performance uh, last year we saw uh, I think fairly decent performance um, you know mid single digit to uh, you know the double digit performance for some of the funds. Of course, I think the the the, the standout was I think I think Canal Growth uh, did about fourteen percent. Um, and just to comment a bit, I think Asia was down uh, last year due to our you know higher exposure in China. Uh, but then again, I think this year China is recovering, so you know this fund could could actually be an outperformer this year. But uh, as you 
as you all know that the performance over three, five, and ten years has been respectable, and and I think that this is an indication that I think unit trust is a long-term investment, and you know we advise investors to you know go over the longer term. So just a bit um, before I end this uh, talk and go into Q and A, just a bit about uh, you know recent events in the market. Um, I think yeah, let me just move up to my earlier slides. Yeah, so I think uh, key markets have actually declined quite heavily this uh, this week uh, over uh, concerns that you know the U.S. Fed is withdrawing liquidity. Um, yeah, I think that is um, that is a valid fear. Uh, although you know markets are are, are are what we call you know reflective. Uh, in the case that you know the more the market declines, the more the Fed will actually you know potentially back off from actually uh, you know rising interest rates. And actually, the rate hike is also dependent upon the pace of the economy. So the although the market right now expects about three to four hikes um, in total, um, but it of course depends on the pace of the US GDP growth. So if the US GDP growth does slow a bit in the second quarter, uh, probably they might need to actually reduce the number of, of, of rate hikes. So I think it's still yet to be seen. Um, um, although the sell-off has been concentrated in a lot of the uh, very high growth names, a lot of the... Um, Certain companies with, uh, you know, strong fundamentals and strong earnings growth has been actually sold off together with everything else. Uh. So I think, you know, in this in this period of a broad sell down, I think there's always opportunity. Uh, there's always cases where, you know, the companies are, are still strong, but they get, you know, sold off together with everything else. So I think um, that's where we're looking at certain uh, certain stocks and certain opportunities. Uh. And of course, um, you know, moving on to uh, China. Uh, this year, you know, we think that China will outperform. So I think in, in you know, your portfolio of unit trust, I think it would be, um, you know, wise to be diversified as well. So if you look at our fund, you know, our key funds that we, we list here, you know, within this list, you know, we have, you know, we have the Malaysia uh, all cap fund, like Kananga Growth. We have a blue chip uh, fund for large caps. Uh, you know, we have uh, small caps like uh, Growth Opportunities and uh, Shara Growth Opportunities. And then we have uh, ASEAN, Asia, and global as well. So I think you know, if you have a diversified portfolio, you know, certain things will do well, and certain things will do badly in, in different times. So you know, those could actually offset uh, each other. So we we recommend you know investors to have a diversified portfolio uh, across you know both uh, countries, you know types of funds um, as well as between equities and, and bonds. Okay, so I think that concludes my presentation for today. Uh, and I'll and I'll go into Q and A. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Christopher, for your sharings today. Okay, we were moving, moving on. We are now going for Q&A session. Okay, then question number one we have here. Um, would you know how much and has, would the great Western Asian impact prospect of the US market and it's a constant we have to look at? Sorry, the great? Um, the great Western Asian impact prospect oh. of the US market. Yeah, yeah. So actually, there's been a lot of news about what they call the Great Resignation, uh, as you pointed out. So basically, a lot of people in the US are actually, um, you know, there's been a lot of turnover in terms of uh, uh, labor force movements. So a record number of people have switched jobs, they have switched um, um, professions. I think as a result of this crisis as well, a lot of people have started to reevaluate things and, you know, decide, you know, what's important. So I think uh, it's a trend that we're seeing globally, um, but actually what we're seeing is that yeah, there's been a rotation in terms of you know people trying new jobs and trying new sectors, but actually the in terms of employment, employment uh, overall has been increasing. So you know more and more people are you know regaining their jobs that was lost previously. So the unemployment rate has been coming down. So I think it's been trending to I think three point nine percent in the latest data. So I think overall you know despite you know people moving around, the overall employment trend is still positive. And I think this is more of just you know people looking for new jobs and not not necessarily um, they being unable to find jobs or actually leaving the workforce entirely. Uh. So uh, I think overall it's still it's still supportive for the US economy. All right, and then for the second questions, okay. Um, so we see a recent sell down on the tech sector in Malaysia. So is it a very good opportunity for Kananga Fund, and uh, that that has um high exposure in the tech sector in Malaysia? Yeah, so I think as I mentioned, our strategy uh, is, you know, we maintain a barbell strategy. So on one hand, you know, we still like the growth names. But, you know, we believe that the tech sector still offers uh, good earnings growth. But I think despite the sell down, you know, we've been talking to these companies, um, talking to management, we've been, you know, re, you know, re redoing our analysis again. 
And uh, you know, we still see that these companies can grow earnings. Uh, I think there's nothing wrong fundamentally with the companies. Uh, in terms of globally as well, uh, I think you know when we look at some of the semiconductor uh, supply and demand uh, situation, I think it's still expected to grow double digit this year, uh, due to the structural trends. Like I think the uh, increasing number of EVs that will be sold, uh, you know, the and the increasing use of AI uh, in by companies worldwide. Uh. So we think that the earnings growth is still intact, um, although the sell down might be driven um, by you know uh, withdrawal in liquidity. Uh, especially, I think the sell down has been mirroring the, the sell down in the NASDAQ in the US. So, we actually we do think it, it is a good opportunity for certain of these uh, companies that have still solid growth. Um, but of course, we counterbalance our portfolio with uh, you know, other sectors like you know, financials and also consumer. So, uh, yes, I, I would say that uh, it, it is uh, a good opportunity for those uh, companies um, that are still solid in this growth, and we're looking, we're looking closely at it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And then for the second questions, um, uh, the third question, sorry, uh, we do see that uh, Malaysia um, is having, okay, in terms of the consumer spending, right? So since we see a lot of EPF withdrawals which <coughs> happens recently, and then EPF being as one of the major contributors to the Malaysia stock market, will there be any long-term impact to the Malaysia growth? Yeah. <clears throat> So I think on EPF, uh, touching briefly, uh, last year was the uh, you know biggest year of withdrawals, uh, but I think uh, this withdrawal is a more of a temporary phenomenon. I think it's more of a um, special situation where last year you know we were impacted by uh, COVID very badly, but I think this year you know uh, the withdrawal schemes have come to an end. So I think this year EPF would uh, you know return to the market and uh, begin uh, adding back in their equity exposures. So we do not think that this will be an, a long term negative uh, for the economy. Um, you know, I think EPF uh, is, a, of course, a major shareholder, but uh, I think, you know, we also see a broadening uh, shareholding base between local institutions and, and, and retailers as well. Yeah. Okay, and then coming on, moving on to the next, um, do you see small cap funds performing better than the near, uh, in the near term compared to the big cap counterparts, which are affected by the Chukai Mark more in Malaysia? Yeah, so... I think in terms of small cap, large cap, I think this year so far, I mean, it's not at the end of January yet, but I think this year, small cap funds are hit harder uh, because of the sell down in the tech sector. Um, but um, yeah, like I said, I think, you know, overall, the tech sector still has strong fundamentals. But on a, on a, you know, on a year basis, of course, it's hard to predict whether large cap or small cap uh, outperform. Uh, I think, you know, in the last few years, uh, you know, small cap has did very well. So I think this year probably large cap has a higher than average chance. But you know, in terms of investment, everything is about probability. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say for certain which one will perform. So you know, we we still recommend you know a diversified portfolio. So I think your small cap uh, funds are probably if you have a football analogy, is more like your strikers, They're more aggressive. Of course, they can be more volatile as well. So for those who buy small cap, we should be aware and also have some you know large cap like uh, growth or blue chip in your fund. That's a bit of a bit more of your you know uh, core holding of your portfolio la. and then you also want to add in some regional so i think uh, we continue to recommend a diversified portfolio for investors la. right all right moving on um the u.s market do very well last year and what's your advice to the investor over the u.s market a uh, u.s market this year mm. Mm. so actually i think u.s market has had two years of tremendous performance i think nasdaq has been up uh, over 20 percent the last two years so naturally, I think when uh, you know things have been up so much, uh, it's only natural for it to have a, a, a short, maybe pullback. And um, in terms of uh, growth and monetary policy, we see growth in the US starting to slow a little bit. Uh, you know, it's still at a decent pace, but uh, you know, no longer as strong as last year. And in terms of monetary policy, there's been a, you know a slight uh, tightening uh, by the US Fed. So actually, we do think that this year, uh, actually, Asian emerging markets should outperform US. Now, whether or not uh, US uh, will end the year positive or negative, I think that's still up for debate. I think we don't really make market forecasts uh, that way. Uh, but in terms of, you know, which region we prefer, we do actually uh, say, you know, we prefer uh, Asia this year uh, over, the, over the United States. Yeah. Okay. There's also a questions about the funds. Just a moment, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good. could you just pick, uh, quickly explain on the hurdles rate that you mentioned earlier? 
yeah, a lot of um, mm. this in, in the table here, there's a hurdle rate. So a lot yeah. of attendees are asking what, what that means. Sure, sure. I think the hurdle rate just means the benchmark for that particular fund. Um, so I think each fund has a different uh, hurdle rate according to the mandate of the fund. So like I say, Kananga Grove, the benchmark will be KLCI. So KLCI last year was minus 3.67. So that's the, that's the benchmark. Uh, for blue chip, I think the benchmark is the FPM 100. FPM 100 was minus 4.23 percent last year, and you know Sharia was minus six, and so on. I think there these um, these funds are absolute return funds. That's why the hurdle rate is uh, actually just a flat eight percent. Um, but for absolute return funds, uh, normally the hurdle rate we tell people is that you know this fund is expected to achieve about eight percent per year on average over a three to five year period now, right? And last year we also uh, launched our two global funds. Uh, which is the uh, Global Growth Fund and the Global uh, Islamic. So this is one you can consider as well. Um, although probably the outlook for US might not be as great, but we are actually positioning this fund more towards uh, Europe uh, and also increasing the Asia allocation for this uh, global, global fund as well. Yeah. Okay, so the time is almost out. We will take one more last question, all right? So uh, may we know what's the difference between Kananga Growth uh, Series 1 and Series 2 versus growth opportunity, uh, yeah, opportunity that contributes to a difference in performance? Yeah, so um, I think the way to think about it is uh, Kananga Growth Fund is uh, mainly Malaysia. I would say more than 90% uh, in Malaysia, and it's a Malaysia all cap, so meaning a mixture of both large and small cap. So, you know, Again, the football analogy is more like a midfielder uh, in, your, in your team. Blue chip, uh, obviously, just a large cap, so I would say it's a bit more defensive. Um, maybe it will not go up so much in the, when, when market is hot, but maybe when market is down, probably it won't go down as much as well. So that's, that's blue chip for you. And uh, Shara growth is just the Shara, uh, Shara version of, let's say, Kananga growth. Now, for growth opportunities and Shara growth opportunities, um, I think for us, when you use the word growth opportunities, it's actually meant to reflect uh, small cap funds. So these two are actually focused on a small cap. Um, so, you know, it's more aggressive uh, uh, fund. In up markets, it will outperform a lot, uh, but probably, you know, it's a, you know, it could be more volatile in down markets as well. And then we move on to these two, which is the Malaysia Inc. and Kanan Growth Series 2. So these are diversified funds, meaning that they have some in Malaysia and some overseas. So it gives, tries to give you a balance of, you know, um, you know, what the best of Malaysia has to offer and also a bit of the uh, region. Uh, uh, regional uh, funds. So this is more like a, you know, a mixed fund, like a midfielder, uh, I would say as well. So I think this, and then the rest are more self-explanatory, you know, ASEAN is ASEAN, and it's Asia Pacific, and uh, global both, uh, you know, the conventional Islamic. So, so that, that's our, uh, you know, funds that we have. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Christopher, for joining us today. Yeah? And thank you so much for insightful sharing.
Welcome back. I hope you are participating in our Lucky Draw segments. If you haven't done so, don't worry as we have seven more segments to go. Moving on to our third speaker of the day, I would like to introduce Kenneth Tang as he is the Senior Portfolio Manager in Nico Asset Management Asia Limited. Kenneth is responsible for managing Asian and Singapore portfolios covering the resources sector in Asia. He has 22 years of experience in fund management, both in equity long and equity short capacities. Prior to Nico Asset Management, Kenneth was most recently the portfolio manager for Pine Bridge Investments Singapore Equity and Balance Portfolios. Kenneth graduated from the National University of Singapore with a bachelor's degree in business administration with a major in finance. He is also a CFA holder. We would now like to invite Kenneth for his topic, Singapore Equities, Continued Road Ahead. Kenneth, the floor is yours. Welcome again, everyone. And today I would like to really present on the outlook for the Singapore equity market and share more of our thoughts on the, um, the market for 2022, um, particularly sharing a bit more about the Nickel Singapore Dividend Equity Fund. Um, for some of you who are familiar with us and because you have heard us speak before, um, thank you for your support and, and welcome back. Um, uh, for the others who might be um, here for the first time to you, it's good to see you and we hope this presentation will be useful to help you to make some of the decisions for you for 2022. Let me first begin with a quick introduction for um, Nico Asset Management, um, followed by the outlook of the, the Singapore equity market. A quick summary, our corporate profile speaks of our DNA. Uh, we are one of Asia's largest asset manager uh, with a strong passion and focus on Asian investments. We believe in providing our clients with progressive solutions um, and focusing on performance um, as well as a citizen committed to ESG uh, is really one of our attributes. Uh, we also happen to be one of the longest and oldest managers for the Singapore equity product by virtue of our acquisition of DBS as a management more than 10 years ago. So in total, we have about um, more than 280 billion in asset management today. The title of our presentation um, is really Singapore um, Equities on Firmer Footing. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, um, when we look at 2022, um, we think the theme of recovery is really going to continue to support the Singapore equity market in the year ahead. We see a firmer growth path for Singapore where we expect the broadening of growth within Singapore's key economic engine in 2022. Particularly, we do see in 2022, there'll be a pickup in the service sector due to the economic reopening. Um, let's look at the gradual uh, relaxation of the mobility instruction, uh, the restrictions that we have seen since COVID-19 has started to abate. We think that is actually gonna to continue to recover. And we are also sanguine on the Omicron impact um, because of its lower virulence, as well as Singapore's high vaccination rates that will help counter the impact. In summary, we think the mobility indexes will continue to recover to pave the way for the economy to do better in the year ahead. Next slide. Now, we also believe that growth has been really a, a, a very you know, solid growth in Singapore. Preliminary estimates have put Singapore's GDP by rising by 7.2% in 2021. This has actually brought Singapore above its pre-pandemic levels in 2019. And what is also impressive is that it is the only Singapore ASEAN economy to do so compared to the rest of the region. So this is really coming down to the demography of the market, which I will share a bit more later. Next slide, please. When you look at the Singapore economy, you see that growth is actually broadening out. Manufacturing and exports related sectors, no doubt, uh, were the um, stars of 2021 in terms of contribution to the economy. That is actually moderating. We think it still remains resilient for the year ahead uh, because we believe global demand will be healthy. But what is interesting is you look at the, the other part of the uh, economy, which is the service sector. We believe that that could be actually the source of strength on incremental growth for Singapore as we, as we see enter into 2022. Sectors such as wholesale trade, transport and, 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 and even um, logistic services, we believe would actually surprise positively as the country emerges from 
the endemic COVID-19. Next slide. Um, transport services is actually a very important part of um, Singapore. Singaporeans like to travel. Um, but I think when you look at the uh, breakdown of the uh, Singapore's economy, you actually see that the transport sector is actually represented a lot by the, 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 the services route in, in Singapore. And you can see that tourist arrivals is actually start, starting to pick up. Now, VTLs, which is something I believe in most Malaysians will, will, will actually know that it's actually an important part of this recovery. And today, VTLs have actually gone above 50% um, based on the actual um, arrangement from Singapore and other countries. So we think 2022 will start to see a continued recovery in international travel. Next slide. Um, we also thought it's a good time to remind our investors why Singapore is really a, a very solid investment case. Um, we think Singapore continues to have very strong political stability. It is also very competitive in its talent pool and remains very strongly engaged in global trade and international business. Particularly through COVID-19, we have actually seen Singapore accelerate its digital transformation during this time. And we think this will actually be one of the, the key attributes going into this recovery. Next slide. Um, when you think about the um, FDI proposition in Singapore, you also see that despite COVID-19 and the impact that it's brought onto the economy, uh, we have actually seen FDI or, or, or foreign direct investment continue to remain robust. And this is really coming from various sectors. But what is interesting is that, particularly in the new economy sector, companies such as um, Tencent, ByteDance, uh, Zoom, and Rakuten have actually stepped up the investment into Singapore. And many of these companies have also moved their regional hubs to Singapore. That says a lot of things. That says that they believe that this continued recovery in um, in digital will actually be hubbing a lot in Singapore. So we think that's going to be playing into a very strong FDI, even post um, when we see um, the economy come out of, of COVID-19. So we think that's gonna be uh, an area that we want to, to, to emphasize on. Next slide. The diversity of Singapore's economy uh, remains um, a very strong attribute as well. We think that when you look across different sectors from traditional manufacturing, construction services, um, property to even newer parts of the economy, such as information, communications, financial services, and logistics. Singapore is a well-diversified economy. And that's actually very important when you look at investments that you want to have a resilient and diversified um, proposition. Now, next, next slide, please. One of the um, strong attributes of Singapore is really, as I mentioned, it's, it's growth in the digital economy. Now, Singapore um, may not have a large population to really drive e-commerce, but in many ways, Singapore is the channel that will many of these investments are going through. So we actually believe that the real strong potential in ASEAN, and that was shared by some of our previous speakers, uh, is going to be continuing to be a very sharp attribute of the attraction of growth into the region. And Singapore will be able to tap into that growth through its digital economy and ride on this growth, uh, gross merchandising value that we see to be tripling over the next five years. And we think that's going to be very supportive for investments into Singapore as well. Next slide. When we put together then the, um, the outlook for earnings, the economy and valuations, the first chart I would like to share is that the economy is effectively still on the road to recovery. Uh, we have seen 2021 um, represent kind of a V-shaped re um, um, recovery where the economy has gone above pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we believe that 2022 will continue to offer good growth on the tailwinds of the economy reopening, particularly on normalization of supply chains and the service sector. So we think that growth will still be exciting in Singapore in 2022. Next slide on earnings. Uh, this is really interesting because you can actually see that earnings have actually tracked the same recovery in the economy very strong growth in 2021. And we believe that double digit growth is still possible in the next coming years. And earnings growth with double digit growth is respectable, especially in a time as we see today that growth is moderating. Uh, we also expect that this 
time, we will also see consensus estimates in Singapore being resilient uh, during this recovery. Um, next slide. When we look at um, the broader implications for sector selection, you can find that actually 2022 will be looking slightly different from 2021. Um, Singapore banks is a large part of the market and a large driver of um, overall EPS growth. And you can see that in 2021, a large part of returns from EPS growth has come from the banks. 2022 will be actually quite different. Uh, 2022, you'll start to see a greater spread and diversification of growth across more sectors. Sectors such as transportation and, cons and, and communication services, as well as other parts of the market. And that is going to be very good for what we call stock pickers, investors that will be able to invest in various parts of the broader economy. So we think this is going to be a very interesting attribute for 2022 as we see growth broaden up for the economy. Um, next slide on valuations. Oh, sorry, this is uh, another slide that I thought is really interesting. Um, we think stock picking will be very exciting um, in 2022. And Active managers such as ourselves believe that the best value we can offer um, uh, in, in, for our investors is to really stock pick and to pick companies and sectors that are well positioned in this time of change or, or economic recovery. So we start to see that this year, there'll be a greater um, broadening out of growth across sectors. Um, banks will be still very much a big part of that growth, but we think that across many other sectors, growth will actually be also very exciting. If you look at commodities, you look at healthcare, you look at um, you know, even capital goods, there would be actually a, a large variety of earnings recovery plays that we would be very keen to participate on. Next slide. Valuations is um, something that is, is always uh, interesting for Singapore. Singapore is a value market. And you can see whenever we compare regional valuations or global valuations, Singapore always looks attractive on a PE and price to book ratio. The reason is obviously Singapore returns on an ROE basis are not very high, um, but I believe that that is also a very interesting characteristic for Singapore. So we believe that valuations is actually, in fact, today a, a very defensive proposition. As you know, today markets are very concerned about growth, uh, especially um, growth from the new economy. I think Singapore, is a little bit more older economy where a large number of the stocks and sectors actually help to anchor valuations, which is close to book value, which actually think is actually very defensive in today's environment. So that is a positive going forward. Uh, next slide. Um, and dividend yield, um, last but not least, is actually one of the most attractive propositions for Singapore. You can see on the right chart that Singapore and Malaysia actually offers um, very, very attractive yields on an absolute basis and particularly on a relative basis. And even though the market has done well in the past 12 months, dividend yields in Singapore is still actually very healthy at close to 4%. And we think that when you go beneath the hood towards companies, there are also a lot of what we call dividend anchors and companies like dividend growers that offer you very attractive dividends which makes Singapore a very attractive proposition. So in summary, um, the next slide, we think that Singapore is on a very strong footing for growth into 2022. We think Omicron is unlikely to derail the recovery. And 2022 um, looks to be really what we call a restoration and continued recovery of the economy and markets, especially for the service sector where we think international travel could come back a lot stronger than what we than the market expects. And we believe that the earnings recovery will ride on that. And we also expect valuations and the dividend um, proposition for Singapore to be also added advantages for the market when we compare investments across the region. Now, let's move to portfolio strategy, which I'd like to share now, um, really, um, where are we positioning? What are we thinking about as we move into 2022? Now, this is, uh, again, the same chart that we, we shared earlier, but I'd like to dwell a little bit deeper into what we call sector selection. Now, we believe that 2022 will actually see a greater bifurcation, a greater spread of growth across different sectors. And we believe that growth actually, even though growth stocks are 
seem to be um, suffering the most from the current flow in the markets is actually very important in today's scenario. We think that companies and sectors that can give you a sustainable growth profile at a reasonable price and valuation could actually do very well. And with a stronger focus on growth, we believe companies particularly and sectors that are growing in 2022 much faster than the market will actually outperform. It's quite intuitive, right? You want to buy faster growing companies even as the economy is moderating. So we want to look for companies and sectors that have good growth buffers, that have good quality, and we believe that industrials, consumer um, discretionary, which includes uh, some of these uh, retail sectors, as well as technology, uh, pockets of technology will still give you good growth in earnings um, in this time. Now, next slide is something that I believe is very unique to Singapore is Singapore is also a restructuring economy. And we have always coined this term, the new Singapore to really represent the fastest parts of Singapore in terms of the companies and the sectors that is actually growing and that is actually innovating. And this innovation is actually part of Singapore's DNA. Uh, you can see that many years ago, Singapore was a very industrialized nation. And then we actually saw the rise of modern services. Today, we are seeing a very interesting period of innovation and sectors such as technology, data centers, healthcare, um, tourism, and even um, um, medical technology, a uh, med tech is actually going to be areas that we think would actually be very good investment propositions. And we like certain structural growth opportunities in that space. When we go to the next slide, this is a way where we like to perhaps um, better articulate what we consider in terms of companies that we want to invest in. Uh, this is an illustration. Um, we believe companies that are plugged into the innovation, the ecosystems and the service recovery will actually offer you good investment opportunities. So we know tourism, uh, food solutions, data, technology, renewable energy and logistics are actually areas of growth in Singapore. And we want to find investment companies that can best proxy and represent that growth. And we, this is an example of how we want to overweight companies that actually play very strongly into these themes. And the next slide, please. Restructuring is actually also very interesting in terms of M&A corporate activity. Now you can see that in the past um, one year, restructuring uh, and corporate activity has actually accelerated in Singapore. And this is not coincidental. It's because really companies are trying to innovate and trying to right size their balance sheet, even as they go through the uh, COVID-19 crisis is actually very, um, very uh, positive for companies to actually improve their returns. Now, if you look at just some examples in restructuring, uh, a company such as Wilma has chose to actually unlock value for its investors by listing its overseas operations. Uh, Semcorp, the Jardine Group, the Capital Land Group has been very busy into really right-sizing their businesses either through the mergers or through spin-offs to really improve returns for investors. And I think that's a good sign, a good sign that Singapore um, corporates are actually trying to fo focus on sustainable growth going forward. Now, we think that's going to be more to come. Um, and I'd like to share maybe a few areas that we're looking at that we think corporate restructuring could be interesting. I won't cover companies, but I'll just tell you really the broad themes that we like. We believe that, um, Restructuring is important to improve sustainable returns. And one of the most exciting periods um, of change today is actually in energy transition, renewables. We think that's going to be a very important area of growth and transformation for Singapore. And we see this most particular in the industrial sectors, notably utility, um, infrastructure. Um, and, and these are areas of investments that we think will be very attractive. Companies in this transition are really moving towards demonstrating ways to diversify towards um, decarbonization, green financing, and recycling capital for growth. That's really where we are, um, I would say, you know, putting our emphasis on investments in restructuring for 2022. Next slide. So now let's move on to the, the next discussion on the Singapore Dividend Equity Fund. Now, this is a flagship fund for 
for, for our Singapore equity team. And we believe that this is really one of the best ways we can approach investments via looking at dividend returns. The next slide, if you look at our very simple approach, we look at a balanced approach between capital appreciation and dividend yield income. Very simple, dual way of looking at how we can enhance returns for our investors. Next slide. When we go to the Singapore proposition that I shared in the past um, you know, 15 minutes, you can probably get the, um, the conviction that Singapore is really a very good defensive proposition, especially in uncertain times. It has a resilient economy, a stable currency, and most importantly, a very attractive dividend yield of about 4%. And when you drill down to that 4%, it's really backed by good cash flow, strong dividend payouts, and very defensive balance sheets of the corporates which make up the Singapore um, universe of, of, of the market. And in 2022, we think that dividends will continue to feature well in driving these returns. Now, we want to place a convictive strategy on, on two parts of the market, what we call the dividend anchors, as well as the dividend growers. Now, let me share very quickly what these terms are to us, and that will perhaps give you a better understanding of how one can actually invest really through looking at dividends. Dividend anchors are what we consider to be very high and sustainable dividend yield stocks. They basically form the bulk of the, um, the, 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 the portfolio in terms of anchoring returns. Um, we believe Singapore's unique demography in the market will offer really a very high portion of uh, companies that are high dividend paying. For example, the banks in Singapore are very high dividend payers and they can offer a very anchor, a very good dividend yield for the portfolio, something like 4%. Now, this is encouraging to know that this dividend yield at this time will help anchor the market, especially when the market is worried about growth and interest rates. Now, the second part of the portfolio will really come from dividend growers. Now, these are the real um, growth, the growth uplifts that we are looking for. They are quality stocks. They are also dividend payers, but they may not pay as high as some of the dividend anchors. And what these dividend growers do is they really represent high dividend growing companies. And dividend yields could be rising from 1% to 3% to what we think to be as much as 5 to 6% as they run through their overall growth cycle. And dividend growth is very important. As I shared today, we are actually going to see um, a lot more focus on growth because frankly, growth today is looking a lot scarcer, a lot more difficult to find growth. And if companies can give you good dividend growth at a time where growth is moderating, I think there's a lot of potential for these companies to be regrated to higher valuations. So that's what we're looking at. In fact, that's an area that we believe will do very well in today's environment. So in summary, I, I believe that dividend um, investments are really relevant in a time like this. Um, and we think that against the backdrop of growth deceleration um, in 2022, capital preservation, the importance of returns will be important to drive returns. Um, the next few slides really highlight um, the performance of the different share classes, currency share classes, the ones in Malaysia, um, as well as Singapore and in the US dollar terms. And you can see that one very thing uh, strikes out, which is actually stability and really you know, um, a decent returns for our investments. So with that, I thought I could just um, you know, um, uh, end the presentation and I'm happy to take all the questions that you have um, on Singapore, on dividend investing. And I hope that that would really be interesting for you. Over to you, Alicia. All right, so moving on, we have our Q&A session now. So the very first question here, um, for the gross merchandise value for digital sectors in 2025 estimated, um, Singapore percentage is lower as compared to the Indonesia. And mm. this client would appreciate your comments. Why Singapore when the pie is lower? Oh, but it's actually, it's, yeah. uh, oh, thank you for the question. It's actually um, um, true that, you know, Indonesia is the, the, the lion's share or the, the largest part of, of any ASEAN growth proposition in, in, in the internet space. Uh, E-commerce is currently 50 billion 
uh, in terms of value, uh, in terms of um, the, the, the value in Indonesia. And we think Indonesia is going to grow to 200 billion in the next five years. I mean, I, I look at ASEAN as well, and I think that's really a very, very exciting proposition. Singapore is more a conduit, I would say, a representation of uh, a lot more true the financial side of, of how you know, uh, financing will be done for the, for, for, for the growth in the internet sector. So a large part of the operational part of, of the growth in internet will come from e-commerce in Indonesia. But Singapore really plays a bigger role in trying to harness how that transactional part of that GMV is monetized. So it may not be as fast in terms of growth, um, simply because it's really more, uh, as I say, an intermediary of trade and intermediary of that GDV. But I think that's also um, complemented by other areas, which is really services. And I think a lot of the services that uh, Singapore does on the internet space, on the new economy space, is a bit different. It's a lot more to do with headquarter and um, uh, um, areas of growth. And I think that's actually going to be uh, also exciting. So it's different, but I, I would say that also the growth is, is actually quite respectable. Hey, thank you so much for the information. And then moving on, the second questions here. Um, the graph that you showed just now, so meaning that the gaming and transportation have better growth uh, prospect in the 2022? Um, gaming, maybe um, when you think gaming, I presume you're talking about really the consumer discretionary and particularly the main stock in Singapore is Israeli Genting Singapore. Um, I believe that uh, we are more positive on the, the, the transportation side of that service economy. Uh, we think that a lot of the mobility restrictions have really capped a lot of the growth that we see. Um, and we think 2022 will really represent a greater normalization of some of that trade, um, as well as some of the, um, um, trans um, the travel and tourism side of things. So I think Singapore will benefit from that because clearly there'll be a recovery. But we believe that actually there are a lot more structural advantages in some of the, the transport arena. Um, so the companies that we like actually are more well positioned because they have actually um, been putting in place also strategies to improve their returns um, in, in, in that regard. So for example, uh, some of the travel areas uh, that we see, um, there are many companies that are also um, focusing on um, improving um, catering businesses. Like for example, uh, SATS. SATS is actually an example of a company that is um, really growing, not just riding on international travel because they, they supply to Singapore Airlines on food, but they are also growing in the area of being a food a merchandiser and a food um, um, company that actually focuses on, on quality food into the region. And I think that's really one of the, the, the attributes that actually help support that recovery. Okay. So another one, uh, could you share which sectors will fall into the dividend anchors and providers category in Singapore equities? Um, actually, a very easy way to, to kind of um, do the, um, the segregation is, is when you look at Singapore's overall dividend yield is about 4%. So when you think about anchors and you think about um, the, the real dividend uh, growers, you can look at it as a bit of that, um, that clearing point. So companies that have very strong dividend anchors, uh, for example, I will represent you know, some of the banks. They are paying dividends that are well in excess of 4%. At this time, the price have done well, but I think that's something that we think is still going to be sustainable. And also a large number of um, the real estate investment trust, as well as the business trust in Singapore, is actually also yielding very good dividend yields. So this will be part of that dividend anchor portfolio. Now, dividend growers is, is a little bit um, different. Um, we look for dividends. So, so, so we are very clear that dividends uh, is a very core part of this portfolio. So if a company is, let's say, a new technology company and they pay zero dividend and they tell you that they're not going to pay you dividends for the next few years, even though they're growing very fast, we will not invest it for um, the, the company like, you know, um, uh, the Singapore Dividend Fund, because we know that dividends is going to be a very important part of returns. Um, unless the company suggests that they're going to increase dividends, we're going to avoid it. But there are many companies, uh, Alicia, that are really paying dividend maybe of about 1% to 2%. And we can see that the growth rates of these companies are going to be multi uh, um, uh, on a multi-year cycle of double-digit growth. 
So this dividend will actually grow by 20-30% in the next few years. So that dividend yield, it becomes something like a 3 to 4% dividend yield as we kind of push out that growth profile. Those are really, really very attractive. And that's what we really want to invest in in Singapore. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, and another technical questions. Um, just a moment. Yeah. Okay, with the increasing interest rate foreseeable in, in the near term, will hmm. the dividend yield suffer? Oh, I think that's a fantastic question. And I believe that a question that we get very much. Now, the backdrop of rising yields is going to happen. Like it or not, I mean, I think there's no sugar coating around this. Interest rate will rise. It will put pressure on what we consider to be high duration or high yielding stocks um, because the comparative here is that interest rates are moving higher. So you need to compensate for even better growth. That actually underlies um, the importance of dividend growth, as I shared earlier. Now, we think that today, even though interest rates start to rise, the overall spread of dividend yields versus bond yields is still attractive. So it's not to the point where dividend yields become less attractive. So I think number one, I think that's going to be a positive for dividends um, um, growers and anchors, even in this environment. But we do agree that a lot larger part of returns or alpha will come a lot more from dividend growers. So imagine this, if a company is actually facing a macro to slowdown, higher interest rates, would you pay a lot more for growth certainty in this time at, at this point in the market? The answer is yes, uh, because you want to really, in fact, sell stocks that are unable to defend growth to buy companies that can defend growth in this rising yield. So dividend growth is number one, giving you that ability to secure income and grow that income I believe that is going to be really a, a, a added proposition. So it is not to say that it won't be impacted by rising interest rates, but I believe that there's opportunity for these companies to be even re-rated and improved because of the kind of returns it provides. And then uh, also on top of that, adding on to it, um, will, will the recent uh, surge in the Omicron affect your Singapore dividend fund? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, I believe that the Omicron is unfortunate. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, it's causing a lot of rising in cases, but we are quite comforted that it is not as virulent as um, the previous cases of Delta and, and even the first few waves of COVID-19. And I think that gives us some comfort that, um, that the economy reopening, while may not be, a, you know, a, a full reopening, is actually still um, improving on the, um, the perspective of change. Now, I think it's important to, to know what the market is pricing in and what the market is, is actually seeing. So I believe that the market is not really fully factoring the potential recovery of the, of, of the economy from Omicron. So while that will actually perhaps slow down the recovery, we think that it's still going to be in, in the right area of change. And that keeps us quite optimistic of, of investments in this um, broad thematic. Right, just now you were mentioning transportation category, right? So does airlines include as one of it? Yeah, I think airlines is, is, is an area that we look at. But when we look at really the importance of balance sheet and especially for a dividend fund, <laughs> I think one thing we want to anchor and to be assured of is really the sustainable of supportive dividends going forward. So I would say that, I mean, just from an illustration point of view, I think the business for airlines is a little bit more cyclical and it's a lot more highly operating, operationally levered as of, compared to perhaps other travel businesses that have actually a lot more cash flow. Um, and, and I think that actually would be something that we are more comfortable with, you know, for the dividend fund. Right, then moving on. Okay, sure. how do you see the impact of UOB with its impending, impending purchase of Citibank's operation in selected countries, right. positive or neutral? Oh, okay. I, unfortunately, I, I, I thank the question, but I'm not able to comment on <laughs> okay. direct stops. But I would hmm. say this. I would say that, you know, again, when you look back to one of the things that we always watch for is positive fundamental change. Um, and positive fundamental change means companies that are taking advantage of um, opportunities to really improve growth and restructure opportunities 
restructuring that I mentioned earlier, many companies illustrated. Um, I think when you look at really M&A, um, as companies do that, I believe that actually adds to the growth potential of companies and also to the dividends that they can actually get from that. So I would just say that is actually in line with, with, with that kind of proposition. We, we like companies who do that. Okay. So since it uh, looks like we have running out of time, so very uh, last question, sir. Um, um, is EFG a consideration part of the stock selection of the funds? Oh, um, definitely. Um, I think I would take it a step further. Um, and I, I like the question. ESG is actually has always been part of our philosophy in investing. When you look at really what we think is important in ESG, it's not so much how well you score, how well you do in terms of how many, you know, um, how much carbon emissions you emit. It's more important for us that you, you are changing you are actively improving your environmental, social, and governance impact. And that is actually very important in how we select stocks. We have companies that may not have very high ESG absolute scores, but is doing the most in terms of improving those scores. And that actually goes a lot, we believe, in driving future value of the company. So for example, the renewable opportunity I talked about in energy transition actually deals a lot with, with really change. So I would say to answer that question, ESG change to us is actually as if not more important than purely just being a very good corporate citizen in today's markets. Okay, very, one last question, okay. Sure. On top of the Omicron variant just now, so what's the hospital, uh, hospitalization due to the Omicron and is Singapore health system be able to cope with the surge in the cases, although it's less virulent? Okay, um, I believe that so far, so good. Um, I, 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 we, are, we are very fortunate with a very good infrastructure and, and a government system that actually allows for, for hospitalization. So today, as, as we look at number of cases, I think the guidance from the ministry is that everything is actually still okay. Um, but I would just also save it from the more corporate perspective that I think this Omicron case and even COVID before has given a lot more private healthcare companies the opportunity to support the government efforts. And you can see that in also some of the investments that we look at in the area of healthcare, that in this new time of, you know, of test, trace and vaccinate, we believe that companies that are also restructuring to basically partner with the government in providing you know, um, testing will actually be benefiting from this environment as well. So again, we are again looking at it from, the, from a challenge, a concern, and a risk perspective to turn it into an opportunity. And we think companies actually who, who look at that will actually do very well in this time. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Kenneth, for your insightful yes. sharings. Yeah, we hope that the audience today do grab some very important information over the Singapore equities. Right. Thank you so much, and we hope that we do see you soon. Now, next My pleasure. Event. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.
Hello again and good afternoon. Thank you for sticking with us so far. Gentle reminder, do remember to participate in the poll and stand a chance to win your share of 20,000 ringgit cash account credit. Moving on to our fourth speaker of the day, I would like to introduce Mr. Ayman Anwar. He is an Assistant Portfolio Manager in Nomura Asset Management Malaysia's and Ryan Bahad. Ayman joined Nomura in November 2014 and is currently a contributing member of the Global Agri Strategy Committee and the Global Stock Selection Committee in Nomura Asset Management. His primary responsibilities include research coverage of Australia and Asia-Pacific markets. Ayman is involved in new ideas generation and reviews of existing investment in the global equities portfolio management team in Kuala Lumpur and London. Prior to joining Nobura, Ayman was attached to global treasury team, forex and derivative sales unit in OCBC Malaysia. Ayman holds a Bachelor of Engineering and Bachelor of Commerce, majoring in Civil Engineering and Finance from the University of Melbourne, Australia. We will now invite Mr. Ayman with his topic, Heightened Volatility but Stay Invested Globally. Mr. Ayman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alicia. Good afternoon. Hope everyone is in uh, good health, keeping well, uh, and staying safe. Uh, let me just share my screen one sec. Okay. Um, yeah. Welcome to Nomura's presentation today uh, on our outlook for 2022 uh, and our topic: heightened volatility, uh, but stay invested on a global basis. So my name is Ayman uh, and I'm part of the investment team here at Nomura Asset Management Malaysia. Uh, many thanks to FSM uh, for this opportunity to speak to you today. And thank you uh, to all of you as well uh, for your time uh, in attending. And I hope that you find uh, this presentation useful and interesting. So to start with, uh, just a quick intro on our company. Some of you may have heard of the name Nomura and we have been speakers at previous FSM events on a number of different topics. But for those of you that haven't heard of us, uh, we are one of, if not the largest, Japan-based investment houses. Uh, and we are also one of the largest fund managers, not only in Japan, but globally uh, by AUM. Here in Malaysia, we were incorporated in 2006. So we've been here a good 15 years. Our clients are predominantly institutional, but we are increasingly shifting towards more retail offerings. Uh, we have a full suite of capabilities here locally in KL for both uh, conventional and Islamic uh, in all the major asset classes, domestic, uh, equity, global equity, and fixed income. So cool. We manage about 29 billion ringgit in total assets under management, AUM, uh, in Malaysia alone. And for my team, which uh, as the MC mentioned, the global equities team, we are directly responsible uh, for USD 2 billion in AUM. Our uh, KL Global Equities team, which I'm a part of, is actually part of a wider team with some colleagues in, in London, UK. Uh, we all cover different sectors and share our best ideas with one another in order to maximize the returns for our clients. Uh, it's also a very experienced team, which has been together for about seven to 12 years on average for the core members. So that's me highlighted in green. Um, and as the MC also mentioned, I've been with Nomura for about eight years now, where I cover Australia and healthcare, amongst other things. I used to study in, and live in Australia, where I also did my uh, double degree, as was also mentioned, uh, in Melbourne Uni. And I was an Australian PR, so I, use, I, I tried to use a bit of my previous experience uh, there to bring some value to the team as well. So now moving on to what you're really here for, uh, which is what are our thoughts for 2022. No doubt it should be an interesting year with a number of headwinds battling against the tailwinds for markets. We think that there's uh, four main concerns or worries for the average investor heading into the year. Firstly, is that growth is starting to slow following 2021, which was a big rebound year. Uh, second is that inflation has continued to be quite high in a few countries, including the US, which is, the, which, as we all know, is the main one. Uh, third is that the US Federal Reserve has moved to a more hawkish uh, stance and could both uh, hike rates as well as taper, which would be negative for markets. Uh, and we're seeing some sell-off to start the year due to this. Uh, and lastly, 
after something like a 29% total return in 2021, uh, the market has already had a very good run and um, aren't things looking uh, quite expensive. Uh, so we think that this, these are all uh, actually valid concerns and hence in our outlook, uh, we intend to address uh, all four of these uh, points and hopefully um, help you to frame what and where to invest uh, by sharing our view on what are the best markets as well. Most of us know that the pre, the post COVID recession, uh, post COVID recovery, sorry, is the fastest uh, recovery, uh, similar to the global financial crisis. Assuming that this uh, pace of recovery continues, then we would get to late cycle by the second half of this year. And this, I know, this is one of the uh, previous speakers' uh, topics as well. In fact, we are only one year away from entirely closing the pre pandemic gap in in GDP growth. It's true that after a year in which uh, global earnings grew 49% here, uh, we won't see that same number in 2022. But the market is currently pricing in an 8% uh, level of EPS growth in 2022, which is not too bad at all. 8% earnings growth would normally be one of the better years looking back in history uh, if the global market is able to deliver that. So 2021 was the big uh, recovery year and the multiple also re-rated uh, accordingly um, as you saw, saw this uh, big spike of 49%. Um, however, we still remain at the start of a multi-year recovery or the second year of the multi-year recovery from the COVID recession. And um, this should uh, be somewhat supportive. We think that the market multiple now fairly prices the underlying earnings. So if the multiple holds, then we can get earnings being the main driver uh, for performance of the market in 2022, which I guess is the key message that um, is derived from this slide. On the flip side, earnings expectations have been reset uh, to a lower bar. So if the result season can actually surprise positively, uh, and we get to greater than 8% earnings growth for the year, then we might see upside. So a counter argument is that many people actually think that the market is expensive now, right? Well, not necessarily. If we look at a metric called the equity risk premium, this ERP in simple terms is uh, basically the implied return that you need uh, from investing in the stock market instead of something that's risk-free. And the ERP from this chart here uh, actually shows that we are at uh, average levels of expensiveness, which is a 51st uh, percentile, uh, even though by PE, we are uh, somewhat high at the 85th percentile or you know, the top 15% uh, of uh, expensiveness. A second valuation argument is that now that rates and yields are expected to rise, and the Fed is uh, looking to hike and taper, finally, after being very accommodative for so long, uh, would this not be a significant headwind for equities? The answer is not necessarily, because uh, back in 2013, we also saw a period in which, in which the rates were reset upwards, but this did not uh, coincide with an equity market sell-off. Uh, yes, the equity market was cheaper uh, then than it is now, but the rates uh, were also higher then compared to now. So it balances somewhat. Furthermore, uh, normally in a period of rising yields, equity markets will typically outperform bonds uh, and gold as we show in this uh, bar chart here. So um, particularly on the uh, light blue uh, bar, which shows the average return since 1950, we see most equity markets on the left with positive returns against bond markets and gold on the right-hand side. Of course, some parts of the equity market will then do better than others, and growth stocks would actually do worse uh, than value, typically. One last point on equities versus bonds is that on a relative basis, we see that dividend yields uh, on equities is showing comparable or better values than bond yields, which should be another factor which supports, the, uh, supports equities uh, compared to bonds. 
So that brings us to arguably what is the last big investor worry heading into 2022, which is inflation. With growth slowing and inflation being high, some are actually talking about stagflation, which would be a big negative uh, for markets. However, we, we still think that uh, the inflation number that's currently being recorded is artificially high. So uh, we think it's being inflated by supply bottlenecks and uh, durable goods. We can see from this chart here, once this is actually stripped out, so this portion here and uh, the black line moderates, we, which we think will happen in late 2022, then we should uh, settle at a level which, uh, of inflation that is around about 2%. So given the rising rate environment, should investors then stick to value over growth? Uh, well, no, we don't think so. Yes, the rates should rise, but the real rates, uh, real yields should not be too far above 0%. With inflation uh, set to moderate to around 2%, that means the nominal uh, rates for the US 10-year treasuries should land about 2% as well. Uh, and we've already seen that value has already outperformed growth. Um, so unless we are actually wrong about inflation moderation and the rates move at, uh, ends up being sharper than uh, most expect, then value stocks might not necessarily continue to outperform from here over growth uh, in a straightforward manner. We think that um, the so-called secular growers or companies that have a very long pathway for growth can still outperform as they are the ones that can continue to deliver the most earnings growth for investors. On this chart here, we can see that they are forecasted to deliver more than double the US uh, market growth in 2022. Uh, and triple in 2023. Hence, they still chance uh, uh, still stand a good chance of outperforming the market from here. Um, as I mentioned previously, earnings should be the main um, factor driving uh, performance of these stocks. And the valuations on these stocks is not surprisingly not that bad either. We think that you always have to look at the, at these stocks, um, particularly uh, in terms of relative and not absolute valuation. So relative to their own market, which is the US and the risk-free rate, uh, which is this chart on the left here, um, we see that these stocks are just about um, the average level uh, of expensiveness. And on the right chart, which shows uh, their relative valuation to themselves, um, we see that they're about average case, uh, average in expensiveness, or in Facebook's case, um, well below its uh, historical average. So this leads us to our view, and that uh, we currently prefer developed markets (DM) assets over emerging market (EM). We also think that EM currencies look likely to weaken uh, as rates rise in the U.S. This usually coincides with an underperformance of EM uh, stocks. So on top of this, uh, EM growth also looks uh, like more likely to slow uh, into 2022 more than DM. Um, so uh, DM will continue to um, be delivers uh, superior growth and, and outperformance in that sense, perhaps. Uh, lastly, a slowdown in China property could have various knock-on effects uh, on other emerging market economies. So uh, this could be a, a drag that um, uh, people um, are not fully taking into account yet. If we were to pick one EM economy, then we actually like China the most. Uh, I know I just mentioned that China property uh, being a drag just earlier, but this actually affects uh, other economies more so than China. The China market has already underperformed the rest massively in 2021, which we see on the left chart here, um, and uh, something like 12% versus the, the rest of Asia and 25% and um, underperformance versus the rest of the world. So uh, there is now early evidence that the credit impulse is improving. Uh, and secondly, with the government expected to provide easing, we think that China is in a good position to bounce back strong in 2022. In particular, we like the China internet sector. Uh, this sector has been hit by 
increased regulation fears, but we think that the headline actually reads worse than the actual actions taken. We can see here in this uh, table that uh, the increased regulation um, actually brings China, the China internet sector to more in line with uh, the best global companies. So it can be argued that it's a good thing in the long run. Um, and, and we've seen with a lot of these, uh, the, the fam G uh, group, um, that they actually end up um, coming out the other side stronger. Okay, um, just to put it all together and summarize everything. Sorry, I, I threw quite a lot of inf uh, info at you in a short space of time and I realized that. Uh, in 2022, we think that the story will be driven by four main factors, growth, inflation, uh, valuation, and policy responses. We think that the equity market performance will be supported by the first three factors. Number one, growth will re likely remain solid uh, still just the second year in a multi-year recovery. Uh, number two, inflation should still come down in the second half of this year. And number three, the valuation of equities is fair and arguably attractive to us um, if measured by the ERP, equity risk premium. And we like uh, equities as an asset class over bonds, uh, mainly due to the rise in real rates. Um, within equities, we would be positioning to overweight both bonds and the structural, uh, sorry, not both bonds, um, overweight both the structural growth names and uh, value cyclicals. Uh, we would be overweight DM over EM, but within EM, we think that China should have a good rebound year. Uh, and, and lastly, on the bond side, um, we prefer Malaysian government securities, MGS, over US treasuries due to the more attractive yield. Lastly is the X factor that throws all of this out the window, and that is a new mutant strain of the virus, uh, which none of us can actually predict. Okay, um, so this slide actually shows you the difficulties in trying to time the market. Um, and it ties back into our topic, which is to stay uh, invested globally for the long run. So if you withdrew your investments in the market and you um, unfortunately missed out on the 10 best days uh, in each decade, then you would probably miss out on about 30% um, of returns uh, per decade since 1930. So here's 30%. Uh, 20-ish, oh, more than 30%, 40%, uh, something like that. But more importantly, the compounding effect of missing all of these best days since 1930 would mean that instead of a 1,715% or 177x return, you would be only earning 28% um, if you were wrong on market timing. And given that the best days uh, follow on from the worst days, very quickly, it's almost impossible to assume that someone can exit before the worst day and re-enter for the best days. Hence, we think that the best thing that an investor can do uh, is to remain invested for the long run. One last point on COVID, which was touched on in the earlier presentation as well, um, and you may have already, uh, you, well, uh, he, he mentioned it previously as well. Um, so far, Omicron uh, seems to be a low severity but high transmissibility variant. And it seems like this has been as much as an ideal outcome for the market that we can actually hope for, uh, as there's a big disconnection between the number of cases and the number of hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, therefore, globally, the different healthcare systems have not been as overwhelmed by um, Omicron compared to Delta. Okay, uh, with the remaining time I have left, I'd like to um, quickly go over some of the funds here at, uh, we have at Nomura Asset Management um, and carried by FSM. Uh, right now, the Global Sustainable Equity Fund, GSE, uh, which is the second fund I will showcase, is the only retail fund we have. However, we are currently in the process of trying to convert the other two funds, uh, SGF and GHC, from wholesale into retail, but I have no um, definitive timeline on that. With that said, um, the first fund that I would like to briefly showcase is called the Nomura Global Sharia Strategic Growth Fund, or SGF for short. 
This is a multi-asset fund. So we invest in equities, bonds, and have dynamic uh, FX hedging. The allocation between these asset clusters will vary automatically uh, compared to uh, according to what we think uh, is where your money will be best placed. It's an unconstrained fund, so the allocation can vary from zero to 100% uh, very quickly. And the only real constraint is that uh, we invest in Sharia compliant equities. But we have noticed that the Sharia criteria actually doesn't um, exclude anything that we feel is important to own for the conventional investor. Um, last year, we, we did about 11% um, return, uh, which is not bad for a multi-asset fund uh, at all. Uh, so the idea between, behind this fund is actually quite simple. Uh, the best performing sector will change every year, as we can see from this uh, colorful table here. Last year, it was commodities. The year before that, it was gold. Uh, so we think that you need a little bit of uh, everything in your core portfolio in order to give uh, that balance. We want SGF to be the core portfolio. Uh, and hence, the fee structure is actually the lowest that we can make it. It has a 0% uh, sales charge and uh, 1.2 percent um, management fee which is um, I think it's as low as we could actually get it for a multi-asset uh, structure um, this is so that that it eats into the uh, returns as little as possible uh, for our clients in our equity book we look to invest in very long-term themes uh, some examples here include ride sharing and at leisure within consumer e-commerce and digital advertising uh, in the internet uh, space and within healthcare, um, long term teams like um, uh, medtech and, and, and pharma, um, and uh, cybersecurity and, and other uh, teams within software. Um, these types of teams are unlikely to be derailed by recession and uh, are actually often more often they are the disruptors to an industry rather than being disrupted by something. So hence uh, SGF is um, our all in one or core portfolio, which we think any everyone uh, can actually benefit from uh, and it uses our capabilities and networks in order to decide on asset allocation uh, with minimal fees. Next is the Global Sustainable Equity or GSE Fund. Uh, I mentioned this is a retail fund and our newest fund. Um, and, and this is the fund for you if you want something that delivers on returns as well as environmental, social and governance or ESG outcomes. Uh, so this is what we mean by double bottom line, not only returns, but also positive impact to the wider world uh, through six impact goals, uh, which then tie into the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Um, so it was only launched in December 2021, so it doesn't have the longest track record, uh, but the the um, target fund uh, delivered something like 18-19% uh, returns in uh, 2021. Uh, I think this is a really interesting slide as we have managed to measure for 1 million uh, USD invested into our fund. Some of the key outcomes is as follows. Um, so you get 796 kilograms, almost one ton of recycling and recovery of materials to help mitigate natural capital depletion. Uh, you get 800, uh, sorry, 386 uh, tons of lower CO2 emissions uh, in order to help climate change. You have 1,582 liters of more uh, drinking water available who, to those that need it, which benefits approximately 303 people in underserved communities. You get 189 uh, more vaccines uh, available um, and you get um, more access to financial services for about 59 uh, needy individuals uh, and treatment for seven diabetes uh, patients and coverage for 13 uh, more people who need it with medical insurance. So um, this is something I think was, is, a, is a unique uh, selling proposition um, uh, for people that really care about ESG. Um, so in summary, for GSE, we are looking uh, for a double bottom line of returns, uh, coupled with responsible investment. We are addressing the UN SDGs uh, through six main measurable impact goals, um, and we measure them uh, very often. We are leveraging our same philosophy and expertise of the team and combining it with a total stakeholder impact philosophy. Uh, we aim to hold about 35 to 40 stocks uh, and the strategies uh, AUM for the mother fund is uh, about 700, 700 million uh, US dollars. 
So last but not least is our Global High Conviction or GHC Fund. Uh, as active managers, Seeking Alpha is our DNA. Hence, the GHC is meant to be a reflection of the best ideas on a bottom-up basis uh, that our team has in order to help deliver you that alpha. Like, GS like GSE, GHC is a pure equity fund. We believe that sticking to our framework with discipline uh, helps to deliver uh, returns to you over the long run. What we look for is comp quality companies uh, at discount valuations. And we define quality as companies with competitive advantages, a track record of returning cash to shareholders uh, with strong management and strong reinvestment opportunities. We look to buy these companies when they trade below their value according to our uh, proprietary internal model. Um, and this proprietary internal model uses uh, discounted cash flow analysis as well as other uh, fundamental factors. Why choose quality? Because um, it really works in the long run, in the long term uh, periods, both before and after the global financial uh, crisis. It has returned more than double uh, or 2.5 times um, the MSCI world uh, returns and periods in which quality underperforms have uh, not been very often and they have reversed uh, quite quickly. In summary, uh, GHC is actually the highest uh, risk fund that we have, um, but we think for the investor that looks to really utilize the active manager for alpha or excess returns, um, it is suitable. Uh, it is higher risk because it is uh, concentrated and aims to hold about uh, 17 to 25 stocks at a particular time. And uh, the contributing analyst um, and the team run a rigorous bottom-up approach to identifying what's the best ideas for this portfolio. There are no limits or constraints to this fund, whether it's DM or EM stocks, uh, nor the sector. Okay, with that, um, I think I'll leave it there with my presentation. And I, this is a summary page of uh, the features of the three funds that I talked about. Um, so yeah, thank you all for your time once again, and I guess we'll open uh, for questions if any. Yeah, so sorry about that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ayman, for sharing your insightful information. Okay, then we, moving on, we will go for the Q&A session right now. And um, the first question here is, it sounds like Europe has a very good prospect in 2022. So could we, could we look at a 8% growth for that region in 2022 or beyond? Okay, so I think um, actually the, the growth um, is led by the US uh, in this case. Um, it, I didn't break it down by region in the chart that I shared earlier, um, but um, I think US is the leader in both um, revenue growth as well as uh, earnings. So um, for our funds, um, we think that the best companies and the best business models uh, actually lie in the US more so than Europe. Um, uh, you, US is probably about 50 to 60% um, of the holdings and Europe is more like 20 to 25%. Uh, but there are some gems that you can find uh, in European uh, companies in, in the fintech space uh, and, and so on. But uh, I think in terms of um, ranking order, uh, it's still US over Europe uh, for us. And it has a cleaner like runway um, to deliver you that earnings growth. Thank you so much. And then for the second questions, given that the dividend yields have sustained, would it be good to just target dividend funds at the moment? Okay. Um, yeah, I think this um, is a little bit trickier. Uh, I, I know that um, some, our personal view is that uh, you, you're getting the best opportunities right now as the market pulls back in the growth names uh, because the fear right now is approaching peak fear on tapering and this uh, impacts both like the, the previous speaker also mentioned this but the long duration assets of which growth companies are long duration assets um, and they are pulling back uh, more than what you see in like the dividend stocks so my personal view is that um, if you're not invested in the markets right now, I think growth is giving you the better opportunities um, in order to uh, start your investment portfolio. All right. And then when you say uh, you prefer China, so um, does this include H shares or you are looking at A shares? Um, so we tend to 
focus more on yeah, the blue chip, uh, large cap companies. Um, uh, so and, and the uh, the likes of uh, Tencent and 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 Baba in uh, yeah the internet sector. So I think that's actually the uh, main focus for us, and that's um, where we think the opportunities are the most attractive and the most uh, secular names that we can find. Okay, uh, so for this too, right? Uh, are you guys investing over the H uh, H market, H shares, or over the US? Um, we we are not constrained, so we can do uh, either one. Um, but I think we, um, given the news of, of the delisting and and things like that, um, we have uh, tended to go towards more of the H uh, shares. Um, okay. Yeah, which also comes with a bit of its own risk, lah. So, yeah. Okay. All right, then moving on in developed market, um, which oh just now yeah you did answer, uh, this one which market will offer better value? So just now you mentioned that the US uh is having a better value over the Europe, right? Mm, that's what we think. Yeah. Okay. And then moving on, so uh, since Nomura is more keen on the developed market, so what's the key factors that leads to the differences in opinion? Because um, some of the uh, funds um that is. Uh, sees more potential in the emerging market instead of the developed market. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, maybe there's some inbuilt bias uh, in, in what I cover as well. Um, but I think that um, looking at the long term, uh, you have outside of China, uh, US has been the key driver of growth. And um, we are definitely underrepresented in um, in our investment portfolios for global names, um, this domestic uh, market bias happens everywhere. Uh, so I think um, even if you look at like uh, where I used to live as well, uh, the Australian uh, market, Australia pension funds, um, a lot of them hold like sixty-ish percent uh, of their local market. Um, so there is that bias where. Um, you tend to spend more time and understand better uh, the, the companies in your own domestic region and neglect the global names. So I think um, when we look at all these global names uh, and the natural consolidators of the industries and the best companies, they do sit in the US uh, for a reason and um, uh, they have proven to be the strongest ones. So I, I um, even if you like do a back test of um, uh, market returns, US always uh, comes out on top and that's kind of our view and um, yeah, uh, we, we think that the um, the, the growth slowdown uh, impacts EM more than DM but it's, it comes down to also yeah, uh, uh, opinion to some extent too. So. All right, and then uh, moving on, there's another question here. So what's your thought process better to uh, investing in self-managed Funds or to use feeder funds in Nomura? Oh, um, okay. Uh, so it just so happens. Well, actually, we are um, we manage our own um, portfolio, so we don't uh, for, for the most part like with with SGF here. Um, this is uh, managed from our team in managed by our team in KL. We have that. Uh, capability ourselves, and as I mentioned in at the start, uh, we manage. Um, 2 billion USD of pension fund money. And we've been doing that since uh, 2006. Um, so we have uh, that track record. We, we would rather um, use, uh, do it ourselves than use a feeder fund approach. It just so happens that uh, the second two um, strategies were actually started in the, in the UK. Um, so we have a feeder fund uh, structure, but yeah, the problem with that also I, I recognize is that um, it ends up being a higher fee structure and impacts the end investors. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely better in my opinion if you can actually get it, um, uh, you know, manage it yourself rather than use feeder fund structure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one more last question. Yeah. So we have seen uh, the US market to draw down recently quite a lot. So do mm -hmm. you see it's a very good opportunity to get some exposure to it right now? Yeah, um, that's a good question. It's very topical and very, very relevant. Um, we've been having this debate uh, with the team, like 
every day for the past week. Uh, yeah, I've been getting a few more gray hairs because of it too. Um, we, we, we don't think that this is um, going to be the start of uh, another recession um, is the conclusion that we had. So we don't think that the market then sells off like 50 to 70%. Uh, and then that's when you really want to bet the house uh, on, on equities having a rebound and that's your best opportunity. We think it's more like a 10 uh, or 15% uh, drawdown uh, period right now uh, when people are tr um, trying to digest the fear of the Fed um, uh, hiking and potentially making a policy error because growth is also slowing. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we're seeing some early evidence of a little bit of a uh, rebound uh, potentially uh, coming next week. Um, but if there is a 10 or 15% drawdown, then we think that that's, a, that's quite an attractive um, level to, to, to enter into the market given where it is okay. right now, given what we know right now. All right, that's a very good point for the investors to take note, yeah? So when the market draws down 10 to 15%, then we do get a little chance to get some exposure, increase our exposure in the US market. All right, yeah. thank you so much, yes. Mr. Ayman. Yeah, thank you Most so much for the insightful sharing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, all right, let me see. There's another question coming in. Just one more question, right? Just one more question on the introduced foreign source income, uh, foreign income tax. The exemption currently is giving to unit trust funds. So, what's Nomura's take on the response on this? Oh, regarding uh, the yeah foreign foreign income tax issue. Right. Um. So that doesn't really uh affect us uh as much, and I'm not um too sure what like um is is it uh actually means for. For the end investor, I thought that the tax issue uh, was more impacting income uh, funds and, and uh, dividend funds because, as far as we uh, know, we're not really uh, impacted by our holdings on on any uh, tax regu uh, tax regimes uh, changes. Right. Um, yeah, noted on that. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. That's all for the questions today. Yeah, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Ayman, and we hope to invite you again next time and see you around. Okay.
Welcome back. Moving on to the fifth speaker of the day, I would like to introduce Derek Yi as he is the Managing Director for Manulife Investment Management. Based in the Hong Kong, Derek is a Managing Director and is responsible for the coverage of all Asia-Pacific equity strategies. He works closely with the Asian equity investment management teams and is the primary resource for communicating the key features and attributes of the company's Asian equity strategies to existing clients, prospects, and consultants globally. Derek has over 17 years of financial industry experience, and he joined the firm from Standard Chartered Bank, where he served as director of Asia X Japan Convertible Bond Sales. Prior to this, he was a vice president and equity analyst at Nomura International Hong Kong. Before, he, before this, he held equity research positions with Merrill Lynch in Hong Kong and Franklin Templeton Investments in the US. Derek holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and Management from the University of California, Berkeley, US. We would now like to invite Derek with his topic, Capitalize on Sharia Investment Opportunities in China and India. Derek, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you everyone for uh, being with us today. Uh, so what I wanna do is, uh, let me just pull up and share uh, the screen. Right, so today I'll, I'll be sharing uh, a bit of detail uh, regarding two strategies that we have, both being Sharia, uh, China and India. Now, one of the things uh, I, I aim to do is hopefully to answer uh, and provide color to as many questions that you know we've gotten and we've received um, over the period regarding China and also uh, India. Now, when we think about Sharia, in order to ensure or in order to provide peace of mind to our investors, we ensure that the portfolios are Sharia compliant by undergoing two levels of screening. Now, the first is going to be business activity. Uh, this basically means we don't invest in SIN stocks. Uh, pork related products, uh, your conventional financial services uh, or armaments. Um, and the second is financial screening. And this is to make sure that we're investing in companies whose financial health is not in question. And we've seen over the past two years that this is going to be an extremely important element to how we allocate uh, our capital into specific names. Now, these two levels of screening are applied to both the Sharia China and also the India portfolios. And you know, for the two strategies, uh, what I'll do is cover the, the macroeconomic backdrop and then discuss uh, in a little bit more detail uh, how, how our outlook is reflected in these two strategies. So uh, first I'll start with the Sharia China equity uh, strategy. Now, before I even talk about some of the, the policies uh, within China, I think uh, in 2021, uh, this was effectively a resetting of expectations. This was a year for a resetting of expectations. We had uh, policy uh, and regulatory risk uh, or uncertainty at the beginning uh, of the year. And in the second half, we had uh, concerns regarding the liquidity of certain property developers. Now, property is obviously a very large part or very large contributor uh, to uh, the Chinese economy, roughly about uh, 20%. And, you know, at a very high level, we, we don't believe that China is going to allow this sector to have a, a hard landing impact on, on the economy. Um, recently, we've seen more policies uh, in place uh, that has allowed uh, the easing of some of these uh, liquidity concerns uh, within the, the real estate sector. And that kind of points me to this slide here. One of the things uh, currently that, that China has uh, in its back pocket is that it's actually diverging from some of the more developed markets. So you see uh, a lot of different economies and governments tightening, whereas in China, they have the opportunity to loosen, to help support growth. This year, in 2022, China is estimated to grow between four and 5%. This is definitely uh, lower than what we saw in 2021, uh, but yet 5% is still uh, what we believe relatively healthy. Again, 2021 was a year 
uh, of resetting of expectations and 2022 hopefully can capitalize on on some of these uh, these new expectations. But as you can see here, inflation is not a concern within China, which allows the Chinese government to put uh, into place more supportive policies from uh, fiscal and also monetary. Now, given that we do see uh, the impact of policy headwind, we also have to understand that there are structural growth themes, trends, and also policy uh, companies and sectors that will benefit from policy support. For the portfolios and for the investment team, there are three primary uh, thematics that we're positioning the portfolio. The first is going to be within consumption upgrade. Obviously, consumption upgrade means different things at different times, but currently what we're seeing is a large scale uh, upgrade within China. This is going to be uh, part and parcel to the middle class reaching critical mass. We're seeing large, uh, a greater part uh, of the economy driven domestically uh, and also focused more on domestic brands. And this is going to range from, uh, you know, your everyday cons uh, consumer discretionary or your everyday consumer st uh, staples into clothing brands, EV, um, and also which moves into the tech and innovation, your homegrown, um, and your localization of supply chains, right? So this is going to be the first part. The second thematic is technology and innovation. Now, obviously, 5G ecosystem is uh, very broad and very deep. And for us, what we're looking at really is going to be along the supply chain. We believe that opportunities exist um, along the supply chain because there are a lot of moving parts uh, for this ecosystem. And there are a number of names, particularly in the domestic Asia market, uh, that fit into this thematic. The other part within tech and innovation is going to be biotech. We are looking for companies that have the ability to develop innovative drugs um, that are going to be uh, a bit insulated uh, from policy that generally impact generic drugs. So what we're really looking for are those that can innovate. Um, and those that can ultimately reinvest in their businesses. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least within the tech and innovation sector is really sustainability. This is going to be a big topic. And a lot of this uh, sustainability uh, that is driving innovation falls along renewable energy uh, supply chain. And this extends all the way to electric vehicles, um, electric vehicle supply chain. Um, but this is really a part of uh, the Chinese government uh, led efforts to be carbon neutral by 2050. Now, that also flows into the next, uh, the next thematic, which is supportive policy. Although we've had some policy headwinds, we also have to remember that there are policy tailwinds. And this is going to be in areas such as environmental protection, uh, supply side reforms, which is talking about localization of supply chains. And finally, looking at industrial policy shifts, really thinking about moving from your traditional manufacturing into smart manufacturing. So these are really the three key themes uh, on how we're trying to express our view in China within the portfolio. So the first, as you can see here, is really talking about clean and renewable energy. Um, again, carbon neutrality, we spoke earlier by 2060, uh, provides China a number, like quite a long runway uh, and provides these companies quite a long runway uh, to help achieve or to help the, the Chinese economy achieve these goals. What we see here is that when we look at the primary source of energy consumption in China on the right-hand side, coal is becoming a smaller and smaller amount. Renewable is becoming a bigger and bigger uh, chunk. So when we think about where renewable energy uh, is coming from, we're not looking to invest necessarily in solar farms or wind farms, but we're looking to invest along the supply chain, meaning technology parts that go into wind turbines. Um, basically companies that develop uh, high voltage uh, cables in order to transmit uh, the energy that's produced by wind farm and sold. So this, this ecosystem of renewable energy is quite broad. It is quite big and it presents uh, quite a number of different investment opportunities uh, for us to take advantage of this policy tailwind 
um, for clean and renewable energy. And another, the, the second slide here really is sticking with that renewable energy theme. However, we're talking about electric vehicles. Now, when we think about electric vehicles, the key source here uh, is not really the end product. It is not the electric vehicle itself, but it, but it really is focused on the components that go into electric vehicles. And as you can see on the chart on the right-hand side, China is already by market share, the largest manufacturer of electric vehicle batteries, not only for domestic use, but also for international use. Now, one of the things that has created um, greater opportunities when we think about EV batteries is not only EV battery demand itself, but that this battery is going to result in greater investment, greater development within energy storage. So once this energy is stored, it is not permanent. There is going to be some degradation in energy that's being stored. Now, the better technology uh, you have, the less leakage you'll have from this, uh, from, from basically having it sit. Now, with this creates opportunities along the supply chain. And I think for, for us, supply chain is going to be extremely important when we talk about renewable energy. So we have renewable energy in the, in the form of components that go into producing uh, wind, solar power, that go into transmit, transmitting this uh, power into uh, industrial or personal use. And then we also have uh, electric vehicles, uh, not only adoption uh, of the electric vehicle itself, but also from battery manufacturer and the supply chain um, that it provides uh, opportunities in. And the reason why we are uh, positive or this positive on renewable energy is because historically, when we think about sources of energy and the cost to produce these sources of energy, things like wind and solar, were always more expensive than looking at coal. Again, coal was one of the cheapest sources of energy because coal was plentiful. However, given the supply side reforms to reduce the number of coal mines in order to reduce the pollutive impact of coal, government policy has been put in place to actually make solar, to make wind power uh, much more uh, affordable. So when we talk about grid parity, what that means is the cost to produce energy relative to the cost uh, to produce energy using coal. And as we can see here, by next year, uh, wind is going to be close to coal, uh, but solar is actually going to be cheaper to produce than your traditional coal fire power. So this is something that is not only uh, going to take place within the next year, but we feel again that this has an extremely long runway. The second theme is going to be innovation. Um, so when we think about biotech, we're not only just thinking about those that can produce innovative drugs. We're also, again, looking along the supply chain. Now, this chart here talks about uh, basically CROs. And, and CROs are effectively contract research organizations. What they do is that they effectively allow biotech companies to do what they do best, right? Which effectively is discovering the drug and then at the end, market the drug. These CROs fill an important need in the sense that although they participate in the discovery, their value add really is going to be in the preclinical and the clinical trials. And as we know, the preclinical and clinical trials do actually take time. And if your biotech companies are doing this themselves, they're spending less time on the drug discovery front and on the marketing front. So these companies are not only having and securing contracts within China, but they're also doing it for drug companies in the US. So this growth potential is not just focused on the end product of the drug, but it is focused on the process of development. And we feel that this, this opportunity is differentiated um, but at the same time, there is uh, a large opportunity set uh, for these companies. And within innovation, we are still going to 
talk about quite a bit this, uh, this thematic of self-sufficiency for technology for China. Since uh, 2016 and 17, when we did have US-China trade tensions, when we did have quite a bit of uh, talks about technology uh, use um, and the restriction of companies being able to sell into China, uh, I think China really had to think about their path when it comes to uh, technology, when it comes to self-sufficiency, and when it comes to really being able to secure uh, supply. Now, currently, when we think about the self-sufficiency, uh, this table here talks about microcontroller units. Now, these are relatively low tech, um, but extremely important. So microcontroller units are basic semiconductors that go into things like home appliances. Um, but at the same time, they are also uh, go into electric vehicles, go into smartphones. Um, but these are more low tech. As you can see, China has increased um, their self-sufficiency, so they don't have to rely on foreign countries in order to secure supply. Now, once China has um, established self-sufficiency in some of these low tech, the next step obviously is to move into high tech. However, you're, within technology, a global supply chain is going to be extremely important. So it's not to say that China is going to close itself off from the rest of the world, but they are now focused on uh, relying more domestically as opposed to um, externally. And this consumption upgrade theme, one of the things that we, we've noticed over uh, the past decade is that consumers now are focused more on domestic brands. So the Nikes, the Adidas, the Adidas's of the world, that upgrade took place maybe you know seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. But today, as you have a, a larger, cons uh, larger middle class, uh, a larger millennial base to spend, what they're looking for really is going to be domestic brands. Um, when you look on the left hand side, what we're seeing is that percentage of online searches for the domestic brands over the past 10 years has really shifted towards your Chinese brands. And this is not only for clothing, but this is also moved to cosmetics. In China historically, and I think globally even, Korean cosmetics has really had a strong foothold. However, domestically, what we're seeing now, particularly with the younger consumers, is that their shift and their preference now is moving towards China's brands. This is something that is going, we believe, to continue um, for the longer term. So before I move into the Indian equity, equity strategy, I think uh, a few points just to sum up what we think about uh, China. Number one, we think that peak policy risk uh, when it comes to uh, kind of the regulatory, uh, regulatory environment and also for property is behind us. Um, 2021, uh, again, was a resetting of expectation because of these two, uh, because of these two dynamics. Going forward, you know, our focus is going to be on three things, consumption upgrade, tech and innovation, and policy supportive or companies that are going to benefit from government policy. Although there are policy headwinds, we have to remember that there are companies that are going to benefit from these policy tailwinds. And finally, um, when as we're looking to structure the portfolio, our, our approach really is going to be bottom up. We are looking for these companies that can grow regardless of the environment that uh, regardless of the economic environment that we're in. Although China's growth is expected to slow, I think this expectation has already been in place. And now being able to identify these winners, uh, we believe is going to uh, provide the, the most attractive risk adjusted uh, return for our investors. So then I'll go into the, the Sri India equity strategy before going, uh, before going into Q&A. Now, for those who have followed um, Many Life's Indian Equity uh, conventional product, you understand, uh, you know, and you're familiar with some of these slides that I'm going to present. However, what I want to do is kind of set the scene, provide a backdrop for where what happened 
previously and where we are today. So now in 2014 in India, uh, the current Prime Minister Modi uh, was elected. And from that point on, he has put into place reforms that have led and allowed some of these uh, structural imbalances to be addressed. So one of the big things uh, about India back in 2014 is that it was largely a cash-based economy. Cash base leads to uh, lower productivity, uh, low, leads to greater tax leakages. And this sets off uh, a chain of events that even though expectations for growth in India were high, they were not realized historically. So one of the key things that the government did was really transform this cash-based economy into a formal economy. And once you have this formalization, what we see really is greater productivity, cash, your, your, your well, greater productivity, uh, greater investment opportunities. And because a lot of these transactions, a lot of the economy now is going to have to pay tax. So tax leakages are being addressed. This allows the government to put into place and put into place policies that should benefit growth going forward. Now, initially, in uh, before Modi was or when Modi was first elected, the banking system was straddled with a lot of bad debt. The reforms that were put into place really looked to address that. So when we had reforms and when we had this formalization efforts, this led to greater fiscal stability and financialization, meaning consumers like you and I are able to be a part of this banking system. So you have to remember when India was cash based, there was no need for us to be a part of this economy, uh, part, part of this formal economy, excuse me. But now uh, with, the, with financialization, we're a part of this formal economy. We have access to bank, we have access to financing, and all of this is going to lead to greater growth opportunities that the Indian government can start to uh, invest in. Now, once these four Fs on the left-hand side has been established and in place, from 2019, how is it that the Indian government can capitalize on these reforms? Now, we call them the three R's, which is recycle, rebuild, and reinvest. The recycling really is having the government uh, free up resources through selling and relaxing SOE uh, ownership. So you've seen uh, a lot of these state-owned enterprises being sold to private investors. All of this really is basically allowing the government to strengthen its bank account. And when the bank account is, is strengthened, they're able to spend more on things like infrastructure projects, spend more things like rural development without having to incur a higher cost of debt or actually impacting uh, your fiscal accounts. Once they're able to do that, once they're able to build the strength of their balance sheet, they're able to boost savings, not only at the corporate level, but also at the personal level. And when we say boost savings, what they've done is they've lowered tax rates. So now India uh, has one of the lowest tax rates for new manufacturing, uh, manufacturing facilities built domestically. This has really, really allowed a revival of CapEx, but it has also allowed companies to be uh, incentivized to reinvest um, this or their earnings um, into basically projects domestically at higher ROEs. Again, because this is uh, a benefit of lower tax, which is a direct benefit of being able to strengthen the government's fiscal account. So once we have the foundation of formalization in place, and then we had the, the path of how the government is going to take advantage of this formalization, it has resulted in really two overlapping cycles of growth. So on the left, your formalization of the economy takes place because, again, the because of the digitization, meaning businesses that were not cash-based uh, were able to 
participate in a thriving e-commerce ecosystem um, that has developed uh, over the past seven, eight years within India. And as we've seen through COVID, e-commerce is one of uh, is going is one of the largest sources uh, of retail participation. And if companies aren't able to participate in this e-commerce, they're either they're not going to survive. They either need to be acquired or they're going to cease operating. What digitization forces is forces companies to formalize, which then in turn forces those who are not formalized to be in the digital economy. This is that first cycle. The second is going to be on the right-hand side, which is India really needs to have a larger part of its GDP come from manufacturing. In order to do that, the company, the, the country needed to incentivize um, MNCs and domestic companies to manufacture more in India. How do they do that? Well, they're able to do that through lower tax rate, through production-linked incentives, uh, and also because India has a large and young population base that is educated that can help grow um, some of these new industrial uh, and more tech-oriented uh, type of sectors. And this is going to lead to greater import uh, and export substitution uh, opportunities. So as you can Mr. see Derek, on the... Yes. Uh, Mr. Derek, so sorry to interrupt. You have um, seven more minutes left. No problem. Yeah, all right. Okay, I'll go through these quickly so that we can uh, actually go into Q&A. So when we think about uh, e-commerce and how big uh, the opportunity set is, as you can see on the, up, uh, on the top right-hand corner, digital payments for, uh, as a percent of GDP continue to move higher. However, right below that, e-commerce as a percentage of overall retail sales is still one of the lowest in the region and even globally. So this is one way that we believe the formalization will drive digitization growth and then create that first cycle of growth. Now on this slide, we talk about manufacturing. As you can see on the upper right, you have a rising share of exports uh, expected in 2022. And we believe that this is going to continue. India has already, have, already has uh, a very strong presence in manufacturing. So domestic electronics is going to be on the low end, but as you have these production linked incentives being put in, what we're going to see is that more and more companies are going to invest into uh, manufacturing things like telecom infrastructure, uh, white goods, automobiles, pharma, uh, and then later on move into really the emerging areas. So solar cells uh, and advanced chem like basically chemicals. And we expect this to actually take place over the next five to seven years, which is really going to add uh, quite a bit of value when it comes to, to India's drive towards greater manufacturing growth. Now, what does all this mean? All this basically means you have a stronger fiscal and you have a stronger current account. This is going to allow the Reserve Bank of India to have more options when it comes to setting monetary policy because you have inflation that is under control. And finally, uh, valuation has always been a question that we, that we have uh, received. India really is, you know, historically traded, uh, is trading currently a bit higher than it has historically. However, when we think about valuations, we need to take it in the context of growth. On the upper left-hand chart, you can see that you know, we're not taking it from the low base of 2020. We're looking at 2019. Over the next five years, you're going to see a compounded annual earnings growth rate of 17%. This is going to be driven by the reforms that were put in place. In 2022 and even in 2023, India is expected to be one of the largest or one of the fastest growers in terms of GDP. And although valuations are a bit high today, there are going to be sectors in which there are opportunities, particularly within kind of the smaller cap companies. Right. So given time, I, I you know, would stop here uh, for a formal presentation and would be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Derek. So sorry that due to the time constraint, you cannot move on with your presentation. So uh, moving on, I will pick two questions to ask. 
Uh, okay. okay, so one will be, um, so since now the Manulife India Fund has been doing better than the China Fund, so uh, will the China funds overtake India Fund in the future as China seems to be doing better? Or which one between uh, India and China, which offer better growth prospect in the future? Right, so that's a great question. I think, you know, India and China are, are really two different territories, um, but currently they, they complement each other, right? In China, you do see uh, slower growth than previous. You do have this regulatory overhang and they are growing due to dual circulation, meaning they wanna grow domestically uh, and then in turn look at how they can export this domestic growth. India, however, you're looking at uh, different drivers of domestic growth. You don't have regulatory uncertainty, um, but both of these are going to be key uh, basically economies uh, globally. Obviously, China uh, has had its issues over the second half of the year, as we know. And what we believe is that peak policy risk is, is behind us. Um, over the past week, we've seen uh, the Chinese government loosen uh, policy measures, particularly within real estate, and markets have actually rallied behind that. So the, the question of, you know, will the fund overtake India, uh, or will the China fund overtake India? I think when we look over a long-term perspective, um, these are these are two economies and two funds that we believe are going to do well. All right, thank you so much for your insights. And then for the second questions, um, just now you were presenting on biotech. Um, however, recent biotech rank among the worst sectors performance. Also, why? Uh, how do you think so about this sector? Right. So, uh, great question. In China, biotech really took a hit um, last over the last quarter. Uh, and the reason for that is more technical as opposed to fundamental. Uh, the reason why I say that is there's one large uh, company in uh, that's listed in, in Hong Kong uh, and has ADRs. And this uh, the previous speaker also mentioned, you know, the, the risk of delistings in the US. Um, but at the same time, there's also this blacklist, uh, a restricted list uh, for US investors to invest in companies. But, and the, the US government wanted to put some of these biotech companies on that blacklist. However, when we actually do really our work, we understand that it's either has to be military, it has to be data, or it has to threaten national security, right? For biotech, it's very hard to find kind of a company that satisfies these three requirements in order to be blacklisted in the US, right? So our focus is less on these technical measures and is going to be more so on uh, kind of the fundamental aspects. Now, obviously for biotech uh, and for healthcare in general, you're going to see potentially some uh, regulatory, uh, some regulatory risk because of things like group purchasing. Um, so in order to be on China's national reimbursement list from a drug perspective, you have to actually lower the price of your drugs. But this really is focused more on generics than on innovative drugs. And our focus really is gonna be on innovative drugs. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Derek, for your insightful uh, answers. And um, due, to the, due to the time constraints, so we will need to stop here right now. Uh, yeah, so we do have a lot of questions coming in still, but no worries, okay? Uh, maybe we could you know, invite you again for our webinar ahead this year so that uh, our investors can join again, all right? Thank you so great. much for your thank sharing. Thank you so today. much. Great, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, you too.
Welcome back. It's lunch time now. I hope that you have something to eat while watching the next proceeding. Moving on to the sixth speaker of the day, I would like to introduce Mr. Chong Yi Wa. He is a Senior Vice President Strategy and Solutions of M Invest and is responsible for the management of unit trust funds and investment marketing. He has more than 27 years of experience in the investment industry. Prior to this, he was a head of institutional sales at an Asian fund management house where he handled clients' relationship with government-linked investment companies, GLICs, and institutions in Malaysia. He has also served as the chief executive officer of his Islamic investment arm. In addition, Mr. Yiwa was also a chief investment officer managing local and regional Islamic funds at a local Islamic fund management company. He holds a Bachelor of Business Administration from the National University of Malaysia, majoring in finance and marketing. He also holds a CMSRL license for the regulated activity of fund management. We will now invite Mr. Chong with his topic today, Sustainable Investing, where there are problems, there are opportunities. Mr. Chong, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, yeah. everyone. Thanks, thanks a lot, MC. Uh, well, first of all, I I like to wish uh, everyone uh, thanks for joining the webinar, and wish everyone a happy and prosperous uh, two zero two two after a very mixed uh, year in two zero two one. Yeah, just let me share my slide. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about uh, sustainable investing. I think some of you will know it as a ESG investing. Right? ESG basically stands for environmental, social, and governance. Yeah. Um, I think so far, the world, I think, has become a better place uh, over the last 20, 30 years. Yeah? But there, there are still many challenges and issues that we need to resolve. I think one, one of the biggest issues that we are aware of is global warming and with that you know we have already seen fire uh, drought and closer to home we have seen flood you know, they, other issues that you know have concerned a lot of people are poverty inequality in terms of access to education access to uh, hospitals access to proper sanitation right? uh, access to good living conditions and so forth yes what uh, so, what some of the pictures here have shown yeah uh, and the situation has become so bad right that the world has get together where about 197 countries or 196 plus eu have come together uh, to have a conference to re try to resolve one simple issue which is climate change right I think what they've been trying to do is like um, they are trying to reduce climate change to less than one and a half percent by 2030. Yeah, uh, because I think if we don't do anything at this point in time, the climate or the temperature is going to go up, maybe estimated to be about two and a half percent. And with that, you know, we we are going to see a lot, a lot of issues. Right? So, what ESG? Uh, is coming about is like um, the awareness on ESG investing or sustainable investing uh, has become very popular in uh, recent times, right? Uh, and the answer, the reason is actually very simple. Uh, people are now becoming more wealthy and they are more aware of what is social issues as well as environmental issue. Uh, so what they are trying to do now is like fund houses are now trying to combine right, uh, companies that can resolve some of the ESG issues. Right? Uh, and they think that you know, companies that do all these ESG issues or resolve the ESG is issues very well are going to give you very good return from an investment perspective. Yeah? Now, this chart here shows you how much the growth <clears throat> in ESG uh, investing has been. Okay. AUM here stands for asset under management. If you look at the 
column on your furthest right, right, it shows you the average growth rate per year. Yeah. And you can see that um, if you ignore Europe for the time being, United States, Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, right, the growth rate from 2014 until now, when it comes to ESG investing, is tremendous. We are talking about a minimum of 17%, with Japan rising all the way to 168% into ESG investing. Right? Now, Europe is at the moment at the forefront of ESG investing. But if you see the number of 1%, uh, that's slightly a bit misleading because what happened is Europe, they are at the forefront and they are also the strictest when it comes to ESG investing. So what they have done is that um, for you to be categorized as an ESG fund, there are a lot, a lot of requirements that you have to meet. Right? So therefore, because of that, uh, some of the funds or many of the funds um, did not meet the requirement and they have been recategorized into some other category, which is why you see the compounded growth for Europe is only about 1%. Right? So the total AUM under ESG uh, end of 2020 is estimated to be around 35, 35 trillion. Okay. Now, closer to home, this chart shows you, uh, this is earlier we saw it on an annual basis. This one is on a quarterly basis. Uh, this shows you the Asia X Japan uh, asset under management for ESG funds. Yeah. And you can see that um, towards the second quarter of 2020, we are seeing a sharp rise in terms of uh, ESG investing. Okay. So the total AUM for Asia X Japan uh, ESG investments as of uh, end September is estimated about 61 billion, right? This is a very low number compared to 35 trillion earlier. Uh, and I think like, you know, as awareness grow, um, the AUM is going to increase tremendously. Okay. And what is even more exciting is, some people think that ESG investing might not be as profitable as conventional, but that is a uh, wrong perception. Okay. If you look at these two bar charts, uh, two charts, it's not bar charts, sorry, two charts, right? These two charts basically shows you, uh, I plotted an ES, MSCI ESG, okay, the top chart, MSCI ESG all world index against the all world index conventional over the last 12 years. Okay, and you can see that the blue line, uh, which is the MSCI ESG index has up, slightly outperformed the conventional. Okay. What is more impressive is if you look at the, the table on your right hand side, right? The annual performance for each calendar year, right? Out of 12 years, ESG funds outperform conventional index 10, 10 out of 12 years. Okay. Now, if you look at the chart on the bottom, this is more specific to ESG investing in. Asia Pac X Japan. Okay. And the blue line shows you that the performance is a lot better than the conventional index, especially over the last two, three years where awareness has actually grown uh, in Asia. Okay. And you see that the index, ESG index, has outperformed the conventional index by 72%. And again, if you look at the table on your right-hand side, the annual performance, again, ESG outperform conventional in 10 out of 12 years. Right? Yeah. Next, uh, this is to show you okay, how profitable ESG funds can be, because we have already established that ESG index can outperform the conventional index. Okay. Now, this tape, these two charts show you two of our funds, uh, the M-Invest Sustainable Series Positive Change and our Climate Tech Fund. Okay. 
And you can see that the two fund, the first one, the launch date um, is sometime in April, sorry, is sometimes in May 2018, right? It has, up, it has outperformed, uh, or rather it has rose about 148%, sorry, 149% uh, since inception uh, until end of uh, 2013, okay? Um, compared to the benchmark, which is only up about 60%, right? The chart at the bottom, okay? The inception date here is 9 of April 2019, right? And until end of this December, uh, the fund is up 60% against the benchmark, which is only up about 55%. Again, you see very strong outperformance, uh, especially over the last uh, one, one and a half years. Yeah? Uh, and on an annualized basis, both funds are doing very well. The annualized basis, which, is, which means the average return per year, for the top fund here, positive change is 28%. For the climate tag is 25%. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why these funds are doing very well is because they are invested in companies that are able to mitigate or resolve uh, some of the ESG issues. Right? And because they can do that, there is a lot of demand for the services of these companies, all right? which is why the share price has been going up and which is why we are getting such a good return on these funds. Okay. Now, now I'm going to talk on you know, why this, the team of these funds and why these funds are set up. Yeah. Okay. Now, the first one, uh, for the first fund, the sustainable series, right? The reason why the fund was set up was that the fund manager thinks that, you no, know, there's a lot of issues where we do not have proper access to things like clean water. We do not have access to proper sanitation. Uh, other things that they are looking at is, um, we have climate change issue, right? Uh, and climate change issue would involve things like, uh, drought, carbon, decarbonization, um, fire, flood, and what have you, right? And then of course, the third issue that they actually have seen uh, things like inequality. Uh, basically what it means is poverty. They estimated that about 767 million people in the world are living in poverty and they are living in less than two US dollars, which is less than 10 ringgit a day, right? Uh, that's, that's how bad it is. So what the fund manager has done uh, for this fund is that they are now saying that besides investing in companies that can do good uh, for the world, they are taking it one step further, which is something called impact investing. Okay? Impact investing is basically uh, like what is stated here, the intention to generate measurable social and environmental impact alongside the financial uh, return, right? So they buy good companies, which give you good financial return, but they also want to do a little bit more. They want to measure what kind of return that we are getting socially as well as on the environmental impact, okay? And if you look at the table, okay, it's a little bit small, the table on your bottom left, yeah. This is a report that is published by the fund, right? Uh, that shows you, okay, in 2020, through their investments, okay, what is the result? So for example, um, they save about 70 million metric tons of uh, CO2 by, by investing in companies um, that does not use a lot of fossil fuels, right? They also save and prevent, uh, help people for about 540 million people through medical care, right? And they provide access financial services uh, to over 1.5 billion people, okay? I will explain later why, you know, some of these numbers can come about and what are the companies 
like this fund is invested in. Okay. Now, the second fund that we have uh, is called the Climate Sustainable Seas Climate Tech Fund. Yeah. The Climate Tech Fund is a lot more specialized where they invest only in companies that uh, can help uh, when it comes to climate change. Yeah. So when the reason why they have this climate tech fund is really um, to help reduce or prevent uh, anything that affects climate change. So in this case, uh, forest fires, sea levels rising, uh, cyclone hurricanes, you know, things like that, flooding, right? So they, they look for companies which are helping to cut greenhouse emission, the companies that goes into renewable energy, and they also into companies that are now trying to improve uh, in terms of energy ef efficiency. Right? Uh, the reason why they are doing all this is that based on their study, they found that due to climate change events, right, the world from, has on average over the last 50 years, yeah, lost about 200 million US dollars of economic losses per day okay, due to all this natural event. Right? Those, those are very big numbers. Right? Therefore, they think that if they invest in companies that can resolve some of this issue, the financial in return from these investments is going to be very good over the long run. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a bit about <coughs> excuse me. The investment philosophy of both the funds. Yeah. Now the first one on positive change, right? Positive change fund, we take the philosophy is that they think that investment is very important uh, because you need investment to generate return in the long run. Okay. And when we talk about investment here, we are talking about uh, not only the E uh, to return to environment, social but also financial return. And they talk about investing in high quality companies that can address society challenges. Right? And they think that companies that can address these society challenges will prosper in the long term, okay? naturally. Right? And the third one is that any investments has to be long-term because it takes a lot of time to change and for certain services to be accepted. Right? So most of the investments that like this fund will have, uh, the investment horizon is for more than five years. Right? And it's very much on a bottom-up approach. Right? Uh, and this company, Bailey Gifford, which is the target fund, which is the fund that we invest in, uh, they have more than 100 years when it comes to uh, ESG investing. The second fund, um, the target fund manager, which is TWS, DWS Invest, right? The Climate Tech Fund, their philosophy is to focus on climate change implications, right? And what are the companies that can resolve these implications, right? Uh, these funds are very actively managed, right? Uh, and they spread their investment on a multi-cap basis. Uh, companies, so they like companies that can capitalize on the circular trend in the field of climate tech. Basically, uh, companies that can grow uh, and take advantage of the climate changes. Right? And they have very good research, right? DWS, uh, to provide thematic insights and know how when it comes to ESG investing. Okay. Uh, so the two biggest change between these two, sorry, the two biggest uh, differences between these two companies is for the positive change, the invested, uh, the companies being invested range from between 20 to 50 companies. So it's very focused. Whereas the DWS, the, their number of companies invested range from 50 to 80. So it's a lot more diversified, yeah. Here, I'm going to talk a little bit about their investment target for both the funds. Yeah. Now, 
for the positive change fund, yeah, uh, again, the four things that they like to focus on is number one, social inclusion and education. Right? They think that uh, by reducing education gap, uh, it will help to reduce social inequalities. Uh, also, they also want to reduce the economic uh, or access to education as well as learning uh, learning potential. Right? Second is they also like they also like companies that can help to resolve environment and resource needs, right? Basically to reduce um, the the carbon usage uh, globally, right? Okay. Of course, third is healthcare and quality of life. Companies that can actually improve uh, our hospitalization, our medical care as well as uh, to prolong our life, like, you know, vaccines for COVID, right? And of course, the fourth one is base or a base of the pyramid. Basically, it means the people who are at the bottom rung of the economic cycle. Yeah. Um, okay. So some, some of the investments that, you that they have shown here, uh, say, for example, um, to reduce inequality, uh, for social inclusion and education is Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre is a little bit like your Lazada uh, back here, but this is a company that is listed in US, but they operate in uh, South America. Their HQ is in Argentina, right? So by having all these uh, platforms like eBay and Lazada and so forth, it allows the small enterprises, home businesses to actually sell their products, right? Um, so they also put here for environment and resource. It's listed, uh, sorry, they invest in Tesla, which is very easy. Tesla is electric vehicle, so that replaces the fossil fuel, which is petrol and uh, diesel for our average cars, right? And then the third one is uh, Moderna. Moderna, I'm sure everyone is aware, Moderna is one of the major provider of a COVID vaccine through their mRNA technology, which is being used to create a lot of medic medicine for a range of products. Yeah? And of course, um, base of pyramid, they put an example of Safaricom. Safaricom is basically uh, in Africa, it's, in, it's, a provide, it's a telco provider, but it has gone a bit more to provide just telco services. They also come out with software, accounting software, where small business users can use that accounting software to do their accounting, make payment, and so forth. So that, again, helps. Um, they also do financing. Uh, so that all this helps uh, the small businesses okay without access to finance uh, because most of the time the banks might not lend money to them um, to have access to financing as well as access to a market and to accounting so that they can set up a proper business yeah now for the climate tech fund right they invest more on climate tech as we have mentioned right? but there are four focus are you know, what are the companies that can provide alternative drive systems? So in this case, it's, you know, your, car, your electric vehicles, for example, uh, renewable energy, basically moving away from coal-fired plants, right? Uh, and move into renewable energy like solar panel, uh, water, and um, wind, yeah? Then transportation of uh, energy, basically making things become more efficient when we try to, uh, or we, when we do transportation, and that's of course, uh, energy efficient uh, buildings, basically making sure that uh, the, the buildings are become smarter and uses less, um, less power to, to cool down the buildings or to heat up the buildings, depending where you are, right? And of course, the other things that they look at are things like uh, medical, right? Uh, innovation in terms of water supply, uh, high-tech agriculture, uh, and climate-friendly nutrition, which I will talk about uh, later on. Okay, now this is a uh, investment process. I, I shall not dwell too long on this, uh, but rest assured that this, both the funds or both the fund managers, right? 
they have a very disciplined and very systematic process when it comes to assessing uh, investments, one, from a financial perspective. The second one is from an ESG perspective. Right? So both are very thorough in their process, uh, especially to go through the ESG and in order to be classified as an ESG fund. Yeah? Now, here I give you a sense of where the investment is um, two months ago. Yeah? So if you look at the positive change fund, right, about 49% of their investments are in companies in North America. Okay? Europe is about 25%. Right? And uh, developed Asia pack is about 3%, it's quite small. So emerging market is spread out about 20%. Now you see for climate tech on your right hand side, uh, again, the distribution is fairly similar. US is about 48%. Uh, if you add up Europe, it's roughly about 28%, right? And then you have other countries, right? So geographically, the investments are pretty well spread out and they are almost the same. Okay. Okay. Now here, um, just to give you a better perception or a sense of you know, what this company, these funds are doing and what are the companies that they are invested in. Right? Now, if we start off in, with the positive change fund, right? uh, you, you can see like the top holdings here. Uh, companies like ASML and TSMC, number one and number four, are basically semiconductor companies. Right? So, Part of the reason why semiconductor companies are considered as ESG funds are because semiconductors are being used in uh, our integrated circuits for technology, as well as to run a lot of uh, very complex items. Yeah? So they are considered uh, as enablers of technology, right? so which, is, which is being used to help the world to become a better place because it's being used in cars, being used in phone, computers for communication, uh, and to, as well as to manage buildings efficiency when it comes to um, temperature control and so forth. Yeah. So now besides the core function of this, uh, these companies, which is to make computer chips and semiconductors yeah, chips, uh, both the companies have also gone above, uh, for example, we all know that semiconductor companies uses a lot of energy, right? Because to make the wafer chips, uh, you require a lot of water as well as energy, right? So both companies are now very committed to use only renewable energy right? um, instead of using fossil fuel, right? So that's one way that they're proving to investors that they are going ESG, right? They have also proved that you know, they are becoming more efficient when it comes to using water um, to clean their wafer. Yeah. Uh, second companies, Moderna, I think we all know, uh, Moderna mRNA technology to do vaccines as well as uh, to come up with cures for quite a lot of diseases, right? This is one of the forefront of uh, medical technology uh, at the moment in the world. Okay. Tesla, obviously, we all know about Tesla, Tesla electric vehicle. Uh, for those who are interested, I was just looking up the price of Tesla. Uh, in Malaysia, the lowest, the cheapest Tesla car, the Model 3 is about 288,000 and the most expensive is about 488,000, right? So something for you to consider if you want to reduce your carbon footprint. Yeah? Uh, then we have companies like Dexcom, Dexcom is a glucose monitoring machine. So for diabetic uh, people, right, what this does is that you actually put uh, a sensor underneath your skin, which will then monitor your glucose level um, in your body. So it becomes a lot easier for us to manage uh, if you have high glucose level in your body. Right? So Mercado Libre, I think we, we have spoken about it. Uh, so the other thing, so now I move on to climate tech. Yeah. Um, so Mr. Chung, Mr. Chung, yes. so sorry about that. The time is almost up. 
Um, so can we move on to Q and A? Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. So sorry about that. Yeah. All right. So there's one question here. Most of the ESG fund uh, you are talking, yeah, is concentrated in the US. Do we have any ESG Asia as Japan fund? And see, because uh, since US might be in downturn territory of the interest, uh, due mainly to the interest rate rising policy, uh, yeah, environment. Uh, okay, I'm, mm. I'm sure they are, we have ESG funds uh, for, for Asia PAC, but uh, at the moment, at at M Invest, we 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 actually have one, uh, which is a global sustainable series, right? Um, okay. One one of the reasons why at this point in time, if you look through the geographical um, geographical uh, data uh, in terms of investing, uh, that most of it are in US and in Europe, is for one very simple reason. Uh, for these these countries, yeah, they are a lot more advanced when it comes to uh, e dealing with ESG issues. So the government there is a lot more proactive, yeah, and the companies themselves are a lot more proactive. So to give you an example, um, in Europe they have something called a uh, taxonomy, right? Which Malaysia is now trying to adopt. Uh, I think Bank Negara. Uh, is now currently looking at it. Yeah. So what, what this does is that taxonomy helps to, it's a, work, it's a tax code that helps you to identify uh, what are the things that you are doing that is currently ESG compliant and then you can offset with taxes and so forth. Right? Now, to cut the story short, uh, in Asia, ESG investing is still fairly new in Asia. It only happens in the last five years. Right? So not that many companies have adopted to it. So, so it will take time for Asian companies, right, especially in the emerging markets, uh, to really adopt their practices. Okay? So if you see now, right, in Malaysia, for example, uh, companies now are required to actually um, report on what are the ESG that they have done um, you know, for their companies, right? So, so that is why the markets for ESG companies, all right, or sorry, the universe for ESG companies in Asia at the moment um, is a little bit not as big as what you see globally. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Chung. So the time is already up. And uh, yeah, we will move on to our next speaker for the next session. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Chung, for your insightful sharing on the ESG topic today. And we think, uh, we hope that the investor right now, still staying with us, do grab some insight over the ESG industry. Right, thank you so much, Mr. Chung. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'd like to you. take the opportunity to wish everyone a happy Chinese New Year, right? And uh, a prosperous one and hopefully stay safe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you so much. All right, thank you.
Welcome back. We have reached the second half of the event and we really hope that you are enjoying the virtual session so far. If you find this virtual event useful, do share it out with your friends and family on Facebook or YouTube. Moving on to the seventh speaker of the day, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Patrick Chang and he is the Chief Investment Officer of Equities and ASEAN Region of Principal Asset Management. Patrick Chang joined Principal in 2016 and he comes with more than 20 years of experience in the asset management industry. He was previously the head of ASEAN Equities at BNP Paribas Investment Partners, Malaysia, where he oversees ASEAN Equities for both Malaysian and offshore clients from 2012. Prior to that, he served as Senior Vice President for Principal, where he specialized in Malaysia, ASEAN and Asia Specialist Funds. He also worked as a portfolio manager at Ricks and Co International Private Banking in London, specializing in managing global ETF portfolios. He is a graduate in Masters of Finance from City University Business School and holds a Bachelor in Accounting and Financial Analysis from University of Warwick, UK. We would now like to invite Mr. Patrick with his topic, Building Sustainable Growth. Mr. Patrick, over to you. Hi, um, a good afternoon to everyone. Um, and many thanks to uh, IFAS again for uh, inviting uh, Principal to uh, this uh, very interesting, uh, uh, what I call speed dating for investments. Uh, I've got uh, about 20 minutes, uh, if I recall, uh, to basically just uh, share with you uh, my thoughts on, on the markets, particularly on equities itself. And our theme for uh, uh, this year itself, especially in the first half, is to just uh, backtrack a little bit and think about growth from a more sustainable basis, not just uh, from an ESG point of view, which uh, one of the, you know, the previous speaker was alluding to early on, uh, but more importantly, from uh, an investment return point of view, as well as from a growth perspective, right? As you all know, uh, essentially, uh, you know, the markets itself, right? Uh, and you can see here in this chart, uh, over the last two years have had a very fantastic run, right? Especially in developed markets, whether it's going to be the US, uh, whether it's going to be Europe and Japan as well, right? And you can see that uh, NMCI World uh, up by 20% last year and 40%. Most of this, as you probably remember from the other speakers as well, they probably uh, alluded to the fact that a lot of this has been uh, uh, fast forwarded uh, mainly because of what we call quantitative easing, which means in non-technical terms, it means the fuel engine that fuels the markets. And sometimes I think, right, um, you know, we forget that this jet fuel engine has to come at a price. And the price of this is the price of money, interest rates, which I will talk about a little bit later on how we see the trajectory of the US Federal Reserve interest rates, how it will impact developed markets as well as Asia. But more importantly, from your point of view, how it would then shape the way you think about your uh, ability to diversify away from all of this noise and think about more sustainable returns going into 2022. And I think this is gonna be a year, as I told my team this year from January the 2nd, when I first came back to work, it's gonna be a year where it is really going to be, pardon the pun, uh, where investors are going to be either men or boys. And I'm not trying to be sexist about this. Essentially what I really mean is that, you know, you really need to be able to navigate across the volatility and all these kind of noises that we're hearing, oil prices going up, tapering, and all these technical jargons and so forth. But I do think that if you look at this particular summary of the returns, I do think that those are, which are in double-digit returns will moderate. And I think the sustainable returns will come from the markets which have an underperformed, particularly, for example, like China, for example, and certain markets in Asia, uh, which we continue to be uh, very, very positive on are going especially in the first half of this year. The other point I want to talk about as well, if you look at the bottom half down here, is that don't forget at the end of the day that despite the fact that from an asset allocation basis, we continue to favor equities versus fixed income, you need to also be risk aware and more importantly think about yield at yielding assets as well, where you can see down there the fixed income market, obviously because of interest rates have been rising, have been in negative returns last year, and I do think that in the first half of this year, it will continue the trend. 
But I think at some point in the second half itself, yields being backing up where it should be, especially in the 10 years in the US treasuries, where I think it will be hovering between two to 2.2% at some point, I do think it will set itself up for some opportunities and fixed income as well. The point I'm trying to make here is that essentially, uh, you know, this, this year itself is not going to be a very, very straightforward year. I do think that it's going to be also a very exciting year uh, for us to uh, think about. So what is going to perform and outperform? So you can see here a bit of marketing down here, you know, things that have performed last year, mainly developed markets, a global Titan fund, millennial fund, most of the global tech have done fairly well. Asia itself, more subdued returns. Uh, for example, our flagship fund, Diamond Income Fund was up by 2.8%. But off late itself, you can see uh, the China markets as well as Asia starting to uh, so-called decouple away uh, from the noise from the US. I'll talk a bit about later. And also sometimes people also forget nearer to home itself. We've got ASEAN, we've got China. These are markets where I'm very, very excited about. And I'll talk a bit about, a bit about later. And on Malaysia itself, uh, you know, despite all the volatility we've seen and, and so forth, I think we are going to see potentially a more subdued return to Malaysia. Having said that, small caps opportunities will still abound. So I think that trend will continue in 2022. But more importantly, before we get into uh, what are the opportunities are, I thought it'd be good to set up uh, uh, the framework of how we think about growth uh, from our point of view. This is a summary of our compilation in principle. Uh, whereby we can see down here the average return for US, sorry, average growth rate for US will be about 3.7%, where it's going to be front end loaded. We can see here Q1, Q2, high falls to four, mid, uh, 4% and moderating to 2022. This has implications to our outlook on inflation, and this is in, has implications to our outlook on interest rates. Effectively, our base case is that the U.S. Federal Reserve will raise rates by at least three times this year and another three times next year. But that's assuming that inflation continues to be on the rise, which we think in the second half of this year, it will start to moderate a little bit. Now, when you think about uh, uh, the other uh, 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 markets as well, like China, for example, uh, we think that we are now entering an environment as well, which I'll talk a bit later where I think there is going to be a decoupling in terms of monetary policy. You can see that uh, we are a little bit more cautious in the first quarter, but we expect a rebound in the second quarter and that trend continuing up to the third quarter and fourth quarter. We are basically advocating the fact that China is going to be a very interesting market despite the noises that we're hearing in the property segment, as well as some of the big tech sectors that did last year. I think we're starting to sense as well now that monetary policy is going to ease and I do think that this is a signal by the Chinese government to actually start to think about growth rather than controlling growth. And I'll discuss that a bit later. So that is basically how we look at uh, two polars of the world. You always ask me a lot of questions about US versus China. I still think the China-US tensions will continue. But I think Chinese market uh, going into the first half of this year is going to be a fairly interesting market to be in. But more importantly, uh, uh, before we get into the different opportunities again, I just want to set up the view then this whole big debate about inflation. Our base case is that despite inflation being high going into the first half of this year, we do think at some point in the second half of this year, especially in developed markets like US and, and, and Europe, will start to have more moderated inflation rates. Why are we so confident about this? Because the base impact, which is the base of year-on-year -year numbers, because the numbers have been starting to rise in the second half of 2021, will start to then moderate a little bit. The caveat to this view is that if the US continues to have higher inflation, then there will be no choice by the Federal Reserve uh, to actually raise more than three times. But our base case is that they'll raise three times, and we do think that in the second half, inflation will start to moderate. What that really means from a stock market perspective is that despite all of what we are hearing in the, you know, all the declines in the technology sector and so forth and all the other growth sectors, I do think at some point this year itself, particularly in the second quarter when the Federal Reserve starts to raise its rates and also start to indicate the tapering is over, I do think that people are going to price in a lot of these bad news and it's really time to actually think about growth sectors and also developed markets as well. For the time being, I think the volatility will continue. Now, the other point is that why, why do we think that the moderation inflation is going to come off in the second half? 
Effectively, what we have done is to analyze, for example, the uh, purchase managers index, and that is starting to slow down a little bit already, especially in China as well as in the US. But more importantly, right, one of the biggest factors that has been dri driving global transportation rates or freight rates. Some of you uh, in the audience are probably business people. You and I know at the end of the day, it's been a very challenging amount, especially if you're a manufacturer and you want to export your goods out there. Most of your margins have been crimped because of freight rates. And you can see the chart now here, right? Over the last uh, year or year and a half, it's actually because of the pandemic, you know, basically freight rates have gone down and gone up uh, very, very substantially, right? But of late, you started to see most of the global freight rates. You can see there the composite index down there in the middle town, the blue line, basically starting to come off. I think if this trend continues, all of the bottlenecks that you're seeing in Port Klang or in Changhana, Shanghai and so forth, I think that would moderate. And then uh, we will start to see some moderation in terms of inflation expectations. And hopefully that will basically normalize in terms of uh, all the congestions and the supply constraints that we're seeing, right? So that is basically uh, our view. Now, this is all other debate about the Fed Reserve. I've talked a bit about that. To me, right, I don't think we should be more worried about just because the uh, interest rates are going up. You know, Bloomberg has a very funny way of telling us all these bad news when bad news always happens, right? But, you know, to put things in perspective, right, people forget, right, in 2020, particularly after the March sell-off when we just had the first lockdown, when all of us were staying at home, being very depressed, not knowing what the future was and so forth. I remember very, very vividly when, you know, essentially the Federal Reserve went out there and they printed a lot of money. In fact, the Federal Reserve's interest rates went from 2% to almost 0% overnight, right? And so you can see the chart down here, right? About 1.5% all the way down to zero. What they're effectively doing now is basically when the economy is rebounding, they're basically trying to match interest rates higher. So I remember, you know, uh, talking to my parents and my relatives and they all complained, you know, you put your money in FD, FD rates are so low. Then I told them this, you know, the price of this uh, is that uh, when the interest rates are low, the value of your assets, especially risky assets, whether it's not property, right? Whether it's going to be a technology fund, whether it's going to be a growth fund, whether it's going to be a China fund, naturally goes up because basically in theory, basically your cost of money goes up, your value goes higher, right? So when you start to have all of this tapering and all of these rate increases, people start to get a bit worried. And so that's where we are. We are going through a natural cycle of interest rates. The Federal Reserve is only going to raise rates by up to 0.75 this year, and maybe by next year to about 1%. That will bring the total interest rates up to where we were before, even lower, slightly lower than where we were before in March 2020. Now, essentially, when you think about the psychology of this, right, it's very interesting. Actually, you know, late last year, we all knew that inflation was going to go up. Nobody actually believed that this whole inflation better reserve thing was going to spook the markets. You come back to the new year, everywhere. So everybody's asking me, why is this suddenly happening? Well, it's all about expectations because the Federal Reserve, unfortunately, has been a bit late in telling the people that they wanted to raise rates. So it's about expectations. Now that they are telling the people that they're going to raise rates, I think at some point, people are going to get used to it. People, meaning investors like us, right? They're going to get used to this idea. And so when that happens, I think the volatility will come up a little bit. Now, the only real risk to this view is that if inflation numbers and the port congestions do not ease, and if wages in the US continue to rise, then of course, the Federal Reserve will then have to basically announce a, start, a faster rate of increase in rates. And that obviously will cause volatility. But for now, I don't think the Federal Reserve is really in a hurry to spook the market because the fact of the matter is, right, the Fed looks at the market, you know, okay? It's just now releasing what we call uh, the release valve in the market itself, to remove the froth. And I have another chart about technology a bit later, and I'll show you a bit later, right? But it's actually, it's really removing the froth. It's similar to what the Chinese government was trying to do last year. It's just that the Chinese government is much smarter, right? They actually did it one year ahead of everything else because they knew that the Federal Reserve was going to raise rates. So they decided that, okay, you know what? I've got a lot of debt out there. I better basically remove the froth out there before anybody else. So they're letting some of the property companies at Evergrande go down and so forth. Now, guess what they're doing? They're now thinking about reducing rates. So I think it's going to be a very interesting environment where 
developed markets are going to raise rates in line with inflation, and certain markets in Asia, but again in China, are going to reduce rates to support growth. And if you're a smart investor, you want to be able to buy into a market in the short term, at least short term means three to six months, into markets which are stimulative in the short term. And I think the Chinese government is right on track about that, right? So, and that is why I think the priority for the Chinese government, if you notice the language, especially in December, when all most of us were, you know, having a holiday in Langkawi or whatever it was, they were actually saying in the Central Economic Work Conference, the key word is now stability. When the Chinese government talks about that, right, you got to pay attention because the last time they talked about that was probably in 2016. If you recall in 2016, they were having, having a lot of outflows and so forth, right? And then we went, they went back uh, to the drawing board and they basically told the, the, the rest of the people in the economy that, you know, I actually want to have growth at a reasonable range. So I think this is going to be an interesting start of what the policymakers in China are going to focus on, which means going back to the drawing board, making sure that stability is back, making sure that growth will be at least be growing at between five to five and a half percent. Because don't forget, at the end of the day, when you have 1.4 or 1.35 billion people in China, you cannot afford to let growth go down too fast. And so I think Xi Jinping is well aware of it. He's already done the release valve uh, stuff, which fortunately, unfortunately, the Federal Reserve is doing it at the moment, right? So I, I suppose where I'm coming from is that the recent easing chi Chinese is, uh, uh, signals to the market that they have moved away from tightening, which means removing liquidity from the market, to now supporting the market with some sense of a uh, 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 minor stimulus and so forth. Now, I'm not saying that the Chinese government is going to turn on the tap to actually release a hell of a lot of, of liquidity out there just because they want the property market to go up. I don't think that's the intention, right? If you read Chinese enough, uh, they will basically say that, you know, when you buy a property in China, it's meant for you to live. So the problem in China today is that a lot of Chinese people out there have multiple properties and they speculate too much. So he's just basically taking the froth out of the, those kind of things and making sure that the growth trajectory of the economy continues to be, to be, uh, to be stable. And, you know, last year, it was all talking about this whole concept about inner circulation, making sure that they're more dependent on themselves and consumption and so forth, right? So I don't think that will change, right? But I do think that there is going to be some developments to support the growth. And I do think that every time they do that, markets start to pricing a little bit higher than where we are today. And that has been expressed uh, early part of this year, this week as well, uh, when you saw the head share market rebound by at least 3%. I think the markets are starting to put money back to work and rotate out of, uh, for example, the US market uh, in line with the um, divergence of the interest rates between the two countries. Now, we talk about US interest rates, we talk about tapering, we talk about China. I suppose the biggest billion dollar question out there from your point of view is where are the opportunities out there? Now, I'm not going to tell you how to invest, but I'm going to talk, talk through this in terms of themes. And, and the way I think about this is that you need to basically think about your portfolios from a more diversified manner. And therefore, you would then, by diversifying those risks, you would then get more sustainable returns going into 2022. First and foremost, the big elephant in the room today, everybody talks about it. The US market has, is just correcting. Technology uh, NASDAQ is correcting. Where do you put your money if you want to be in the US? I strongly believe the opportunity today is in the US small caps. And you can see down here where the divergence of the PE is huge, where it trades about 15 times versus the US market about 12, 20 to 22 times PE. And I do think that a lot of these small cap companies are also fairly resilient uh, and also basically going to benefit, for example, from the US infrastructure plans, uh, which the Biden administration uh, is to, uh, looking to, uh, to uh, support. And I, I heard early on about renewables in, the, in developed markets. These small cap companies also, uh, are, are some of these companies also have renewable sectors as well, um, and, and therefore uh, will benefit from this whole ESG movement that's happening globally, especially in the US. The other thing I want to talk about as well is that the not very sexy topic today is about technology. And, you know, I was just doing some... Uh, 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 a, a quick update on, on the NASDAQ itself and how much uh, it has risen over the last year and a half since March 23rd at the bottom of the market. Staggering numbers, right? Uh, the NASDAQ is up by about 132% since 
at the bottom of the market in 2020. And anytime you invest between 2020 to 2021, you will make money. And you've seen that in our global tech fund as well, where you invested even last year itself, it was about up to 24%. Now, naturally speaking, when you go up so much, the market needs to find an excuse to basically correct. And that's where we are today. Now, a lot of clients have been asking me, what is going to be the difference between the, uh, the tech bubble, in inverted commas, today versus what happened 21 years ago right, or 22 years ago in 2020? The big difference is that I do think that this time around, you've got to be more discerning when you invest in technology, especially in global technology funds, whereby we segregate them by two categories. One, when you think about mega, uh, mega cap technology companies, whether it is the Apples, uh, the, the, um, the Intels, uh, and so forth, you know, which are basically very strong in terms of the balance sheets. They have very, very strong cash flows. You know, I, I personally have visited Apple before, uh, and that was about two years ago. At that time itself, they were sitting, market cap was about less than a billion US dollars, and their cash holds were about 400 billion, right? Today, you fast forward, the market cap of Apple is close to about the 1.3 trillion. Now it's corrected a little bit, but I think the cash flows are close to about a third as well. And that's about a trillion in terms of cash. So, so where do you want to invest? Obviously you want to invest in the profitable mega cap tax. Now there are also segments where unfortunately there are also a lot of technology companies which have risen because of uh, you know, a lot of froth as I call it, right? And so obviously these non-profitable technology index has been going down. In fact, it's been going down way ahead of the Nasdaq correction that we've seen this year. So I suppose where I'm coming from is that unfortunately, people don't think too hard about technology, about profitable companies versus non-profitable companies. When you have volatility, as they say in our world, you know, people throw out the baby with the bathwater, which means that people amalgamate the profitable companies with the non-profitable companies. At some point, and I do believe at some point, maybe in the second quarter of this year, when it coincides with the Federal Reserve rising, raising its rates itself, I do think that the technology correction that we've seen today is going to set up itself for a lot of opportunities for customers like yourselves to start thinking about relooking into it. Because ultimately, what does that really mean? It really means that we are no longer 21 years ago buying into technology companies, which are basically not going to be here for the next 20 years. I do think that profitable technology companies out there are going to be here to stay. Even the Teslas of this world, which don't really make that much money, is going to be here for a while because I have another section about EV cars later on, right? And EV is going to be what I call the biggest beneficiary of um, the ESG movements that's happening. And I do think, uh, and also because of climate change, but I also believe that technology is here to stay. You can't run away from it. You and I use our mobile phones. In fact, you know, most of us talk to our mobile phones more than we talk to our family sometimes. So that's the reality of life, right? We need to be discerning about quality tech versus profitless tech. And that is how you're going to make money uh, this year in technology. The other point, obviously, and, and obviously I, I'm a bit more biased uh, in, 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 in Asia itself, is the opportunity in Asia, right? Uh, and mainly because I see the big, huge uh, valuation gap, especially in China and also emerging Asia as well, where I think the valuation is starting to be more attractive. And also, it's a also a home for a lot of technology companies and industrial companies and, and, and also uh, companies which I think uh, are quality companies, uh, and, um, uh, particularly in the uh, India uh, uh, digital economy, as well as some of the automation companies in China itself. So uh, I think Asia is going to be a, a great opportunity if this correction continues, uh, particularly in China, as well as uh, in India. Um, and talking about China itself, uh, our base case is that a lot of bad news has been priced in today. I do believe at the end of the day, you know, uh, these kind of pressures that we talk about in terms of all the controls on the technology sector there uh, the, and the mega caps and the property sector are behind us. I think you heard me talk about just now about the stimulus packages that's coming out from China. I think this is going to be setting itself up for uh, the Chinese market to outperform or even I would impossibly the idea that decouple away from the other uh, equity markets across uh, the world. Um, and this is the chart that I talked about earlier on, the divergence about the market and economic policies. The US is tightening, China is going, you can debate all day long whether who is going to be right or wrong this time around. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you believe the right-hand chart now here 
where the Chinese economy is going to be reliant on itself even more, and they're going to build more and more uh, uh, of its uh, global supply chains internally, rather than relying, for example, on the US, I think this economy is going to start its set up itself uh, for a very interesting decade ahead of, of us, right? Um, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about China, uh, and these are all the common questions, uh, but essentially, I do believe the worst of regulation tightening is over. Property credit turmoil, I think we are starting to see basically some of the bonds in the property market start to rebound already. So I think that's a clear signal that uh, for now, at least, uh, the default rates uh, in the Chinese property market uh, is behind us. Uh, nearer to home, uh, you've heard me talk about a uh, digital boom in ASEAN itself. I don't repeat myself, but essentially, uh, I'm a big bull on, on a lot of digital boom in ASEAN, uh, where you, know, you can see all these uh, bellwether names, whether it's Lazada, whether it's Shopee, and so forth. I do believe that ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, the other guys who are going to benefit from this are the banking sector, which are now gearing up for digital banking revolution. And you, you start to hear, for example, uh, our central bank, even in Malaysia, talking about issuing up until about 20 digital banking licenses, uh, and most of the analysis are going to come out in the first quarter of this year. I do think that this is going to be a very exciting space to look out for, and they are going to be beneficiaries from this as well. Uh, moving on, uh, climate change. Uh, the previous speaker has spoken about this. I just want to spend a bit more time talking about the relevance of ESG, not just from a a, 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 a global perspective from this particular chart itself. And basically, obviously, you know, uh, you know I work for a, a European company, but obviously the Europeans are way ahead of this. And you had, I think the previous speaker talked about, and there was a question about Asia, right? And I just want to talk about Asia's uh, a revolution when I think about uh, a ESG, right? And this is a classic example of why I think climate change is changing one of the biggest polluters in the world, and that's China, to move the number of cars that they are selling on an annualized basis. Give us some numbers, right? 25 million uh, people out there, essentially global EV sales, you know, of a quarter of that basically going to an EV. I do think that essentially this is going to set up sales for uh, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities, particularly in ESG Asian funds. Uh, we have one coming on board uh, soon. So if you're interested in that, let your salespeople know. Uh, I do think that this is going to be a center space to think about because we are in the early stages of ESG revolution. Uh, in Asia itself, and I think the EV segment of the market could be one area that we want to be invested in. And of course, you know, renewable energies, alternative fuels, battery producers, and so forth and all that, right? I'm probably going to be running out of time. So in conclusion itself, you know, there's only three things I think you need to think about when you think about investments this year. I think the backdrop of the, uh, of the market is not going to be the same as what we've seen in the last two years, right? And I think the, the message that I want to send to all our investors out there is number one, at the end of the day, know where your risk appetite is and be a risk aware going into uh, 2022. I think you still can continue to be overweight equities and fixed income, but you need to moderate your risk appetite. Bigger and more global, global diversified is the way to go, I think. And therefore, that's why I gave you a lot of themes for that small cap in the US, you know, uh, China, and so forth. And I also think that if you are a little bit more, uh, uh, you want more exposure into uh, 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 developed markets, you got to think about quality growth. And of course, last but not least, uh, this whole ESG thing uh, team uh, is going to be here to stay. And I do think there are lots of opportunities, particularly in Asia for renewables, alternative fuels, as well as food sustainability. That's all from me. Thank you very much. And um, if we have enough time, I'm happy to take any questions and answers. Hi, Patrick. Yes, thank you so much for your insightful sharing. It's indeed a very, very informative session. And we do have some questions flowing in. Um, okay, there's one question for you. Uh, China, India, and Indonesia are big markets right now. So what is the outlook of this market as we had here you mentioning that the China is all about stability. And also on the other side, uh, China is having some regulatory concerns over the big tech giant and also property crisis such as Evergrande issue. So what's your view on this? Yeah, so I, I first question, you know, I, I think I've answered it already, right? I, I, mm -hmm. I do, for now, uh, the worst of the regulatory tightening, uh, it could be behind us. Uh, from our perspective, uh, I do see that, uh, I think the Chinese authorities are backing a little bit, although I don't think that um, they actually want all of these big tech companies to overwhelm the landscape of the corporate world uh, in China. I think that's key point number one. I think. When you think about it from a, a Xi Jinping point of view, uh, a, a very more stable 
uh, a, a more uh, inner circulation kind of world, uh, you want to be able to be, uh, how would I say it? You want to be, you want to share the prosperity across uh, the people. And that's where I think the, the essence of the regulatory tightening coming from China. Now, I think the other question uh, from you uh, within that question itself is, uh, what was that again? Um, um, just a moment. Uh... On, on, on Chinese property, right? I, yes, I is, is yeah. the threat so I, already Yeah, I suppose, I, suppose, I suppose we are, are, are in that uh, environment today where, you know, the interesting part is, my theory about China today, which is interesting and is counter cynical, right, is that, you know, like I said earlier on, right, they were willing to, to, to experiment with the release valve theory. The release valve theory is that there was so much excess leverage into the market and people... You know, for the longest time I've been going to China, people have been talking about this for more than a decade. They realized that enough is enough. In fact, they already started doing this about two to three years ago, but they accelerated this. And you've got to ask yourself, why on earth did they want to accelerate this, especially in 2021, when the economy was still fairly buoyant? My simple answer to that was that because they could. It's a command economy. They are willing to do that because they believe that, you know, why not take the release valve off now when the economy is, you don't want to do it when the economy is actually uh, 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 deteriorating, right? And so I think they have, they, they have, they've done that. The economy actually had decelerated, consumption decelerated, property sales have decelerated, and then some uh, property uh, developers have gone under. They're willing to let them go under. But that's interesting to me, right? Because to me, you know, the Chinese government also knows that the property sector is the largest wealth impact for a lot of Chinese consumers out there. And so you, you want to release it, but you also don't want to kill the golden goose, though, right? So now that I think this credit turmoil that we're seeing today is starting to now uh, 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 come off, especially when you're releasing liquidity, you have RR cards and so forth. It's a signal to me that, okay, guys, enough is enough. I've taught you a lesson. The risk, let's move on. And the stability of the economy is a priority today. Right, thank you so much for your answers. And moving on to second question, that will be our last question of the day. So what's your take over the US mega tech versus the mid or small cap tech stock potential going into the next 12 months? Um, I, honestly speaking, you know, I, I do think, um, you know, I think we are in an environment where I think the mega caps are, are essentially are going to go through a minor correction in the bull market. And I think that's a healthy sign. Uh, at some point, uh, whether they're going to be small cap technology companies or mega cap companies, which I think are quality companies, I think both of these segments in the market are going to be uh, a favorable environment to be in. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, uh, you know, with the cost of money rising, a lot of growth companies suffer in the short term. But I don't think it's going to last forever. So I think at some point this year itself, you will set yourself up for an opportunity for clients to buy into this. And uh, if you look at some of our global tech companies today, you know, these are the companies which we are in, and I don't think we are in any way close to those kind of speculative tech that people uh, uh, invested in. I don't want to mention what the funds out there, but essentially, you know, we're going to try to avoid that in our portfolios. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Patrick. So the time is already up. Thank yep. you so much for your insightful sharing today. And a lot of investors giving a very good feedback over your presenting today. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Patrick. And I mean, we yeah. hope that you join our... Uh, next event ahead. Yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much uh, and uh, wishing all the uh, you know Chinese investors of ours a uh, happy Konsi Fa Chai and the year of the tiger. Uh, I'm a big believer that tiger year is going to be a very interesting year. So uh, hopefully uh, we shall continue to grow uh, and and invest together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Patrick, and happy Chinese New Year to you too. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.
Welcome back. Moving on to the eighth speaker of the day, I would like to introduce Mr. Supreet Ban. He is an executive director of JP Morgan Asset Management. Supreet Ban is the head of Southeast Asia Fund for JP Morgan Asset Management. In this role, he is responsible for the firm's sub advisory business in Southeast Asia and India. Since 2013, Supreet was previously head of fund sales for the firm's onshore business in India. Since relocating to Singapore in early 2017, he led the firm's funds and in institutional business in Southeast Asia till 2020. Supreet begins his career in 2002 with Kotak Life and worked with DSP Blackrock Investment Managers from 2004 till 2013. Supreet is a Bachelor of Technology holder from Punjab Technical University and is an MBA holder from Army Institute of Management, Kolkata. We will now invite Mr. Supreet with his topic, Climate change, getting to net zero carbon emission by 2050, will take a new industrial revolution. Mr. Supreet, over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, wish you a belated Happy New Year. Um, may 2022 be joyous and health, uh, healthy for all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you all this afternoon, so I want to start by thanking uh, IFAST for the opportunity to come and present to you, but also our partners in Malaysia, uh, RHB Asset Management, uh, who are bringing this exciting opportunity called the Climate Change Solutions, and it's my privilege to be presenting the investment case to you today. Uh, I know that uh, several of the speakers that I'm sharing this uh, forum with have spoken to you about sustainability, about ESG, and I'm actually quite pleased that they've teed up uh, this conversation quite well because a lot of them have focused on the need for investors to incorporate ESG into their portfolios. Uh, through the course of my presentation today, I'm going to speak about three main aspects. I will speak to you about why climate change is the number one challenge for humankind. It's not inflation, it's not market volatility, and it's not COVID. The number one challenge in our lifetimes is climate change problems. I will also speak to you about the climate change solutions of JP Morgan Asset Management that's, coming, that's being brought to Malaysian investors through the RHB Climate Change Solutions Fund, how does it seek to invest into companies that provide products and services that offer solutions to these climate change problems? We will focus on not just companies that are trying to reduce their emission, but indeed companies that are trying to solve these climate change problems. Also, finally, on the third point, this strategy presents a, a compelling and unique opportunity, both from ESG perspective, but also from an investment growth perspective as well. So what I want you to remember is while doing good for the planet, you can do well in your portfolio as well. So we're not here to appeal to the goodness of your hearts. We're here to strike a balance between doing good for the planet, but also doing well in our portfolios as well. So if that sounds like a reasonable agenda, let's launch into my first point. Why is climate change solutions the number one problem for the world? What we've got for you here is a thermometer, which is showing you where we were uh, close to about um, 100 years back in terms of global temperatures. And because of global warming, where we are today, and if we don't address this issue, even with the current commitments of governments and policymakers, they'll be likely to be. So you notice that first uh, arrow in the bottom, pre-industrial levels. Since then, the current one, which is the red bar, we've warmed up the planet because of economic industrial activity, greenhouse gas emissions, which are carbon dioxide, methane, and several other greenhouse gases, have contributed to the planet warming up by one degree since pre-industrial times. If we continue with the current commitments of governments, which is called the nationally determined contributions or, or the efforts from governments to reduce carbon emissions, by the end of this century, the planet will heat up by 2.7 degrees. That's not sustainable. The planet cannot sustain that level of warming up. What scientists have discovered, and this, there's a far bigger consensus 
that we can only afford to let the planet grow by uh, grow warmer compared to pre-industrial levels by one and a half degrees centigrade only. That's the bigger room that we have, and which is why you've heard of COP26, you've heard of climate change issues and governments focusing on it. And it's not just governments that are focused on it. If you go to the next slide, uh, we see this widespread occurrence uh, of climate related issues across the world. I know there have been unfortunate floods in Malaysia in the recent times, but globally, these freak environmental episodes are taking place, which is not just leading to catastrophic loss of life, but also structural issues around economics where it's creating because of loss of employment and assets, it's le leading to creation of new class of poor. So whether it's the hurricanes or tornadoes in the US, wildfires or the bushfires in Australia, even the developed countries are not immune to this and it's affecting communities and societies at large. So it's, it's obviously brought a lot of attention from the governments and policymakers. But if you go to the next slide, and I'm conscious we're on a Saturday afternoon, I just wanted to bring in Hollywood as well. Hollywood has also addressed this topic. Now, we're all hoping that whether it was the day after tomorrow or Interstellar where Matthew McConaughey actually sets off on his search for finding a new planet that we can inhabit as human or mankind, because Earth has become unlivable, we all hope it's fiction. But there's plenty of attention that's been given on this as well. If you go to the next slide, let's try and address that issue and try and see as investors, how do we do good and do well in our portfolios? So the challenge is for the world to address greenhouse gas emissions in a way that the climate warms up by just one more degree by the end of the century. Which means that today we're emitting close to about 50 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year. Even at the current pace, if you don't address this, that number by 2050, which is less than 30 years from now, will go up by 50%, which means we would have emitted every year 75 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And that greenhouse gas emission is the number one reason for climate change or global warming. So the opportunity here as investors is really to find those businesses and those companies which are involved in solving these problems through innovative new solutions. The one other thing that I will point out is that this strategy is not a technology strategy. Climate change solutions providers can, can be present anywhere in any part of any market, in any market capitalization, and in any sector. It can be industrials, it can be technology, it can be several other sectors as well. So it's important to be broad-based, which is what we are in this strategy. If we go to the next slide, this will be very important for us to um, look at. And I know one of the speaker uh, through the course of the day today has, um, has addressed this, which is, Policy tailwinds. Now, many of us are familiar that when it comes to big tech, particularly consumer-facing technology, whether it's in the US or in China, there's been a lot of policy and regulatory headwinds. Whereas this field of climate change solutions has policy tailwinds because governments, institutions, and policymakers, all of them want to support companies and businesses and encourage them to solve these issues and climate change uh, problems that we'll address just momentarily. So remember, what is headwinds for big tech or consumer facing technology is actually tailwinds for companies which are trying to solve these climate change problems. Now I must also admit, we're not speaking about climate change issues for the first time. I remember ancient history when I was in school, climate change was still a topic. So what's changed since then? What's changed is availability of technology that can be employed to address a lot of these climate change uh, sources. For instance, one of the biggest sources I mentioned is carbon in the atmosphere. There is technology that exists today which can, which can move air through machines that extract that harmful carbon and release the, the air without that carbon. The challenge is that that technology is expensive today. And therefore, it's commercially not feasible right now. A lot like electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, as a concept, has been existing for at least 20 years. 
The reason we see that come into fruition over the last three to four years is because technology around electric vehicles has become a far more advanced and commercially feasible. And therefore, many speakers have alluded to electric vehicles as a very important and exciting sector, which we absolutely agree with. So the, the enhancement of technology over the past two, one to two decades has really allowed companies to innovate by using technology, even though they're not a technology company, but by using technology in order to solve these problems. Third, last but not the least, is consumer preferences. Not just you and I as consumers who are becoming more aware, but even the companies that we work for, whether it's iFast, whether it's RHB Asset Manager, Management, whether it's JP Morgan, all of us have our true North Star towards doing good for the planet while doing our business. So the, the patterns of consumption and operating in this environment are changing, and therefore there is will from institutions, individuals to in, uh, incorporate uh, better habits so as to, to grow in a manner which does not hurt the planet. So on the next slide, let's look at some of these commitments from uh, some large uh, countries. On the left-hand side, we're showing you China is right now the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. Not China's problem. Over the last 20 years, the West has outsourced its manufacturing to China, which is why most of the manufacturing, which typically leads to greenhouse gas emissions, is sitting in China right now. So China is emitting almost twice as much greenhouse gas emissions as the US and incredibly more compared to EU. But here's the good news. China has committed for neutrality of greenhouse gas emissions, which means they will take out equal amount of carbon from the atmosphere as they will emit by 2060. Similarly, US and Europe actually have far more aggressive targets, 2050. 2050 means for US and Europe, they will have to sequester equal amount of carbon from the atmosphere as they can emit. Now, granted, these are three, four decades away, but given the scale of the problem, scale of the challenge, the work has started a few years back, in fact, several years back, and is getting accelerated as we speak, which is why we believe what Bill Gates said earlier in our just a quarterback late 2021, that climate change solutions providers are likely to produce eight to 10 uh, winners over the future, whether you call them as Tesla, as Google, Amazon, or Microsoft, we all know those are household names today. But just like 10, 15 years back, these weren't household names, as adoption of their technology enhanced, the growth in their stock prices improved. Similarly, these companies that are involved in uh, solving these climate pro change problems, as they become more feasible, as investors take notice, will become the next uh, fangs of uh, the future. So if we go to the next slide, let's try and show you where do the opportunities or those compelling opportunities to strike that balance between uh, sustainability or climate change solutions providers and how are they good investment from a growth perspective as well. So the primary drivers of greenhouse gas emissions are given to you on the left-hand side. Generating electricity and heat uh, obviously, is the biggest contributor. So one quarter of greenhouse gas emission comes from generating electricity and heat. But agriculture, farming, is the second largest uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, 24%, so almost a quarter. Making things like steel concrete is another 21%. Warming buildings, heating buildings, another 6%. Going from point A to point B, taking flights, taking your cars and so on, transportation is about 14%. And the others con constitu constitute greenhouse gas emissions from waste. Remember, we are 7.6 billion people on the planet. We just generate a lot of waste. And which all of these put together leads to uh, themes that we, that we focus on on the right-hand side. So looking at the sources of greenhouse gas emissions, these are the five broad themes, which is renewable electricity or renewable uh, ecosystem, sustainable food and water, you can call it sustainable nutrition, which is how do you reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from farming, sustainable construction, sustainable transport, and even making sure that the, the waste that we generate, we, we try and recycle and reuse that so that we lead to zero waste or potentially um, you know, minimal waste. So if you go to the next slide, let's try and address some of these uh, areas. 
renewable and electrification clearly is the most prominent part today because plenty of work's been happening. Some speakers have spoken to you about wind farms, solar energy. Well, it's not just about providers of uh, turbines to those uh, companies, even those companies that provide the ecosystem of electrification, and we'll speak about some of them, will be beneficiaries as the world weans itself of, of coal-powered power station to more renewables. Sustainable construction, manufacturing steel and concrete are extremely uh, dirty processes when it comes to releasing greenhouse gas emissions. Making one ton of steel and concrete emits one ton of greenhouse gas emissions. Now it's not feasible for us to say, let's consume less of steel and concrete. That's just not going to happen. We are 7.6 billion people on the planet. Even if we assume population doesn't grow up, grow, you will see people transitioning or migrating from rural areas in emerging markets to urban areas. What's going on in Southeast Asia, China, India, that will lead to more consumption of concrete and steel. So the idea or the solution is not to say, let's consume less of this. If anything, we're going to consume more of it. The idea is to find processes by which you find ways of manufacturing this item with less amount of greenhouse gas emissions, or potentially find solutions like carbon capture, which, which actually captures that greenhouse gas emissions through those processes and cleans it before releasing the air into the atmosphere. Uh, sustainable food and water, I mentioned 24% of greenhouse gas emissions happens from this segment. But also, farming takes 70% of fresh water that's available on the planet today. So it's an extremely uh, inefficient sector. But you know, the reality, again, we're going to have more people. We're going to have to feed more people. And as, as the population grows more affluent globally, they will need better nutrition, or they will be able to buy better nutrition, which is why we need to produce more. So again, you can't say let's farm less. It's an important area. The key really is to use artificial intelligence, GPS, and cloud computing to solve some of these challenges. For instance, let me give you an example. And I know that came in one of the presentations earlier. Deer, which is a global leader in making tractors, is now a leader in providing solutions uh, towards precision farming. What is precision farming? Every seed that is planted in a field is actually collected as data point and logged on to a digital map. That digital map is then uploaded to cloud. That uh, digital map is then released to um, sprayers, which deer manufacturers, which then spray water, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, specifically in those areas which need it. So if a certain area of the field through artificial intelligence you've determined is low on Fertilizers, it emits a fertilizer there. If it needs water, it does that. Through this precision farming, farmers are able to reduce usage of water by 40% and usage of uh, pesticides and herbicides by a staggering 80 to 90%. Not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but in the process also saving costs for the farmer. So environmentally friendly, but also socially extremely valuable as well. Sustainable transport, many, many presenters have spoken about this, uh, which is electric vehicles and the ecosystem around electric vehicles. Finally, recycling and reuse. Waste that humankind generates leads to greenhouse gas emission. It also leads to problems in the oceans where a lot of that waste gets collected. There are businesses which are, which are solving very efficiently and are profitable companies, which we tend to be uh, interested in in this portfolio. So let's go to the next slide and speak about uh, an ecosystem where some of these climate change solution providers come together. I spoke to you about sustainable transport. Some of the names that will be familiar with to you will be CATL, which is a leading manuf a manufacturer of electric vehicle batteries, a China-based company, Contemporary Amperex Technology Limited, also another uh, EV manufacturer in China, Xiaopeng. But think about an electric vehicle. An electric vehicle clearly runs on electricity, not on diesel or petrol. But what if that electricity is generated by using thermal plants? That's an extremely inefficient way of running an electric vehicle. Because ultimately, somewhere, coal is being burnt to generate that electricity. So the key is to, electric to electrify the world and the entire ecosystem with renewable energy. And which is where renewable and electrification is extremely important. So these big wind farms that you see off the coast of Scandinavia, 
that offshore wind farms are connected to the onshore grids through high capacity uh, cables provided by names such as Prismian. And even Schneider that provides software and hardware to be able to connect this renewable energy, this precious source to electricity grids that you and I then can tap into. I spoke to you about sustainable food and water, gave you one example of uh, Dale, which is leading the world in uh, uh, precision agriculture, reducing waste and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But even names like Evoqua water, water is perhaps one of the most precious resources we have. Uh, water, uh, so Evoqua is in the field of water and based water management. It transforms even today, yearly, 4.5 billion gallons of water per day. 4.5 billion gallons of water is exactly the similar amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls every day. So really, uh, companies that are offering solutions for the planet in the form of transforming wastewater into more portable water. Names like Tetra Tech, which are leading names globally in desalinization. Again, uh, as there are more humans on the planet, we will need this precious resource more and more. And finally, there are names such as Tomra, which builds into that theme of recycling and reuse, which is essentially just as a uh, human population, we generate close to 14 trillion uh, cans or uh, containers of drinks every year. But that's a lot of, um, lot of drinks containers. Now, if we don't recycle that, that's a lot of waste, which leads to greenhouse gas emissions. All of us are familiar with uh, vending machines. Tomra manufactures something called as reverse vending machine which incentivizes consumers like me, once I've taken a can of Coke, instead of chucking it into a waste bin, I can actually submit it in this reverse vending machine. I get for that good behavior some points, like your credit card points that you get from your bank for using the credit card. And Tomra is able to recycle that for uh, use back into the industrial processes by selling it to, uh, to industries and to companies in their manufacturing process. So really leading the way in circular economy with least waste, Tomra last year saved the world 155 million uh, tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Again, a great name in the field, which naturally doesn't come to us intuitively. So hopefully I've given you a sense of where the opportunities exist. I'm gonna spend three or four minutes on the way we capture these opportunities. Remember what I said, the opportunities in this uh, emerging field of climate change solutions could be anywhere, it could be any part of the world, it could be any industry, it could be any market capitalization. Therefore, we want to start with the broadest opportunity set when it comes to identifying companies. So if we go to the next slide, let me show you how the process works. And this is where we bring in the power, what, next slide, please. This is where the power of uh, artificial intelligence comes in. So we use our fundamental equities team, our quantitative solutions team, and our sustainable investing team. On the next slide, if you go, this is where we use all these uh, capabilities along with artificial intelligence. Start with the broadest opportunity set, which is 13,000 companies globally. Then using artificial intelligence and big data, identifying the most relevant companies which are highest on these themes using natural language processing. So the five themes that we spoke about. The artificial intelligence engine uses big data in the form of all the publications that are available, whether it's uh, company filings, regulatory reports, uh, fact set data, uh, sell side brokerage reports, millions of data sources, which can't be seen through human eyes. It uses artificial, intel artificial intelligence to identify the 300 leading companies. That's when our fundamental team comes in to find which are the most attractive companies and captures those and finds the most 50 to 100 most attractive ideas than that we put in the portfolio. If you go to the next slide, this process of using artificial intelligence and fundamental then leads to this outcome, which is owning companies across different geographies, across different sectors and sub themes, and across mostly mid, small, and large capitalization. We don't have giant cap, which is $1 trillion and above, as I mentioned, a lot of these are businesses which are not household names. And as you notice, top 10 holdings, these aren't your household names like technology names like Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple. Those are tech names which are trying to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. What we're interested in are companies that are trying to solve these climate change problems. So the top 10 names, you notice many of them are industrial names, but really addressing 
uh, different themes, whether it's sustainable constru construction or infrastructure, or for that matter, food and water, nutrition, and several other sectors that we address in our portfolio. So let's try and bring all of this together on the next slide. Remember what I started out with. It's not inflation, it's not COVID. The number one challenge for humankind is climate change. So it is the number one issue. This strategy of climate change solutions that we bring to you through RHP Climate Change Solutions Fund seeks to invest in companies that provide solutions to these issues. And finally, it's not just about doing good, which is important, but also through our fundamental research, artificial intelligence, and our ability to identify leading names that can solve these problems, it's also about doing well in your portfolio as well. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague from RHB, Jason Cho, to walk you through some of the main features of the fund. And I'm, I'll be happy to take questions after that. Thank you. Thanks, Supreme. Yeah, uh, for RHB Asset Management, we have offered the RHB Climate Change Solution Fund to uh, fund to uh, investors and also uh, IFAS investors. So apparently this is a uh, fund aims to provide a long-term capital growth uh, by investing to one of the collected investors scheme that means uh, investing in JP Morgan climate change solution funds. So apparently these funds is available in, to, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, uh, we just launched uh, uh, last week and uh, we have two currency class. One is uh, Ringgit uh, Hedge and also USD class. Next, please. Uh, next page, please. All right, so uh, this is on the feeder fund uh, strategies where investors place the money into uh, IHP climate change solution fund. And for us, uh, we fit into JP Morgan climate change solution funds. That is the target fund uh, managed by JP Morgan as a management uh, So uh, next page, please. So uh, this fund, we, as, as I mentioned, we launched on the 13th January 2022. Now it's still uh, IOT period. And of course, this currency will be uh, USD class, and uh, we are offering uh, two class in, in Malaysia. One is USD and also we get tax class. So sales charge will be up to 5%. Uh, of course, uh, annual management fee is up to 1.8%. Annual trust fee is 0.04%. So apparently, I think uh, there is uh, some promotion uh, by Fund Supermart. If you invest prior this period of time, you will get a special uh, arrangement. Yeah, next page, please. So uh, minimum initial investment is uh, USD $1,000 uh, or ringgit Malaysia uh, $1,000 for the ringgit cash class. So uh, apparently, uh, this is it. Over to you, Alicia. All right, thank you, Jason, so much for the fun description. And let us move on to our Q&A session. Okay. All right. Just a moment, yeah? Okay. So there's one question for you, Mr. Supreet. Yes. So the new technology to address climate change will be capital intensive. Uh, intensive, yeah. Would the fund requires very long-term investment horizon? Thank you for that question. I think it's a great question. Let's just first of all address the issue here. Nobody on this call and nobody in the planet expects these climate change to be solved within the next six months or a year's time. But there's plenty of support from governments towards institutions to try and find those solutions that can offer hope to the planet to address these issues. So I agree with you. Just like, let me take a step back. How many of you wish that you, were, you would have held Amazon 10, 15 years back in your portfolio. Of course, it's become a household name today. Many of us wish we had identified NVIDIA in our portfolios six or seven years back. So my argument to you is that if you feel like that, some of these household names, as Bill Gates uh, had mentioned and I alluded to, that many of the next uh, mega caps are likely to come from the field of climate change solutions, the idea is to to capture this investment theme early so that you can benefit with it as these uh, companies become more household names and become giant caps and mega caps over a period of time. So I absolutely agree with you. Do not view this as a six month investment, have a longer term view, 
And as I mentioned, these problems will not solve themselves over the next six months, like technology and technology adoption and evolution didn't take place in six months. It took several years, but the stock prices can tend to discount the future growth quite early as well. We just don't know when. So it's important to be invested when that realization and discounting of the opportunity of growth comes into stock prices. So I'd argue, yes, have a longer term time frame in holding this portfolio. I see. So um, the time frame is usually how many years would you recommend for our investor to hold for these climate change funds? Alicia, I would say <laughs> any equity investment needs to be holding period of two, three years at the very least. Uh, for a strategy like this, if you can have a horizon of three to five years, even better. Three to five years. All right. Okay. So, um, and then another question is right here, yeah? So what's your long-term outlook overall on the general climate change industry? Yes, I mean, um, yeah, the, mm. thank you for the question. It's an emerging field. Uh, it is where, as I mentioned, where technology and disruptors in technology were perhaps 10 years back. So as adoption of technology improved over the last 10 years, like cloud computing, digital transformation, and so on, Technology names benefited from it. Similarly, hopefully I've been able to present to you that governments, institutions, and policymakers are laser focused on this issue. And as companies come up with feasible solutions and ideas, as I presented, like Dale, like Tomra, and some of the other names that I spoke about, like Evoqua, you will see more and more momentum behind some of these industries and some of these names. Remember what I said, Climate change solution providers don't sit in just one sector. They're not tech companies. They can be industrials. They can be tractor manufacturers or agriculture and farming companies, or they could be water, wastewater desalinization companies. They sit across multiple areas. So we're quite optimistic, but again, don't take a six month view. You need to have a longer term view in an opportunity like this. All right. And uh, are those uh, companies that this fund is investing are compliance to the ESG, um, ESG sector? Oh, it is. Uh, Alicia, that's a great question, and thank you for the question. The portfolio is actually extremely high on characteristics which feature very favorably on ESG characteristics. So whether it's environmental impact, clearly showing that it's an ESG fund, uh, sorry, an a climate change solutions fund, is extremely strong in terms of its environmental characteristics. Uh, even social characteristics, like doing something for the community. There, one of the names uh, which was there on one of my slides was Signify, which is the holding company for a brand which we popularly known as Philips, which is doing leading work in electrification of remote areas in my home country of India and many other emerging markets, which are not connected to electricity grid. So they're providing solar solutions to these remote areas, which are currently not linked to the regular electricity grid. So the, this portfolio actually features extremely high on ESG characteristics. I'm just going to make a quick comment. European classification, which is perhaps the most developed one, Alicia, which says classification of ESG funds. This fund is at the highest level of ESG classification amongst all funds Malay available in Malaysia. For your re reference, it's called SFTR classification. All ESG funds in Malaysia are, are currently Article 8. This fund is Article 9. In summary, that's the gold standard of ESG funds. I see. I see. It's very good to know that. Yeah, but a lot of uh, us didn't know about this. Yeah. Thank you so much for the information. And the time is almost up, Mr. Supreet. And thank you so much for your sharings today. Uh, we do, well, indeed, for me, myself, is really an eye-opening uh, session for me because we do talk about a lot of um, about technology and stuff. Yeah, thank you so much for Mr. Supreet joining us today. Thank yep. you for the opportunity and yep. uh, have a great weekend ahead and the rest of the year as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.
Welcome back. Moving on to the ninth speaker of the day, I would like to introduce Mr. Tan Ming Han as he is the Head of Investments of eSpring Alwara Investments. Ming Han joined eSpring Alwara Investments Berhad as a Chief Investment Officer in November 2018. Prior to joining eSpring's Alwara Investments, Ming Han was an Associate Director in Amundi, Malaysia, Sundian Berhad, where he managed regional and domestic equity portfolios for institutional clients from June 2012 to October 2018. Ming Han has past experience in the industry, including Meridian Huang DBS Investment Management and Philip Capital Management, where he also managed both local and regional unit trust funds and discretionary mandates. He has long short equity experience from his working stint as a hedge fund manager in Singapore in 2010. He started his career in corporate finance and brings with him more than 15 years of in investment industry experience. Ming Han holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree majoring in corporate finance and international business from the University of Adelaide, Australia. We would now like to invite Ming Han for his topic, Asia Pacific 2022 Outlook Post Pandemic Future. Ming Han, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's uh, webinar. Um, and I think a lot of people are curious to know what will happen after this uh, post-pandemic era for the asia pack markets. And today, I will share our thoughts uh, from East Spring. To recap a bit of uh, last year's performance, it's always good to know what has happened in history. Last year, we had a huge outperformance coming from uh, oil, uh, Indian equities, US equities, and global equities. So what were, the, what, what were the underperformers last year? Last year, we had uh, China equity severely underperforming uh, the rest of the markets. Uh, followed by uh, gold and including Malaysian equities. Um, this year, what has happened on the next slide, we can see that um, there's a change of fortunes. As you can see on the table here, we can see that S&P, NASDAQ, and also the, the, the rest of the respective markets uh, overall in the, in the US have actually started to decline. So on a year-to-date basis, you can see the first two, first two uh, indices, which is the S&P and also the NASDAQ index actually has declined close to 7 to 12%. Uh, just in the last 20 days of this month. On the flip side, we can actually see that, you know, in Asia, some of the markets have been quite resilient. So you have uh, Hang Seng Index, which is up uh, close to 6%. percent you got the China Index, which is close to up to 2.5%, two and, and also uh, ASEAN, which is pretty flat. So there's actually an ongoing rebalancing going on between fund flows where the money is actually coming up from, is from, coming from the, from the developed markets like the US, and actually there's some fund flows going into to emerging markets like Asia. Why is that happening? I think there's also two reasons. One of, one of it is because you know, the, the growth profile for, for the states, they are actually recovering, coming up from COVID. Uh, they're experiencing a strong uh, demand push uh, in terms of recovery. Uh, the, the economy is actually booming. And you can see here that uh, overall forecast by IMF actually has seen, shown that you know, the overall this year's growth will actually be around 4.9%. And actually driven by uh, advanced economies, which are actually going to grow at 4.5%. However, the stronger growth profile is actually coming from emerging markets, which is uh, forecast to grow at 5.1% this year. And if we, if we were to break it down further, we can actually see that where is this uh, uh, growth is coming from. So from the 5.1% in emerging markets, it's actually driven by a few key markets such as China, India, and ASEAN 5. And these three key markets are actually much having higher, much uh, faster growth profiles compared to, to the developed markets. And I think that's why I think the reason that's partly investors are actually seeking a shelter in a higher growth market, such as the emerging market this year. And when we talk about Asia, where is the next phase of growth for Asia? So we look at you know, a few key, key trends here, and namely the biggest trend that we are seeing now is actually the digitization of you know, uh, the economies of uh, Southeast Asia and Asia. And here we can see that you know, from the impact from on the left hand chart here, you can see that the impact to GDP from below 5% uh, contribution to GDP, this uh, overall impact is actually expected to rise uh, to almost 15% uh, by 2025. So there'll be a huge uh, imp impetus in terms of uh, contribution coming from the digital sectors to uh, Asia PAC's growth. And Asia, we can see on the left hand chart here is continuing to be the fastest growth region in 2022. 
when when people were talking about inflation last year as transitory, sorry, um, I think the picture now is actually more muted. So we can see that in, in the, the inflation uh, expectations actually started to rise. You can see that 10 year break even inflation rates actually started to rise quite significantly. And the reason being is because of the supply chain bottlenecks and uh, the port congestion issues in the States. So there's a lot of dislocation in terms of uh, uh, supply chain moving from the East to the West. And actually that is actually started to ease and we expect inflation uh, expectations to, to come down again. So on the right hand chart here, you can see that supply delivery times have just started to shorten. So what that means is actually seeing that, you know, there's some uh, a shortening of time periods of uh, moving of goods between the ports uh, in, in, in the West. And actually that will actually uh, elevate in terms of the, the inflation uh, uh, expectations actually currently quite high. While, while we look at the, the inflation figures, we also track you know, energy prices. So energy prices actually has been rising. This year alone, we have seen uh, you know, in the last 20 days, oil prices have actually gone up close to like 15% uh, just in the last 20 days. Uh, we can see that you know, who will benefit in, in Asia when, when oil prices are significantly at elevated levels, we, we will be countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, which are actually uh, oil exporters. Uh, the bulk of the rest of the Asian pack countries are actually oil importers. But uh, nevertheless, I think in terms of the, the profile wise, they still have quite significant group profiles. And I think that will be able to sum up in terms of high levels of inflation. And in terms of the management of inflation in this part of the region, we have seen that you know the Asian central banks have said that you know inflation targets for 2022 will be uh, in line with targets. So we have actually seen that, you know, despite the rise of uh, inflation numbers coming uh, in, the, in the West, but in, in Asia, we are still significantly lower compared to, you know, the global financial uh, crisis back in 2008. Um, and on why is that Why is that so? It's because uh, we are coming up from a pre-COVID pandemic levels and um, we are still trying to uh, uh, narrow in terms of uh, the negative output gap uh, from pre-COVID. Okay, so I think now the key concern here everyone will have uh, while having high high levels of inflation will be how hawkish will be the Fed going into 2022. So I think here we've seen the Fed uh, announcement that they are actually looking at a three, uh, possibly three rate hikes for 2022. And this is according to the Fed dot plots uh, uh, from Bloomberg. Um, and we expect that, you know, uh, it will be a gradual process, uh, even though, you know, inflation numbers are quite elevated, especially in terms of the PCE indicator, which the Fed tracks in states and also uh, general CPI numbers in states, which are quite high at 7% currently. However, in, in terms of uh, central banks in this part of the region, except for Korea, I think we would likely keep rates uh, on hold unless uh, severe, severe changes between uh, the Fed expectations in terms of rising rates becomes uh, more hawkish. Uh, would equities be affected if that's the case when rising inflation numbers come in and you know we have a hawkish uh, rate cycle? Uh, not necessary. So on this chart, we can actually show that um, you know moderate inflation hasn't really curbed uh, stock gains in the past. So this is a chart uh, uh, and a, a research done by uh, Alliance Bernstein. Uh, over the course of you know the, the, the past uh, 50, 60 years uh, or so, in terms of uh, having in inflation expectations be between zero to uh, less than 6%. And they had actually have a few observation periods. So in, in the context of this chart here, how to read this chart is basically when inflationary figures are less than zero, you probably can make like 5.2% on the S&P. If inflation figures start to rise between zero to 2%, your, your, your returns for S&P will actually drop to 2.6%. And when inflation figures are between two to 4%, uh, uh, returns from stock S&P gains will actually uh, amount to 2.7%. Uh, and as, as long as inflation numbers uh, continue to creep up, your, your returns on equity gains will actually start to fall off. However, I think in terms of the inflation expectations uh, by, by the, the Fed and also uh, globally, I think it's continued to, to remain um, moderate. Uh, and expectation is that actually it would actually moderate second half of this year when we solve the supply chain issues and the port congestion issues uh, globally. Okay, we have covered the, the monetary policy part of the equation. Now we are looking at fiscal policy uh, equation where we can see that, you know, CAPEX is actually rising. So we have a few uh, catalysts going on. Um, we had a uh, Biden infrastructure plan uh, passed <coughs> by Congress. It's a 1.2 trillion uh, plan that will actually boost infrastructure. So that going into 2022, we expect that to actually uh, uh, cascade down to, to the economy. Uh, we also had the build, 
build better, a build back better plan uh, passed uh, in Congress just recently also. It's actually a 2.2 trillion program. And I think that also boosts uh, significantly in terms of the, the, the US growth profile on the fiscal side. And overall fiscal balance for all these uh, developed markets remain um, uh, uh, not too tight. So it's still very good because we can continue to see the expansion programs being carried out in the respective markets uh, in uh, Europe, Japan, and uh, US. Meanwhile, in Asia, the similar profile is actually happening. We have uh, Asia, ex-Japan, uh, ex-China, KPEX also recovering to the strongest record uh, in recent cycles. And this is even much higher compared to uh, the, the GFC and the tech bubble uh, cycle uh, back in the past. And I think this is what is happening is actually a fall, fall, uh, a fall down effect from uh, the developed markets where there's demand for more goods and services and the, the part of the equation here where we actually supply these goods uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, on the right-hand chart here also, we actually think that, you know, China's debt to GDP ratio will actually stabilize uh, and should uh, uh, come down. And on this chart here, we see that the stabilization period from this year to next year uh, to maintain uh, the overall debt uh, levels in China so that, you know, they can continue to grow. And with rising CAPEX expectations, we also believe that, you know, some of these uh, um, uh, catalysts will actually, you know, uh, boil down to the res respective countries. So earnings, earnings profile for these countries will start to, to rise. Where we have uh, earnings expectations and earnings revisions ratios starting to, to, to factor in an improvement. And most, li most likely we will see a huge improvement when you know, uh, banks uh, benefit from increased uh, capital expenditure and also you know, uh, environment where we have uh, rising interest rates and also a low deposit ratio cost. Uh, furthermore, we also expect you know the the three cattle, uh, three se segments of software, e-commerce, and internet to remain dominant in terms of driving growth uh, in Asia, and uh, particularly in terms of the segmented segmented uh, uh, segments where stronger growth will be coming from will be in the EV EV sector. So electrical vehicle manufacturers, upstream semiconductor players, will actually benefit from the increased uh, uh, need for semiconductor goods in in parts uh, for EVs. And lastly, I think also small caps and manufacturing companies also benefit from the, the, the increased localizations uh, required for, for the economy. And in Asia, uh, we also have to monitor in terms of the economic profile where uh, in the past, we were quite worried when tapering happens and would that actually have a negative impact on the profiles of uh, Asia countries? Uh, I think times have changed, significantly changed. As you can see here, the circle, of uh, India and Indonesia, uh, their current account balances have actually gone back to surpluses. So that's actually a, a positive. Uh, compared to the periods of 2013, uh, we can see that you know, they had uh, a current account deficits, which you know, uh, it was quite detrimental during that period where you had a rising US dollar and the cost of goods were becoming more expensive and, and they had actually a deficit in the economy. However, this time, I think overall the situation has really changed. And uh, on the right-hand chart here, you can see that you know, overall, um, picture for in terms of the yield expectation, we are still having a much higher yield to provide a, a buffer against any rate high expectations uh, in the US. So overall, the yield, uh, yield uh, expectations here are much higher. So I think overall uh, expectations that, you know, we will not be so affected compared to the last few cycles when the, the Fed actually raised uh, interest rates uh, 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 gradually. This chart here will also uh, show where uh, the MSCI Asia X Japan performed relative versus uh, the, the US markets and also against the dollar. So as you can see here, the dollar chart uh, for the past 20 years have actually four episodes of uh, rising US interest rates. So we had the green span area where you know, there was a huge uh, rise in terms of the uh, interest rates. Uh, markets actually uh, move in tandem uh, during that period when, uh, uh, and also we had also the global financial crisis uh, during the period of 2008 and 2009. And subsequently the data tantrum and also the first rate hike after uh, GFC. So in, in this context, actually we can actually have uh, close to a 50-50 probability that, you know, the first uh, two instances when uh, dollar strength was actually quite significant, uh, markets tend to underperform, uh, but the other two periods where, you know, dollar strength actually depreciated, uh, stock markets actually outperform in Asia. So I think in this, in, in this context, it's still too early, too early to call whether, you know, a stronger dollar would be actually detrimental to uh, Asia, Asia pack uh, stock performance. 
while we are still moderately positive on equities, I think we need to have a tactical approach. So like I said earlier on, uh, at the start of this year, we have actually seen uh, US equities uh, underperform. Uh, we also seen the uh, Indian equities also start to underperform because of the expensive valuations. And actually, when in the rising interest rate environment, some of these um, valuations in, in, in this part of the region, it's uh, much higher compared to uh, Asia. So we think that, you know, we cannot rule out, you know, in terms of a reset, in terms of a correction coming from the States. So we have really seen that, you know, the market has really corrected for the NASDAQ close to 11%, 12% in, in the US. I think a, overall Asia could be quite shielded, although, you know, it, it depends on how fast uh, this uh, US dollar strength actually happened in, 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 in the US. So I think overall we see that emerging markets were expected to, to fare better than the developed markets. Uh, we advocate, you know, looking for tactical opportunities. So we... Uh, in this spring, we also try to allocate the portfolio according to the catalyst that we like. So we like increased capex, which uh, will benefit materials and industrials. We are also looking at China because China has actually underperformed last year. And I think there's opportunity in China tech versus US tech um, due to you know, the valuations, which is more expensive in the States. And also there's also room for a catch up for some of the value stocks in Asia. Um, I will probably won't go through in detail on terms of the China's uh, policy measures, but I think this year we have a few few key points that we want to highlight. Is China is transiting its economy from you know overall uh, to to be more uh, equal for their society. So they had this uh, common prosperity team which they played out last year. This year we also expect that to continue. However, I think the time the, the regulators are actually pledging to use taxation, social security, and transfer pricing to basically tackle uh, illegal and. Uh, uh, it is an income. Overall, I think the regulation for fintech, big tech, I think is pretty much over. Uh, we have already seen the news flow actually started to die down. I think now most of the concerns are actually passed past us. This year, we have a few catalysts. We have a, a February event of the Beijing Olympics and also the second half of the year where we have the, the, the China party policy uh, 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 meeting. So where Xi Jinping will actually seek his re-election for, for the second term. In terms of uh, China property slowdown, I think here um, we've already seen you know, PBOC coming out to address uh, the, the shortfall in, in the cash. They actually came out to inject huge amount of liquidity into the system end of last year. And also we also see that they have actually cut the lending rate uh, early this year. So I think overall we can see that uh, the government is actually putting in some measures to make sure that this China property sector does not fall into a systematic uh, risk or a Lehman moment where they become too big to, 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 to rescue. However, in this case, we can see that, you know, China has actually come out to provide ample support uh, to the property sector. And I want to point out in the next chart, maybe you can see that, you know, overall in terms of the, 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 the profile of property in, in the Chinese market, overall property in level to, levels are actually quite low. So the inventory levels in, in China remains uh, quite well contained, which is good because we don't want to have a huge overhang of unsold property in China that will actually contribute to a lot of uh, social issues uh, to, the, to the economy and, and, and the government. However, in, in China, we have actually seen that you know, overall property levels have actually come out much healthier. Some of the corporates are actually much better off uh, especially uh, some of these uh, state-owned enterprises which are, have uh, better cash profiles. Uh, they meet the three red lines uh, guidelines. Um, unfortunately, we know with the headline news of Evergrande, you know, some of the news that came out, this recent picture has actually uh, put a ne negative dent uh, on, on, on share performance. But I think overall, we have actually seen a recovery in terms of the property uh, stocks in China. And this chart actually shows the recovery of what has happened in China this year. So we have a few names. We have China Overseas Land, China Resources Land, Long Four, all recording double-digit uh, returns just in the, in the last 19 days uh, of this, this month. Uh, well, obviously, you can hear the news of Evergrande Group, uh, Agile and Country Garden, but surprisingly, Evergrande Group this year also actually recovered quite, quite, some, quite nicely. It's up 8% this year. So I think in terms of the stock performance in, in, in this part of the region, despite the negative news coming from the States, there's still uh, money to be made. And I think there's a lot of investors looking at all these cheap sectors like such as property to, to, to invest uh, for, 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 for the near term. And Chinese uh, regulatory cycle has actually has been happening over the, throughout the years. So it's nothing new. So every time, you know, we have a boom in the a, in a, in a sector, the, the, there will be a crackdown in terms of having tighter regulatory control. So we have this in the mining, dairy products, uh, liquor products, gaming and drugs. 
So I think this is a very good thing that the Chinese government is actually putting check and balances to make sure that you know all these sectors are actually quite uh, well regulated. So when we look over uh, the course of uh, history, China has actually continued to outperform uh, emerging markets. So China remains the key dominant uh, economy in emerging markets. And I think this trend uh, has actually uh, reflected quite well in over history. However, I think we have to be cognizant that China is actually a, a big country which is uh, normalizing growth. So it's actually expected to slow down. Hence, you will not see, you know, like, huge outperformance in terms of uh, you know uh, the strong alphas that we used to get in, in the past so but i do do have to advocate that you know china will continue to grow because the gdp numbers is still much higher than the, the, the mature markets and this in this context we still expect that china returns will be much higher compared to uh, emerging markets and in terms of the context of valuations we have seen that valuations actually normalized um, for china last year we had the regulatory tightening cycle and then china has actually come uh, come off under huge uh, severe selling and now the valuations actually come back to, to revert back to the mean. When we look at China in totality, we actually uh, want to focus on selected uh, sectors or uh, segments of the, the, the economy. And what we like is actually the, the China Asia space. Uh, we think that the China Asia space is under, under, undervalued because there's a lot of uh, new economic sectors which are actually doing well. And secondly, there's also uh, the opening up of the China A market to, to investors. So as you can see, over the last few years, we have actually seen the index inclusion of China A uh, getting larger and larger. So this is a good opportunity that the Chinese market is actually slowly opening up to global investors. And this uh, market in place is actually having a lot of the so-called new economic sectors. So in terms of uh, new economic sectors, such as uh, renewable energy, advanced manufacturing, and also uh, 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 semicondu semiconductor uh, industries. And one good point is that these industries are actually have don't don't really have you know a huge uh, negative uh, regulatory control because the Chinese want to promote uh, these these businesses to, to become global champions. So making sure that they, they actually have the correct policies in place. So for example, uh, previously they had uh, the EV sector growing. They had actually subsidies for the EV sector, and uh, I think some 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 subsidies will actually be provided. For example, uh, renewable energy, solar, and in the context of solar, I think they are trying to transit from thermal power to, to become more uh, uh, less reliant of thermal power, they will definitely need to boost uh, solar and wind power in terms of uh, energy consumption. Uh, I, would just, I, I would probably skip this chart here because I just ha highlighted that you know, the China A market is actually under-owned. So Ch MSCI China is owned close to 26% by foreigners compared to 10% uh, of Asia's uh, uh, in China. And in terms of the industries, when we look at the industry breakdown for China, we can see that you know CSI 300 uh, has mostly you know other sectors, and the one which is very heavy in internet technology, which was affected by the regulatory controls, was MSCI China, where close to 39 percent of their industries is heavily in the internet space. Uh, for China Asia, they have mostly you know. Uh, most of the, the industrial names. That's why you know, last year they actually were quite shielded. Actually, they, they were in the green compared to you know, MSCI China, which actually dropped close to double digit uh, uh, negative returns. And in terms of the overall demand for foreign ASS, I think it's remained robust. You can see that the chart here, there's always continuation of uh, investors' interest into the northbound equity flows. Uh, when Even though when we had the regulatory shocks uh, last year, uh, stock markets in, in China continue to, to, to see uh, inflows from foreign investors. So uh, to, to conclude, is, uh, to provide you a summary, I think in overall context of Asia, we think that Asia's macro stability is actually on a much better footing. So Asia has actually seen a gradual reopening uh, following the lockdowns of COVID of last year. We have rising uh, vaccination rates and a less of a regulatory headwind to provide um, uh, the growth in matters. I think overall, where we can see the growth coming from is actually coming from ASEAN, Korea, Taiwan, which actually benefit from a stronger US uh, growth uh, without being hurt by rising US rates. And definitely China. China is the, the, the elephant in the room here, which you know, continues to, to grow, uh, despite you know, they definitely have to, to rejig the economy and reprioritize their initiatives uh, in terms of growth. So we believe that you know, China is doing the right thing here in terms of uh, reallocating capital, um, addressing the property slowdown, uh, credit risk in, in the economy and making sure that you know they become uh, stronger from coming out from this uh, uh, economic cycle and overall inflation is actually still manageable so i think in terms of the context of inflation we still best monitoring uh, 
the risk that you know the supply chain disruption is still uh, ongoing. Uh, there's a shortage of uh, semiconductor products required for a lot of industries. And also the elevated energy prices is going to cause inflation uh, numbers to remain high. Uh, not only energy prices, we also look at uh, uh, metals and minings and also uh, soft commodity uh, prices, which actually started to rally this year. So that's a, uh, a key risk to monitor, uh, assuming if you know this, this overall picture does not change, it could actually uh, present a risk for a, a more hawkish type of a rising rate environment. However, in the near term, we expect that you know, the Fed will actually go slow on the rate high cycle after tapering. And uh, in terms of the liquidity profile, we see that it still remains a competitive in Asia. And uh, what has happened, uh, despite the health, the, 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 the pullback in the US, uh, given the expenses valuations, we think that you know, in Asia, the valuations remain cheap. We think that there's money to be made. I already shared the, the earlier few decks of uh, where the money actually flown through, actually has actually come back to, to Asia. We have seen a green uh, outperformance coming back to, to Asia. And I think going into the second half of this year, we probably see uh, once you know, we move from the first rate high in March uh, in the States, we'll get a better picture of how well uh, the Asia countries will stand against uh, the, the rising rate environment. And in terms of how strong this dollar strength will go into the second half of 2022. However, I think the most important key note here is actually China is actually losing its monetary policy, loosening its monetary policy. And I think they'll be providing uh, supportive policies to, to the select, selected sectors to stimulate growth. So overall, I think it's going to be a good picture for uh, Asia Pac uh, stocks, and I think our house has a few uh, number of funds that we we we, we have uh, in the marketplace, and I think you'll be keen to to talk to our agents to to find out more about these these funds. And with that, I I end my presentation. Yeah, hi, Mr. Tan. Yeah, thank you so much for your sharings today. Very insightful. And we do have a few questions flowing in. Let us move on to our Q&A session for now. Okay, just now the chart that you are showing, the inverse relationship between the inflation rate and S&P 500 return rate. So is this a good rule of thumbs? Also, is, it, uh, is the inflation rate in the chart an expected or actual one? Okay, that's a good question. So let me go back to the chart. So this inflation rate uh, provided by, uh, is extracted from the Reserve Bank of South St. Louis and also provide the research done by Alice Prinstein. So it's actually an analyzed uh, inflation rate to so the real, real CPI uh, inflation number that, uh, that is being monitored by, by the central bank. So what has happened here, they actually track the periods of uh, multiple periods. So you can see that you know some, some periods when inflation were less than 0%, or, or near zero uh, during that period of 13 observations, you had the highest gain of 5.2. And when you had inflations less than 6% uh, or above 6%, you had 43 observations during that period and you had a, you only made a subpar performance in terms of S&P of 0.7%. Right. Okay, there's also another one question coming in. Why is that score of Malaysia is in negative territory? Oh, because I think in terms of the Z score, we have um, haven't done really that well in terms of the so-called uh, stock performance. Secondly, also um, a few negative catalysts. I think in terms of the the, the, the fiscal balance of the country, in terms of uh, uh, the debt levels of the country, because we monitor a few few different uh, criteria, and also here looking at the standard deviation on a 12-year rolling basis, which is the price to book, is actually very expensive. So Malaysia is an expensive country. Uh, with negative catalyst, and that's why the z-score is negative. Okay, thank you for the information. And also, there's a few questions regarding bonds. Okay, so do you foresee a uh, bank negram Malaysia to raise our interest rate this year? And should uh, the clients keep their MY bond fund? Uh, in terms of the interest rate environment, I think it will be quite similar to where the Asia central banks around this region will actually uh, try to position. So I think in, in the context of my, my presentation earlier on, I think central banks here uh, will stay pat in terms of uh, you know, rising interest rates too, too quickly um, because the inflation number, official inflation number in Asia remains low. So I don't see, you know, probably uh, unless there's a situation where you have the Fed cycle turning more hawkish. So from three interest rate hikes to four interest rate hikes to even, uh, I saw extreme cases of six interest rate hikes uh, in 2022, that, that could see 
a situation where you know the dollar strength could be strengthening further, uh, then probably Bank Nagara will have to intervene. But in the in the context of the last few interventions, I think Bank Nagara is always proactive. So depending on how severe uh, this inflation number is coming in, uh, for now I think inflation numbers is within manageable levels. As you can see on the chart here, it's still way below uh, some of the previous cycles that we had. Uh, and lastly, also I think in Malaysia, in the context as being an exporter of oil, uh, oil prices remain elevated quite high. Uh, it will actually benefit our uh, country's coffer. So I think in terms of the the, the overall well being of the country, I think the country is still doing okay, fairly okay. So um, on the second question, whether to to sell the bond bond fund, I think it's all depending on your expectations on returns. Okay, so if you are a bond investor and you are looking at uh, you have already made your money over the course of few years period. And I think uh, currently this environment where, you know, usually when the rising rate environment, bond prices tend to underperform. As you can see here, what's happening in the US like, with the rising rate, uh, treasury rates, so, you know, a sell-off in the bond prices. So I think here we have to factor in what sort of, what sort of asset class would you like to hold in your portfolio in terms of uh, whether you're an aggressive investor or you're actually a, a, a balance or even a passive investor with different mindsets in terms of uh, expectation and return. So in this context, if you are having very high expectations of returns, probably holding a bond fund is not, not ideal in this environment. All right. Then uh, besides this, one more bond questions. So um, since now the bond yield over the US is actually affected by the rising interest rate environment, and um, do you see this uh, impact to our Malaysia bond fund as short term shaky at the beginning of the rate hike, or is it have a longer term uh, impact for net for the next three to five years time? Hmm. Okay. So forecast <laughs> forecast going to three to five times is a bit a bit a bit difficult. I think it all depends. Um. There, there are there are few, okay. In, in the context of going back to the the, the question of whether it will be affected by the, the negative sentiment or the, 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 the issues of the hawkish Fed, definitely, I think we can't run away from that because ultimately, the, the, the analogy here I will give, the Fed is like a, a, a cruise liner, a cruise liner in the deep, deep, deep ocean. When they are moving the ship uh, in the ocean, uh, Malaysia, the rest of the region, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Europe, Japan, China, we are all the ships next to it. They are the cruise liner. They are moving ahead with the cruise. And there'll be ripples in the ocean. The ripples in the ocean will actually cascade to the rest of the region. So in, in this context, I think how our, our interest rate path will actually be determined, will actually be determined by, by the external events which is going to be happening in the States. So definitely, if you think, um, in my view, I think, uh, although I'm an uh, equity investor, I prefer to put my money in, in stocks because I think in the rising rate environment, even though we have uh, high inflation, it really stocks tend to do much better over the course of uh, uh, history and uh, bond prices tend to, to underperform. So I think here we, we depend depends on how well uh, Bank Nagara will be able to contain in terms of the, the, the overall uh, contagion effect if there was a really severe uh, rise in the US dollar and also the rise in the, the, the hawkish uh, rate high cycle. All right. So one question regarding the China region. Okay. While well, China now allows uh, renewable energy uh, sectors to grow, uh, so can this client assumes that few years later, when uh, time regulation may come in and limit the growth, just like how the IT sector is experiencing it over the China market right now? Okay, so the IT sector, there's a few key issues that they, they were regulating. Is First of all, was the, the data privacy. Uh, we had you know news flow of DT in the US listing, and then they had uh, data leaks from 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 it. Um, secondly, also the the loophole with uh, China listing their their stocks, uh, tech stocks in in the, in the US via the, the the American depository route, the ADRs. Uh, China wasn't so happy about it because you know they wanted some of these uh, China champions to be listing uh, in, in in China itself, um, and also some of these Chinese companies were going to become too too big. So I think overall, the Chinese government wanted to provide certain check and balances to make sure that these companies actually fulfill the social agenda, which is common prosperity. Um, what has happened is China's economy has grown so big, it's, it's more, it's become very top heavy. So you have, uh, you know, Forbes talking about the, the Forbes 100 uh, richest people, you know, 80% of 80, 80 names come from China. 
and then in this case, you know, Chinese companies like your know, Alibaba, Tencent, are so big, there are a lot of wealth being kept by all these uh, mega rich, ultra rich individuals. Well, however, the, the middle part of the, 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 the society so, uh, is still left behind. So I think here China wants to make sure that you know, the overall structure of the, the, the economy is, is olive shape, you know, a shape of an olive where it's actually brown in the middle so that everyone enjoys this prosperity. For renewable energies, I think it's going to be diff uh, diff difficult for them to you know, uh, put in regulation because they are trying to transit uh, from being too dependent on coal, coal thermal fire power plants because you had 80% of their power generated by thermal coal, which is uh, non-energy uh, efficient and also is um, uh, not carbon neutral. It's polluting the environment. They have to transit that to renewable energy. So renewable energy, we have solar, wind, and this, these two sectors are still fairly small. In terms of uh, solar, it's only uh, less than you know, uh, 100 megawatts. I think they're looking at 300, 300 megawatts uh, by, by uh, 2020, 20, 2030. So that, in that context, I think they need, they need to put in more subsidies, more uh, infrastructure planning into that, that sub segment. And um, I don't, don't see a huge uh, uh, key risk in terms of uh, regulatory control. However, more, more, more likely is in terms of the subsidies. So for example, um, we have EV, buying EV vehicles where the government will give you subsidies to, to buy a cheaper EV cars. Uh, but I think that side of subsidies will probably be removed uh, for, for consumers. All right. Thank you, Mr. Tan, for your explanation on all the Q&As today. Um, all right. The time is almost up. Thank you for sharing today. It's very insightful. And I hope the investor today do grab some uh, knowledge from Mr. Tan. Back to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying with us till now. We are at the second last segment of the entire show today. Thumbs up, 
to those who are still with us since the starting of the event. Moving forward, we are having an interactive panelist discussion for you. Allow me to introduce the panelists of the session today. Mr. Gerard Ambrose, CEO of Aberdeen Islamic Malaysia, Mr. Tan Gan Leo, Fund Manager of CAF Investment Funds, and Mr. Robin Yeo, Head of Regional Investment of Maybank Asset Management Singapore. As we want this to be an interactive panelist discussion, feel free to post your questions anytime on the Q&A chat box and our panel members will try their best to address them. Without further ado, I'll pass the stage over to our FSM1 Research Manager, Jason Wong, to moderate this session. Jason, the stage is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in this wonderful Saturday afternoon. I'm very honored to be here today moderating this exciting panel discussion with our distinguished experts from top asset management companies here. Please feel free to post your questions to our experts and if you have any specific panelists you would like to answer your, your question, you can also uh, mention their names here. Without further ado, let's kickstart the highly anticipated session with a blast from the past. Looking back into 2021, what were some of the key takeaways for you, Jerry? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Jason. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, lessons from 2021. Uh, I suppose uh, one lasting lesson, I suppose, is uh, treat your labor, treat your staff right. Uh, I think a few Malaysian companies fell a bit foul of uh, 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 what they call modern slavery charges. Uh, and it doesn't matter if they're justified or not justified. Once you get into that, uh, uh, as far as uh, a lot of institutional investors, particularly foreign ones, are concerned. Uh, uh, the, the best thing to do is avoid. Um, our portfolio last year did quite well, I think. I mean, we have our standard uh, uh, a high conviction plays that we hold for the very long term, and they pay out a, a fairly decent dividend. But we were overweight uh, our growth stocks, really, um, uh, in the manufacturing, electronics manufacturing sector in particular. Uh, uh, we did rather well, well, and we weren't really worried about um, dividends. Uh, uh, we were more worried about uh, uh, whether these companies were exposed to growth areas in the world. Uh, and that's one of the key lessons we learned last year, I think, that we were slightly overweight, uh, these uh, growth companies, which probably didn't pay out dividends at all. This year, I think, might be very different. I don't know whether that's a, the, the, the latter point I made is a lesson that you could take through till 2022. Thanks, Jerry. How about you, Robin? Do you have any key takeaways from 2021? Thanks, Jason. And thanks for inviting me on this panel to give my opinions. I think the really the key takeaway for me for 2021, I mean, I'm just not really talking about markets, but is the resilience of people right and the adaptability because with COVID, even though you know many countries did not handle it well in general we we are out of it now right and people are going back even though we can't do a conference i'm on this call doing it with all of you now and and i have to say is the resilience of society resilience of markets uh in, in spite of really difficult situations and that's that, that's the lesson to be learned. I, I, I would say that even though there are ups and downs, um, we are adaptable, right? And somehow, you know, people will find a way to overcome the obstacles we've seen, right? So that's my takeaway for 2021. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. In fact, our, our key investment theme for this year, 2022, is called The Show Must Go On, which is pretty much <laughs> wow. what you mentioned just now. Yeah. Good. Let's move on to Gan Leong. Do you have anything to add on? Yeah, so basically, I think in 2021, uh, we were overly optimistic uh, that we can get past COVID, you know, everyone can start traveling again, going back to work. But then, you know, over time, we start to see that, you know, the virus continue to evolve and, you know, from Alpha to Delta to now Omicron, eventually we'll probably run out of Greek letters, you know, alphabets. So um, from what we see is, you know, everything is constantly evolving. Now, um, of course, the biggest fear for us right now is 
whether this Omicron variant will, you know, the next uh, variant that comes up, will it be a bit more lethal than what we see today? Uh, at least for the Omicron variant that we see today, uh, it's highly transmissive, but it's not that lethal. So in a way, it actually, if you think about it, uh, there's uh, light at the end of the tunnel uh, because um, in a way that a lot of people, the anti-vaccines, uh, anti-vax uh, people will be, in a way, be able to uh, actually achieve uh, natural immunity uh, by getting infected with Omicron. Uh. Um, because it's very transmissive. So, and also on the bright side is you know, hospitalization rates are not actually spiking, you know, it's coming down, you know, you look at America, uh, one of the hotspots in New York, uh, your hospitalization rates are coming down. So we think that, you know, hopefully uh, this is the year that we can, you know, get back, you know, to what we, use, we are used to, uh, you know, start to travel again, you know, services can open again and, you know, I, I suppose uh, what we what we learned last year is that you know things are constantly evolving. Uh, so uh, especially it's like the financial markets are uh, nothing's ever static. Uh. Okay, L let's stay with Gan Leong. You mentioned about uh, looking forward into 2022. What are your top investment ideas for 2022? Okay, um, so basically right now, I think at the start of last year, I was actually quite positive on this reopening trades. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm very bullish on the tourism and leisure sector. So, um, but because of the Omicron variant, the Delta variants, uh, the, you know, people's initially borders were supposed to reopen, but uh, again, uh, because of these new variants, the new, new outbreaks, uh, that have been put on stop at this point of time. But I am still bullish because I've seen that, you know, a lot of these stocks are still trading at, you know, 30 to 40% below its pre-COVID levels. So I do see a lot of opportunities in this space. Uh, so I do like the tourism and leisure sector. I do believe that uh, the services sector will come back strongly. Um, of course, the biggest fear I see is... Uh, inflation in the service sector. Uh, right now, we are seeing inflation in the, uh, the consumer side on the consumption end, you know, because people are just buying gadgets, buying, uh, you know, furnitures, buying stuff for their houses, you know, because they cannot spend it anywhere. You know, that's why your, your designer handbags, your luxury watches, the prices are just spiking up. Uh. So from our standpoint, is what we fear is this inflation that we see in private consumption may trickle down to the service sector, um, which is why we are actually quite bullish uh, on um, the tourism and leisure, leisure sector, uh, because I do believe that this sector will eventually do well. Uh. Thanks, thanks for that. Next, uh, let's move on to Jerry. I'm pretty sure our listeners would also like to hear Aberdeen's top investment ideas. Uh... Right. Well, I, I, I don't run the equity desk anymore. I just represent Aberdeen. So uh, it's a little uh, uh, a black box that's driven by my equity team. But uh, as I said, uh, uh, last year, we did quite well by being overexposed to growth stocks. Uh, this year, I, I think, uh, is going to be far more dangerous and far more risky. And we don't have in the world the tailwinds that we've had uh, in the past. And uh, 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 in the last year for the world and even for Malaysia, I think people were looking for uh, return on capital. You know, they were looking for getting uh, a returns on their investment. I think you need to be a bit more careful this year of the return of your capital. You know, you've got to make sure that you preserve capital uh, and your risk management has got to be uh, a lot more uh, rajin, I think, than it has been because... Uh, we're going into some huge tailwinds, you know, if uh, the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, uh, to some extent, the European Central Bank or the Bank of Japan or anything to go by, uh, they seem to be saying, you know, the party's over, uh, we need to tighten monetary policies, we need to uh, raise interest rates. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the tailwinds that we've had from uh, central banks has been massive uh, in 2021. Uh, you know, uh, we ended up the year with this massive stimulus, mainly in the developed markets. I must admit, you know, they were getting helicopter money uh, into people's pockets. So trillions and trillions of dollars and pounds uh, were being given to consumers and they spent it. And this leads to huge surge in growth, so much so that uh, there's not the capacity to, to meet a lot of the demand, which caused this inflationary problem. 
But I think maybe the inflationary factors might be waning a little bit. Uh, in the US, I think the print in December was 7%. Uh, I think there are signs that maybe that number has probably peaked. It depends how far uh, down it will go. But I think this year, uh, uh, we are looking at uh, more of our high conviction plays with strong balance sheets, good cash flows. Uh, and I agree with uh, Ganyong that, uh, who knows? We don't know what's gonna happen, but uh, I've spent uh, a few weeks during Christmas in the UK and uh, my arrival on the 15th of December saw 40,000 new cases of COVID. Uh, when I left on the 3rd of January, it was 145,000 new cases of COVID every day. Um, uh, but in Malaysia, it's fallen to, what, three or 4,000 every day? We seem to have handled it very well. Malaysians seem to be a good deal more responsible. You know, you, my sajatara and, you know, checking into every retail outlet, every office using my sajatara would not be possible elsewhere. But it has paid off. And it, uh, the benefits, let's say after Chinese New Year, if uh, cases don't go up markedly, I think there will be an opening out uh, of uh, uh, the economy. Uh, and I think it does mean good things for the leisure sector, but I think people will be wanting to borrow money a bit. Uh, and uh, interest rates aren't gonna shoot up like they might do elsewhere. Uh, and uh, you know, banks are the best exposure to a pickup in domestic activity. So uh, I think banks are a, a good sector to be based in at the moment. Thanks, Jerry. Back to you, Robin. Can you share some of Maybank Asset Management's top investment ideas? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Yeah, I echo what Jerry says, you know, there's gonna be a big shift in 2022 and actually what we think is quite contrarian actually we think that in 2022 asia will start outperforming the developed markets right last year of course us did really well as jerry pointed out tons of stimulus pushing up markets well actually for 2022 it's a reverse the chinese authorities are loosening right they are providing the tailwinds to the chinese markets and that would i would say pull up the rest of the asian markets like malaysia and indonesia Right. Whereas in the developed world, we are seeing the US and UK tightened by, you know, cutting stimulus and raising interest rates. So what we're going to say, what we're going to see in 2022 is um, Asia would start outperforming uh, the developed world. Now, within Asia, I, I know there's a bit of skepticism of it. Like, you know, in Malaysia, you know, it hasn't, didn't do so well last year. But we think um, in 2022, uh, with a smoother reopening, people are going back to the bars and restaurants and shopping again. Uh, that would boost the economy and i would say in general probably malaysia would do well indonesia of course is a country which uh, has been um it has kind of changed because there's a lot of fdi now going to indonesia for the ev space so i think they are big beneficiaries of of uh, of this trend and that would boost indonesia in 2022 so really the message is that you know asian assets look attractive now because there's tailwinds from china uh, whereas for the developed world, I think you see a lot of headwinds going forward. Yeah, staying with you, Robin, you, you mentioned that you are bullish in Asia, China, Malaysia, Indonesia. Now, we, we all know that investments, they come with risks. What, what are the potential headwinds or risks that you see which could derail this bullish uh, sentiment mm. that you mentioned? Yeah, I think Ganyang pointed out some of the risks already. I mean, stuff like, you know, new variant of... COVID, right, which of course nobody knows. The other thing which probably is very, very important is inflation, right? So Jerry mentioned that maybe inflation is peaking. However, if it doesn't peak and continues going up, then I think it's a really, really big risk for markets because we've already seen in you know, maybe even the first two, three weeks of the year when inflation expectations went up, you've seen the US markets correct. Now, if inflation stays really sticky, uh, you know, rates may have to go up further, right? The, the expectation rates will have to go up further and then they're going to see further corrections. But I think as of now, I, I, we don't expect that. You know, we expect inflation to be peaking. Um, and really back to what Jerry said, you know, a lot of people in 2021 were buying a lot of stuff because they were stuck at home. Um, so order a lot of stuff online and that's why you're seeing a lot of um, in uh, jam ups in, at the ports, supply chain, you know, it's 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 a kind of like a traffic jam over there and that has pushed prices up but of course in 2022 um that would diminish right because people are going to go up to eat to to spend more on services go out traveling um like Ganyao mentioned you know do a little bit of travel um go out to f and b and buy less stuff when you buy less stuff well the supply chains uh problems will ease 
And therefore, I would say inflation should be peaking at least in the first quarter or first half of 2022. So we don't think uh, rates are going to surge, you know, six rate hikes, I think is a little bit too much for me. Yeah. Back to you, Jason. Thanks, Robin. So based on what you said, it seems like the risk and the reward ratio is still quite attractive. The risk is still manageable to a certain extent, whereas the upside potential is too attractive to ignore. How about uh, Ganyong? Do you have any additional risk that uh, you would like to add on? Uh, I think I share the same concern with Robin. Uh, I think everyone is talking about inflation. Uh, inflation is the one that could get off hand. Uh, I do agree that, uh, you know, with the uh, Fed share that, you know, eventually inflation is transitory. It will slowly come down as, you know, people buy less things. But I would say that the bigger, biggest risk I see today with that view is uh, China, actually. It's actually revolving around China because of China's zero COVID uh, policy. So um, the thing is, Omicron, again, is highly transmissive. It's not so easy to contain. And if China doubles down on that zero COVID policy, uh, that will actually add more strain to the current supply chain issues that we see today. Uh, It doesn't take, uh, you know, all it takes is a few pot closures, you know, few manufacturing closures because, you know, in the world that we live in today, the globalization, uh, everything's integrated. So, you know, you can have all the parts in the car of a particular car ready, but all you need is just, you know, a couple of, you know, essential screws from that particular, particular region in China to uh, being shut down or, you know, due to COVID. Uh, then it will really put a strain on the whole supply chain. So our biggest fear would be that uh, whether China will start to loosen up on the zero COVID policy. Because if they don't, um, based on how viruses uh, evolve, uh, the next variant could very well be even more transmissive than um, the Omicron variant. So um, that would be my biggest fear because if the supply chains constraint uh, there, uh, inflation pressures could pile up. And then that will lead to, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve uh, reacting uh, aggressively by raising uh, interest rate too quickly. That's our biggest fear. Okay. M- moving on to Jerry. Just now you mentioned about central banks as well. Do you, do you have anything additional to add in terms of what are the risks that could trigger some central bank policy changes that, that would actually derail this um, positive sentiment in the market? Apologies, I was muted. Uh, speaking globally, and, and I don't put Malaysia, uh, back, put it with the, the developed world in this, but uh, uh, we have had the hell of a party in the world. Uh, you know, we've had quantitative easing and uh, uh, four attempts at removing it uh, since uh, the global financial crisis of uh, 2008. Uh, we've had interest rates at zero, and uh, any attempts to raise them over the past, goodness me, it's uh, two, nearly 14 years have uh, uh, been ineffective. Uh, but this quantitative easing, uh, QE4 is twice the size of QE1 and QE2 put together. It's 50% larger than uh, QE3. Uh, in the developed world, you've also had massive fiscal stimulus to uh, try and you know, if, if uh, the government tells you to go home and do nothing, you're sort of going to break the economy. And uh, if you break it, you've got to pay for it. And they've paid for it by, you know, uh, uh, siphoning all this money to uh, individuals. That's over. I really think that if they carry on with their sort of hawkish uh, talk and, and start to walk that talk, uh, the world is going to see <clears throat> a huge uh, a difference. Uh, that that's a big risk, but I would add uh, that uh, as uh, uh, Robin said, the price earnings ratio and the price to book <coughs> for Asia, uh, and I'd say in particular Malaysia, is, is so out of kilter with the the ridiculously inflated valuations of uh, the developed world. Uh, I think that uh, it makes sense if you want to get a proper return to increase weighting in Malaysia, and at the moment uh, foreigners. You know, don't really have anything in Malaysia. I think we're down at what 20.4% foreign ownership in the market, and a lot of that is BAT UK owning BAT shares, uh, uh, RJ Reynolds, uh, 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 Panasonic, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et so I think we might uh, at last 
be beneficiaries of that? Yeah, stay, staying with Jerry, uh, given that you mentioned these investment ideas and also the risk, well, I'm pretty sure our listeners will also like to hear how you're positioning your portfolios in 2022. Are you increasing, like you mentioned, you like Malaysia. Are you increasing allocation into Malaysia for your portfolios? Uh, well, uh, globally, you know, Malaysia has been uh, uh, either neutral or maybe slightly underweight uh, in our global funds because of liquidity, really. But if you're running okay. a global fund, maybe, and you're running a big fund, uh, maybe there aren't many stocks in Malaysia that are that liquid. And those that are might not be ones that uh, blow our skirts up very much. Uh, regionally, I think we've been neutral to, to, to overweight Malaysia. Uh, but I think you know, the themes that we might be looking at as a whole and as a group uh, uh, are not any different from others. I mean, there is a, a digital future out there. And I think Malaysia is actually quite switched on to uh, things changing. Uh, and there are a number of ways in which you can invest in new ways of doing business. You know, traditional retail seems to be dying a death, but there are uh, other areas for replacement. Um, I think Malaysia is still benefiting from urbanization and concentrating people moving into uh, the cities. And there are various, well, I suppose in simple terms, property developers that might benefit from that. And I think the UK, sorry, Malaysia is just about the only place in Asia, let alone the world, where property prices are doing absolutely nothing at the moment in the residential front. So, you know, I know there is a bit of an overhang, but uh, there are areas where there is a shortage. And uh, if people start to increase their economic activity as touch wood, uh, inshallah, uh, uh, COVID starts to, to die a death, then uh, I think we'll see uh, the property market pick up. Uh, and then of course, uh, re reopening plays, you know, airports. I, I was at KLIA uh, uh, two weeks ago. What a depressing place, there's nothing going on there. But if that starts to pick up, uh, uh, all the services related to it uh, will, will start to benefit as well. And everybody talks about the risks of uh, uh, climate change. There are also huge opportunities, you know, 3.1 billion uh, US dollars to be spent or trillion US dollars to be spent annually between now and 2050 globally for, you know, converting and uh, uh, transitioning to uh, a carbon neutral world. Uh, there are many stocks in the, the power generation sector, uh, the automotive sector uh, in, in which people can benefit. Thanks, Jerry. Let's move back to Robin. So just now you mentioned that you liked Asia compared to developed markets. And also you mentioned some of the risks. How are your portfolios positioned in light of this information that you mentioned just now? Right, I think in general, what we will be doing is uh, because we are a little bit more positive on equity. So if you were, if you look at the balance fund, let's say it's 50-50, then we'll be tilting slightly into equities because you know in the first quarter, the first half rates are going up. So maybe you do more equities to fixed income. So maybe a 60-40. But within that, I would say you, you would probably want to be more over it Asia compared to, you know, the developed world. And and now I would say ASEAN, it's a place we like. I mean, um, China, well, I mean, there's still some issues, but we'll probably rebound from, from next year. So we, we also kind of like uh, China as well. So really, those are the areas uh, where we like in terms of sector I uh, just wanted to point out that, yes, the renewable sector, as Jerry has mentioned, it's a big boom there. And what people don't really know is um, China actually provides a lot of the renewable space uh, infrastructure, right? So if you look at batteries, uh, they are one of the do dominant players in that. They also do the inverters. They do a lot of the, the wind products, the turbines and such. So I think people have done studies and they encompass maybe 60% of uh, the growth in the renewable space. And if you look at um, China market, the auto market, like even last year, um, they sold 30% um, of the total new cars sold were in the EV space, right? So even in Malaysia, we are a little bit behind. And only now um, there's been some incentives to, to for people to buy EV cars, you know, there's no tax on them. But, you know, China's, I think would be, I would say they're ahead of the, the world because now about, more 20 to 30 percent of new cars sold are actually ev cars right um so that's one area where where china is leading and i would say they'll be leading the rest of the world in, into this so those are the areas where i like and i like to hand back to jason thanks finally gan leong how are you positioning your portfolios for 2022 
Okay, uh, within Malaysia itself, uh, we are actually uh, building a position in a commodity place la. Um, because in a rising interest rate environment, especially in the early stage, right, uh, usually historically commodities tend to do well. And of course, if uh, the inflation do persist, um, we are obviously it's going to really help the commodity players. La. So um, why we like this commodity space, uh, particularly uh, in Malaysia, we actually uh, turning a lot more bullish on energy stocks. Uh, I think last year, uh, KL Energy Index was down about 20%. Uh, when compared to other countries or other regions energy index, uh, I think America, the surprisingly, uh, the best performing index in America last year wasn't tech. It was actually uh, its energy index. Uh, and then um, if you look at from emerging markets itself, the emerging market uh, energy index was up about 20 odd percent last year. Uh, whereas, you know, our KL energy index, our uh, Malaysian oil and gas stocks were uh, lagging behind uh, by not a bit, by actually by a substantial amount. You're talking about, you know, 40% uh, performance disparity between the Malaysian oil and gas players with the emerging market oil and gas players. And we're talking about close to 80% uh, with the Malaysian oil and gas players with the American oil and gas players. Uh, despite crude oil going up, uh, significantly like last year to now is I think uh, 80 over dollars. So this is one area we are quite uh, bullish on. Um, if you zoom in further from a micro sector perspective, uh, we do like uh, the oil and gas pipe players, uh, people who provide pipes. Uh, so if you look at the Petronas 2022 outlook, um, you can see that uh, there's a significant increase in the requirement for carbon steel pipes. Uh, we are talking about about eight times increase from 2021. Um, and then if you look at the man hours required uh, from 2022 compared to 2021, we see we saw significant increase as well in that area. So, you know, your oil and gas service providers should start to see uh, benefits or at least uh, more jobs trickling down. And then, um, of course, uh, we have to be very selective because uh, we do know that Petronas have a tendency to, you know, renegotiate contracts, uh, uh, renegotiate lower prices. So what we look for is we look for players that do not rely just on Petronas. So uh, in that sense, the two uh, oil and gas pipe players that we have invested in, uh, they are global players. They do export. They do not rely on just Petronas. They, they supply to Halliburton's. They supply to the regional players. Uh, um, so in that sense, Petronas has less leverage on them. So this is one uh, particular area that we are actually bullish off uh, at this point of time. Uh. And we do think that the disparity will narrow uh, this year. Thanks, Daniel. We do have some, have some very interesting questions from the listeners, from the crowd. For example, what advice do our panelist experts have to give investors about risk management? How would you advise them to, uh, what kind of strategies can you help investors to implement going forward in 2022 in terms of risk management? Perhaps like we can start with Gan Leong. Okay, um, so basically from our standpoint is, um, again, uh, we have to look at your risk profile. Uh, I mean, if you're older, uh, you do have to set aside, you know, some funds for, you know, investing in fixed income and money markets, you know, like a balanced approach, actually, maybe a 60, 40, 70, 30 approach where you have 60% equities. Uh, in the sense that because there will always be volatility uh, within the equity markets. And, you know, if you require income from this uh, particular source of investment, uh, then it's not, uh, not, uh, wise or prudent to actually invest all in equities because there will be volatility and you do not want to sell out during down markets, you know, and I find it very difficult to time the markets, you know, you cannot say that, you know, or maybe I invest right now, I only need the money six months later, but you know, anything, a lot of things can happen within the six month time frame. So I do believe that take a balanced approach, only invest in money that you can afford to lose or at least afford to put set aside for the next three years in equities because there will be risk there. Just take a balanced approach and you know, you need to manage your greed. You know, there's no such thing as, you know, easy and fast money, you know. Thanks, Ganyong. How about Jerry? Do you have any useful risk management strategies that retail investors can implement in their portfolios? Well, as I say, uh, 2022 is very different from 2021. And I've got a quote here from a guy called 
uh, Charles Brown, uh, winning in the investment game means not losing. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you heard a guy called Jim Rogers. He's a very successful yes. billionaire investor. Uh, but he said, uh, the trick in investing is not to lose money. If you okay. compound your money at 9% per annum, you're better off than investors whose results jump around. The losses will kill you because they will ruin the compounding uh, uh, qualities. And compounding is the magic of investing. I mean, I can't highlight enough how, you know, when I first started in broking, it was all about growth and trying to sell ideas about sexy stocks to people. Uh, and, and there was this old timer I worked with who said, uh, you know, if you buy a share and you hold it, what do you get from it? And the answer is absolutely nothing until you sell it. Uh, but unless it's a dividend. And I think, you know, dividends are very important. And uh, as uh, uh, Ganyong said, uh, the 60-40 trade or mixing bonds with equities has been right out of fashion. You know, people think bonds are a waste of time with interest rates at zero and uh, uh, everybody chasing yield, uh, uh, the, the yield of what we get for a uh, uh, 10-year treasury, 1.6, 1 1.7%. Uh, that's if you're looking for return. The market is now just looking for return of capital or safety. Uh, and that's really the philosophy upon which people would invest in uh, fixed income instruments. And I think that uh, you should have some of your uh, money, apart from being in gold uh, and Bitcoin, uh, in, in, in fixed income instruments, because they do give you something. So, and the other thing I would just sort of put a word in is that everybody uh, globally, you know, we've had this ESG uh, growing people increasingly aware of climate change, increasingly aware of uh, 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 basically modern slavery and, and, and good governance. And the plantation sector has been a victim. You know, every kid in Europe mm -hmm. thinks that uh, palm oil equals dead orangutans. Um, well, I, I've read a few ESG research recently from some quite well-known global brokers who are actually now recommending specific palm oil stocks because they are properly managed. They uh, are sustainable, uh, and the lack of sustainability is really more from the soybean oil manufacturers, uh, 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 planters in uh, Amazonian rainforest. Uh, uh, the rapeseed oil business in Europe is massively government subsidized. Uh, the most efficient producer of edible oil is, is palm oil. And I think if they can improve their credibility, and there have been a few statements about shooting orangutans before they shoot you, which doesn't help matters, but uh, I do think the palm oil sector if you pick the right stock, uh, uh, will we'll continue to do well. Thanks, Jerry. Finally, Robin, do you have any risk management strategies? I think the most important risk management for retail investors is uh, diversification, right? I mean, you don't put all your eggs in one basket because uh, for most retail investors, um, one, you do not have the time to analyze the company so thoroughly, right? Number, number two, you may not have the time to trade so frequently to get out of um, stocks which may no longer be doing well. So I would say the, the biggest lesson for retail investors, of course, is to uh, at least practice some diversification. Uh, may, maybe not just stocks, maybe with regions as well, right? And and I would say also to echo what Jerry says, you know, maybe have some and have some bonds as well. And if you look at the Malaysian market, to be honest, at least for Malaysia, rates are higher, right? Your 10-year ringgit rates are closer to 4%, which is quite decent in this in this environment uh, of, of, you know, maybe a growth scare in the in developed world. And, you know, it's far higher than the US 10-year, which is only about 1.7, 1.8. So why, why I was just thinking is that if you look at Malaysian rates, um, quite attractive because even though rates are going up, um, the Malaysian rates are already closer to pre-COVID levels, right? They're already at, almost at four, which was what it was two years ago. So so I would say it is probably more resilient in the face of uh, the US interest rate hikes. And I would say that, you know, if you are a, a person who is maybe a retiree and such, um, then maybe you should have a little bit more allocation into bond the bond space, uh, especially the Malaysian side, because, you know, you're still getting in about four plus percent, right? Which is not, I mean, four percent, which is not too bad. Now, one, so one more thing, if I may, uh, uh, just by in favoring diversification, is that everybody at the moment now thinks that, speaking globally, interest rates are going up. Uh, the Federal Reserve have made no secret of that. I think the market seems to be uh, 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 baking in four hikes this year, uh, maybe more. And that is what 
the Federal Reserve has been saying. But it's called not called QE4 uh, for nothing. And that they've tried this four times or three times already, okay, and they failed. So I don't think they'll be able to do it. There were times when uh, central bankers were meanies, and uh, I think somebody called uh, Kaufman, Henry Kaufman, described a central banker of uh, the 1980s as somebody who learned his training by pulling the legs off ants. You know, they, they loved to cause misery uh, amongst investors. Those days seem to be gone. They're all sort of super nice now, uh, and uh, they are under so much pressure from uh, the government. In the US, for example, I think uh, Joe Biden has to, there's, there's some sort of midterm elections happening at the end of this year. You can't be raising rates, taking away quantitative easing into these sort of conditions. So I think they'll roll over. So when I say this, this supports diversification, don't sell all your growth stocks, because I think over 10 years, you know, those stocks that uh, have, you know, got clear competitive advantage and uh, are, are basically highlighting the, 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 uh, the speed at which things are changing in technology, in terms of online communication, financial transactions, et cetera, you still should keep some, even though they may be outrageously expensive, because uh, I think the Federal Reserve will change its mind. And by this time next year, we'll be just where we are now. <laughs> That's a that's a bold call, Jerry. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, I, I, you can't delete that, can you? Uh, that can't be edited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on, there's a there's a question about the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which would create the biggest trading block in the world. Do you, do you have any opinion? Like, w will it be a key driver or key catalyst for markets going forward? What would the mar what markets will be the key beneficiaries, or which sectors will be the key be beneficiaries? Perhaps uh, Robin could chip in first. Yeah, I mean the RCEP. I won't say it's like a huge catalyst, right? But it's a continuation of uh, globalization, which generally is good for for markets because it provides uh, the supplier and the person who buys lower cost products, right? I mean, and that's been seen in, in the scope of the 30 years of globalization which we've seen um, of course the rcep i would say it's also a way where if you look at it a lot of it are, are asian countries are involved right and what we we are seeing is that uh, in the past globalization was between the east and the west right china becomes a factory of the world exports everything to the us and europe now it's a little bit different now there's probably a still a trade war between the us and and china and what you've seen if you look at it is more integration between china and asia right we are trading more between each asian country right so now even the biggest trade partner in malaysia is china right and we are going to see more and more of that as as uh, we build greater links so we're already seeing that in malaysia because um, in the past when you did your KLIA link, the rail link, it was German rail, right? Siemens and all that stuff. Now, well, we're using Chinese products. Why? Because it's cheaper and just as good, right? Maybe it's half the price, but just as good. So we're going to see more and more of this. And it's just natural because by trading more, everybody benefits, right? Uh, you know, we are getting lower cost things, good prices, more trade, people's lives benefit. Um, the only thing I would say which was bad for globalization is when there are some losers, of course, and losers were those who are unable to come up with value and they were, you know, their jobs were outsourced maybe to China and such. So governments would need to address um, the, the crowd, the people who have been left out now of globalization. And unfortunately, in the West, I don't think they've done a good job in helping those people who unfortunately were left out from globalization. Yeah, so that my RECP is a longer term thing, right? So I would say they just more more trade between uh, trade partners in Asia, and I think that's generally good for everyone. Thanks. Uh, how about Gan Leong? Do you, do you think the RCEP will help Malaysia? Um, from my standpoint, is uh, of course uh, I do believe that you know like uh, I agree with Robin. There are already trade agreements between uh, countries in the ASEAN region, you know, Malaysia with China. I would say that the biggest issue here is actually being able to fulfill orders. Uh, like Jerry uh, mentioned earlier, you know, right now the problems that most companies in Malaysia face today is 
getting the workers, you know, getting foreign labor, you know, to do the jobs, to get the orders done. So until our government is able to address that issue, I understand that the government is trying to, you know, restrict uh, foreign labors from uh, foreign workers from coming in so that they can, you know, boost the employment within the locals, uh, help uh, increase the wages. But problem here is there are just a lot of these jobs that locals do not want to do. Locals do not want to work in construction sites. When they want to apply to work in construction companies, they want to work in the office. They do not want to get on the ground and do the actual work. Or they do not want to be in the factory uh, floors, you know, doing the, you know, actual uh, tedious work, you know, they want to be in the office, you know, doing administrative work. So problem here is not so much, you know, that you don't allow workers in, you know, then the, uh, the local workers will, you know, eventually do this job and fill up these jobs. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so I do believe that, you know, the biggest issue that our country need to address is, uh, you know, getting these uh, corporates, you know, local companies, you know, the required help that they need so that they can fulfill orders. There's no point, you know, getting more orders right now when you don't even have the workforce to fulfill it. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have time for one last question, which I would like to direct to Jerry. It's because you, know, you talked a lot about central banks and stimulus and quantitative easing just now. A lot of our investors are concerned about the upcoming uh, tapering of quantitative easing. Which, does it uh, concern you or is it a, it, will it become a potential black swan event such as what happened in before like the taper tantrums? Yeah, I think there will be, uh, well, we seem to be going through a bit of a taper tantrum right now or, or, or paring back risk because um, so many people have borrowed money to invest in the market. Uh, I remember reading somewhere in the US that something like 40% of loans made this year in the US were collateralized against shares. So if you gear up, there's one bit of advice I would offer to people is don't gear up and buy shares or, or buy... Uh, any investment that uh, involves a bit of risk. So uh, um, the taper tantrum affects the developed world far more than it would affect us. We, we, never, we haven't got anything to taper from, uh, right or wrong. Uh, you know, when COVID came here and uh, the economy shut down and we all went to home, the government didn't have the funds because of a few other uh, uh, foreign debt problems we've had over the past couple of years. Uh, to to so TT money too much to individuals' accounts, uh, but we allowed uh, people to access the employees' provident fund savings to tide them through, and we've come out the other side with, uh, in some cases, some very worryingly low savings for people's retirement. But uh, I don't think uh, we're going to suffer some hangover here domestically from taking away uh, all the alcohol that's been provided to the punch bowl elsewhere. Uh, and I, I, I would say, you know, th they're going to try and do that again in uh, the US. I don't think the Europeans have said that they are going to do it. I think you, you, the Bank of England said they are going to do it. Bank of Japan uh, hasn't been uh, uh, buying so many assets, but they control vast quantities of the equity bond and ETF, particularly J Japan government bond market there. Um, Really, investing for the past few years has been doing what the government does and don't try and fight it. Well, if they try and get out of your face, then you know you've got to be a lot more careful about uh, uh, what you invest in. Uh, I've got a, 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 a colleague who runs a, a hedge fund called Pangolin here, and he, he just said in his latest monthly, he said inflation, deflation, the Fed, interest rates, geopolitics, politics, GDP, technical analysis, globalization, protectionism, Xi Jinping, Biden, Omicron, Evergrande, Boris Johnson. The preponderance of the majority of people to buy or not to buy shares in companies for reasons other than what the company is actually worth is what has given investing legends the opportunity to make their futures. It's not about being particularly clever. It's just about ignoring all the above rubbish. You know, valuations are what it's really all about over the long term. So you've got to Valuations matter now, whereas last year, I don't think they did. Thanks, Jerry. I think that's all the time we have for this session. I believe our, our investors are like me. Have, they have grown wiser after this very useful and uh, 
very interesting session. So now I'll pass on the to the MC again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Okay, it was such a wonderful interactive session today. Let's, let us thank Mr. Gerald, Mr. Tan, and Mr. Robin once again for the insightful explanation. And we hope our audiences do grab some great knowledge throughout the session. Okay, and also thank you, Jason, for helping out. And I shall take the floor over for now. Welcome back. Moving on to the last speaker of the day, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Jerry Lee, and he is the FSM1 Portfolio Manager from the Managed Portfolio Team. Jerry Lee is currently the Portfolio Manager of FSM1 Malaysia. And besides managing the IFAS and FSM1 Managed Portfolios, he is also managing the private mandate portfolios for high net worth clients. Prior to this, he was a Treasury dealer at Afin Huang Asset Management, dealing in foreign exchange trades and money market instruments. He graduated from Tunku Abdul Rahman University College with first class honors. Jerry is also a CFA holder. We would now like to invite Jerry with his topic, FSM1 Managed Portfolios, Key Takeaways from 2021 and Portfolio Strategy in 2022. Jerry, over to you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I think first of all, um, my, my name is Jerry. I'm the portfolio manager with uh, F FSM One. And uh, you know, first before I start, we'd like to thanks everyone for uh staying with us throughout the whole day event. Um, I guess uh, it always been uh, very tough to be the last speaker for the event. And I I know probably many of you are already overloaded with you know tons of information throughout the whole day events. So for my session today, uh, I will try to keep everything short and sweet and strict to the point that I want to highlight to share with all of investors today. 
So let me move on to uh, today's agenda. Uh, yeah, these are the three key things that today I'm going to share with every one of you. First of all, we'll just do a quick recap of the global financial market performance, followed by the uh, a review of the FSM One managed portfolio. And last but not least, which is the most important part, how do we see the markets for the year of 2022, our investment outlook, as well as some of the portfolio strategy, how do we position our investor portfolio for the upcoming years? So without much further ado, let me start off with the first part of my presentation today. A quick recap of the global financial markets performance for the year of 2021. So if you look at the chart here that I put up, uh, clearly you can see three lines and uh, you see a clear divergence between the blue color as between the blue colors and also the uh, yellow and green color lines. So the blue color lines actually represent the MSCI ACWI, which is the global equity market performance. Uh, and the su sub subsequently, if you look at the yellow and also the green color line, which is MSCI Asia X Japan Equity Index, as well as MSCI Emerging Market Index, you no, know, Emerging Market Equity Index. So what we can see here is that clearly we see a divergence, we see a, you know, a contrasting performance between the developed market, which driven the performance for the global equity market. We see a strong performance from US equity markets and also European equity market for the year of 2021. But oppositely, you know, if you take a step back and look at Asia and Japan equity and also emerging market, they perform rather, uh, the performance is rather disappointed in the year of 2021. And let's discuss a little bit about you know, the factors that uh, contributed to the poor performance of some of these regions. First of all, if you think about it, uh, if you're still able to recall in early 2021, the vaccination progress is actually way faster in most of the developed market like US and Europe. I think if you take a look on most of the emerging market and also Asia and Japan markets, you know, this country, you know, we started our vaccination program quite late, you know, somehow in the late of second quarters or early of third quarters. So that's why, you know, in the first and second quarters of 2021, the overall economy recovery has been hit by another wave of our COVID-19. And subsequently, if you also take a look on the way those government that handle all this pandemic is actually quite different in the Western country compared to most of the Asian country. You know, uh, they are more lenient. Uh, they are more, you know, if you look at in, in some of these Western country, they don't really see it as you know, a key risk to the economy when it comes to the COVID-19. That's why if you look at it, you know, in, over in Europe and also in most of the US uh, country, we don't see a total lockdown uh, after, after the first lockdown in 2020. But whereas if you look at most of the Asian country, we also see on and off regularly, we, so, we still see a lot of uh, you know, some lockdown in certain places in most of the Asian country. So that's why it's actually affected the overall economic recovery in Asian and emerging markets, which affected the overall equity performance for most of the Asian and also emerging market equity. And the other key factors that has affected the overall investment sentiment in most of the Asian equity market is the regulatory crackdown in China. I think if you are still able to recall somewhere in um, March and April, uh, no, uh, Alibaba, company like Alibaba, Tencent, and Meituan, they've been investigated and been fined by the Chinese government. And somewhere in uh, late last year, you know, uh, Didi.com, which just listed in uh, NYSE, they also mentioned that they plan to delist from NYSE and back to, uh, back to Hong Kong. So these are some of the regulatory crackdown that happened in China, which affected the overall investment sentiment, which affected a lot of the tech giants in China. If you look at share price like Tencent, Alibaba, it dropped to a certain extent, it dropped 60 to 70. So those are the key factors that has affected you know, most of the uh, investment sentiment, particularly in China itself. So if we take a look uh, on the performance for the global equity market, so we can see clearly, like I mentioned just now, there's a clear divergence between the developed market and also the Asian and emerging market. But moving into 2022, we have a different view. We do think that this year itself, it could be a year for Asian equity, particularly for China and also China tech companies. You know, we see a chance of a strong rebound within this market, which I'm going to share with you later on. Next, if we take a look on uh, the bond market performance, so beside equity market, you know, we also take a look on the bond market performance. I believe a lot of our investors, especially uh, for most of our investors who have invested or who have investment experience in the local bond market, Malaysia bond, you have enjoyed a very decent returns by investing into the local bond market over the past couple of years since 2017, 2018, 2019, or even 2020. We have been enjoying a mid to high single digit return by investing into the local bond fund. 
But uh, somehow in 2021, it wasn't a very good year for the bond market. No, no matter it's Asian bond, Malaysia bond, global bond, or even the Asian high yield space. I think Asian high yield was a segment that been badly hit uh, by the slowdown in the property sector in China as well as the Evergrande case. Uh, but if you take a step, uh, look on this, global bond market or even particularly in Malaysia, the Malaysia bond market, what has what has actually caused a drawdown or correction in, in the in the local bond market? I think the key factors is because of the expectation of the monetary policy moving forward. We're actually seeing uh expectation of a higher inflation rate, you no, know, it not just in Malaysia but globally, because of the supply chain disruption of a higher commodity prices, this has also translated into a higher inflation. And subsequently, Market participants, investors also start to think that you know, probably the central bank in, in most of the country, they will start to plan to tighten their monetary policy. And that's exactly the factors that contributed to the drawdown in, in the bond markets, partic uh, particularly for Malaysia. We also see you know, investors start to price in, you know, probably there will be one rate hike for bank, uh, uh, bank that are going to increase the interest rate by the end of this year itself. So I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the expectation has sort of pricing saying that you know, moving forward, like it or not, you know, people it, it, towards the end of 2021, right, people are still wondering that will there be a rate hike in the year of 2022? But at this point in time, it's no longer a question of whether or not there will be a rate hike. It's more like when will be the first hike happen, especially in US. Initially, we are seeing that you no know, expectation is that probably there will be one hike by the end of 2022. But right now, I mean, if you look at the market's expectation, the first hike is likely to happen as soon as by the end of first quarter of this year. So these are the things that these are the factors that has overall affect the global bond market, particularly the local bond market. Then probably the next question that investor will ask is that, should I continue to put my money in bond market? I think this is a, a, a very, really a question that we need to further discuss on the later part, which is on the last part of my presentation, to share with you on the overall outlook for the bond and also for the equity market and how do we actually position our portfolio. On the rising insurance environment, how should we actually position our portfolio between the two asset class, you know, between the equity and also fixed income? <clears throat> Next, uh, I'm going to do a, just a quick review, a portfolio review for our portfolio for the year of 2021. So what we can see here, uh, overall, this is the overall performance for our balanced portfolio and also aggressive portfolio performance throughout the year of 2021. And later on, I will actually share with you the absolute performance figure. But just to take this chart to explain a little bit on some of the portfolio changes, some of the portfolio action that we have taken uh, for our investor over the year. Um, if, if, we, if we start off with, uh, towards the left-hand side, in January last year, 2021, uh, early January, we have actually uh, made the decision to reduce our China exposure and also reduce our overall technology exposure for our portfolio because uh, we have been seeing the valuation for China equity and also the valuation for the global tech as a whole has come to a very stretch level. Uh, and, we, and we think that it could be a right time for us to take some profit off the book. So we have actually reduced our exposure from China. We have reduced our exposure from technology for the conventional portfolio. Uh, subsequently, we reallocate the capital back into the European equity and back into emerging market equity. So if you think from that perspective, you know, our action to allocate capital from China and technology to European, it seems to be a good move because uh, last year was really a good year for the European equity as a whole. But the decision to allocate into emerging market has somehow contribute, uh, contributed negatively to the overall portfolio per, uh, performance. And in February, uh, we have also made a decision to replace uh, our global funds for our Islamic portfolio. And we have also added a new technology exposure for our, uh, for our Islamic portfolio because back before February last year, we don't have any specific technology exposure for our Islamic portfolio. The key reason is because we don't have such a fund within the Shara compliance space. space. So that's why uh, after onboarding a new Shara compliance technology fund, we actually made the decision to add this technology exposure into our Islamic portfolio. And in May, uh, we have actually reduced our Japanese equity exposure. Uh, and also we increased back our overall technology exposure for the portfolio in the month of May. 
Subsequently, in July, uh, we have made some changes to replace the Malaysia equity funds and also our China equity funds. Uh, subsequently, we also added an Asian technology funds. It's also a new fund that we have just onboarded in, into our platform, but we see opportunity within the Asian tech space. Uh, we think that the valuation has come to a very attractive level, but unfortunately, you know, the weak sentiment continues to prolong for the whole year of 2021. Uh, you know, that's actually contribute uh, that decision to add this Asia technology fund to the portfolio has actually contributed negatively to the overall performance of the portfolio. And uh, another decision that we have made in the month of July is actually to switch uh, most of our MIR H position for our equity exposure to the non H exposure because we don't we we don't see uh you no know, we actually see the limited upside potential for ringgit and we see a uh, potential of uh, depreciation from the ringgit perspective. So we actually uh, started to move our exposure from ringgit H to non H class. Yeah. And in September, uh, we have made some uh, changes to our both our conventional and also our Islamic portfolio. For the conventional, conventional portfolio, we have replaced our Asian technology fund with a specific China technology uh, fund, which is the Hong, Hong Kong Tech Index Fund. It's a fund that fit into the Hang Seng Tech Index, which is um, a fund that provides us with a pure China technology exposure. So subsequently, in the month of September, we also think that uh, it could be a time for us to increase more of our equity exposure because we also think that uh, at that point in time, we do think that the inflation rate will start to uh, stay at a high level and you know, uh, money, monetary policy tightening is really a matter of time. And in such an environment, we do think that there is a better chance for equity market to outperform the fixed income market. So we make a call to increase our overweight equity from 2.5% to 5%. And for our Islamic portfolio, we have also replaced our ASEAN fund, uh, previously was the main man created China ASEAN fund. Uh, we replaced that fund and we also added a China A exposure for our Islamic portfolio. Back in uh, December last year, uh, which is the last action that we have taken for our conventional portfolio, we increased our overweight position in Asian high yield. We, back then, we only have about 10% of our fixed income exposure in Asian high yield space. Uh, we make the call to increase the exposure from 10% to 15%. So that those are the action, those are the investment action that we have taken uh, for our portfolio in the year of 2021. And next, I will share with you all in terms of the portfolio performance for our portfolio. So you can see uh, over here, you can see the performance for year of 2021. Our aggressive portfolio actually delivered a returns of 7.1%. Uh, Balance portfolio delivered returns of 3%. Uh, like I mentioned just now, last year wasn't really a very good year for the fixed income markets, specifically the local bond fund, or especially the Asian high yield segment, which had hit about 15 to 20% down in the year of 2021. So those, but those segments has actually dragged down the overall performance for our conservative portfolio. Uh, and if you look at for the Islamic portfolio for the year of 2021, for our Islamic portfolio, because we don't have exposure to the foreign bond, uh, foreign bond fund, especially the Asian high yield. So the performance is rather resilient within the conservative space, about 1.3% positive returns for our conservative investor and about 6.5% returns for the aggressive investor. So over, over a longer horizon, you also can see that you know, for our conventional portfolio, now, on a three-year annualized basis, the performance ranging from 5% annualized return to 14.3% annualized return for our aggressive portfolio. Whereas for SME portfolio, which we started slightly later, we started our SME portfolio in the year of 2019. So we look at a two-year annualized return perspective, uh, the re uh, annualized return over the past two years ranging from 4.8% for the conservative portfolio and also 12.4% for the aggressive portfolio. So those are the performance of our conventional and also Islamic portfolio over the past couple of years. <clears throat> and if I move on to the last part of uh, today's sharing, which is also one of the most important part to share with everyone in terms of the overall investment outlook for 2022, and also how do we position our portfolio moving forward for the upcoming years. So what, before I start to share a, a little bit more on our portfolio strategy and also the investment outlook, I think one particular question that a lot of investors tend to ask at this point in time is really about the rising interest rate environment. I think um, for some of you who are, you know, who are having some financial background, probably from a theoretical perspective, you always say that 
on the rising interest rate environment, it, it wasn't a very good situation or it wasn't a very good environment for the equity market. So oh, traditionally, people always take thing to think, uh, tends to think that you know, if interest rate continue to go up on a rising interest rate environment, it will actually affect the overall equity performance. So if we take some of the historical performance as an example, we can see clearly uh, between between the period of 2003 to 2007, there is a period where we see rising interest rate environment and also between 2015 all the way to 2018, 2019, we also see a rising interest rate environment. So if, if we try to zoom into a spe specific or a particular uh, uh, period, you will actually see that there will be volatility within the equity market, especially when time that you know, there is some announcement, uh, announcement from the central banks. There will be some volatility here and there if you try to zoom in into a particular period. But let's zoom out from this chart and you can see clearly that you know, between that period from 2003 to 2006 or even 2015 to 2018, 2019, although interest rate is on a rising, interest rate, uh, is on a rising trend, if you look at the equity prices, it's also on a rising trend. The most important factors and the most important uh, element to us is really when we analyze the equity market, it's more important to look at the fundamental itself and also valuation of the market itself. Uh, try to think about one thing. I think there's two perspectives that we really need to consider when we, uh, when we think about the rising interest rate environment where we hit the equity market. First of all, it's really when you think about a rise, during a rising interest rate environment, it means that it will be, a, it will be a, when investors want to invest into a particular asset class or if they want to invest into a particular investment product, the opportunity costs tend to be higher and higher during the rising interest rate environment. And it, under such scenario, right, investors will actually start to look for asset class with a higher growth potential. So that's why if you look at it, sectors, equity or equities or companies with a higher growth opportunity, those are the segments that investors tend to chase after. That's one perspective. The other perspective is that try to think about it during the beginning, at the early stage of a rising interest rate cycle, investors actually tend to stay away from fixed income assets and we will see more capital being moved into the equity market. The key reason is because uh, during the early stage of the rising interest rate cycle, we all know that uh, the bond prices is actually negatively correlated with interest rate. And why should I actually lock in a, a much lower yield you know, at this point in time? I, should, I will actually wait for two to three years later, wait until there is a peak of the interest rate, uh, you know, interest rate that being set on a global basis. You know, then only I consider to move my asset from all these high growth sector or high growth asset class into the safer fixed income asset. So these are the two perspectives that we think about it uh, when we really concern about the rising interest rate environment. So from our perspective, uh, we don't think that rising interest rate environment could really hit the equity market badly. But one thing for sure is that do not expect a broad-based rally, a broad-based recovery within the equity market like what we have seen in the year of 2020. Because during an environment with a more tightening monetary policy, a more, uh, uh, with lesser liquidity in the financial system, we don't expect a broad-based rally within the equity market. So we have to be more selective when it comes to picking some of the asset class, when it comes to picking some of the funds into our portfolio. And if I move on to the next slide, uh, when it comes to our inter-asset allocations, uh, for the year of 2022, we continue to like equity and we expect equity to outperform fixed income asset in the year of 2022. So at this point in time, we are holding a 5% overweight in equity and we're actually underweighting bond by 5%. There's a few reasons why we actually overweight equity and why we think that equity could outperform fixed income. The first thing is because of the rising vaccination rate globally. Uh, if you think about it, like I mentioned just now, in the first and second quarter of last year, Asian and emerging market, they couldn't really benefit from the recovery. You know, some of these countries, some of these regions, they're still being hit by the second, third, or even fourth wave of COVID-19. So that's why at the current point, you know, we are, we are seeing rising vaccination rate. We do think that you know, uh, a lot of these Asian and emerging market, they are standing at a much better position to capture the global recovery. Secondly, we also see a very uh, strong recovery within the corporate earnings. I mean, if you look at the corporate earnings that have been released for the second and third quarter of last year, we continue to see earning average revision. We continue to see earnings start to beat, uh, you know, earnings continue to beat expectation. So these are the strong factors that we think 
matters to a value investor. Um, there's a lot of factors that we need to think. We need to really think about it. You know, things like, for example, like trade. In the past, we have trade war. Right now, we have COVID nineteen. You know, we have the lockdown in China and so on. So these are some of the noises that we have been hearing in the markets. But for us. As a value investor, what is really more important is really on the fundamentals and also the valuation of the specific segment that we're investing in. Last but not least, uh, on the rising interest rate environment that I mentioned just now, we do expect a uh, fixed income asset has a, a much lower chance to outperform. So that's why with, with this kind of a factors, we do think that for the year of 2022, it could be another equity year. Last year itself, it was an equity year. And this year itself, we think that it could be another equity year. <clears throat> Within the fixed income asset, like I mentioned just now, uh, although we see uh, um, much lesser opportunity, but there is one space particularly that we like, which is the Asian high yield segment. I think if you all have been following the cases very closely, uh, the Asian high yield space have been affected quite badly over the year, uh, specifically because of the slowdown in the China property sector, and secondly, because of spillover effect from the Evergrande case. So overall, if you look at uh, the Asian high yield segment, right now we actually, I mentioned just now, we're actually holding a 15% tactical exposure in Asian high yield. We're actually underweighting our position in short duration, Malaysia short duration and long duration bond fund. So we are actually putting uh, about 50% of the total fixed income exposure in, into this Asian high yield. There are a few reasons why we like Asian high yield. First of all, like I mentioned just now, if you look at the overall economic uh, situation in Asian country, they're actually on the right track of recovery. Uh, and because of the overall economic recovery, moving forward, we could actually see a much lower default rate. And subsequently, from the monetary uh, policy perspective, we do think that there is a lesser pressure for the Asian central banks to really tighten the monetary policy as aggressive as uh, some of these developed markets. So on the monetary perspective, we think that the policy overall could be more supportive as compared to the developed market. And uh, like I mentioned just now, you know, and one of the key reasons that trigger or cause a sell off, a significant sell off within the Asian high yield space is because of the uh, Evergrande case. And if you look at the overall uh, Asian high yield segment, what we think is that the sell off is more of a sentiment driven instead of a fundamental driven. Hence, if you look at, at the current point, we are seeing double digit yield to maturity within the Asian high yield space. I think the yield to maturity at this point in time is about close to about 12%. Now with double digit of yield to maturity, we really see very attractive opportunity within this segment. So within our portfolio, within our fixed income portfolio, we are actually holding a 15% of our tactical allocation into this Asian high yield segment. <clears throat> Uh, and if I move on to the equity portfolio, so these are our exposure towards the various equity market in our portfolio. Right now, just to sum it up, right, right now, we are actually underweighting uh, US and European equity. We underweight Malaysia. We only hold about 5% of our actual exposure in Malaysia. Uh, at this point in time, if you think about our technology exposure, way, uh, way in early 2021, we are having about 10% exposure in global technology, which is the, the US technology space. So right now we have cut our exposure for global tech significantly. We cut by half, and right now it's only about 4.8%. Uh, the, the, within the technology segment, the space that we really like is China technology. We are holding a 2.2% overweight in China tech, and in our portfolio, actual portfolio, we are actually having 7.2% of our exposure out of our total equity exposure in the China tech space. So uh, I won't go into details on each of this market or uh, for our overweight and underweight position, but there are two markets, there are two markets and segments that I would like to highlight for today's session, for today's sharing. First one is China equity market as a whole. Um, we do believe uh, China equity market has likely bottom and uh, for the year of 2022, it could be a contrarian back for China equity market. If you think about China equity market in the past one year, because of the power shortages, uh, because of the slowdown in property sector and also the regulatory crackdown, the growth slowdown in China has actually came to a level that you know, we think the policy, policy makers can no longer ignore. And this exactly happened over the past couple of weeks. We have been seeing PBOC, uh, the, uh, the China Central Bank, has started to cut the interest rate 
has started to cut their triple R reserve requirement ratio. So this action have proved, uh, you know, if you think about it, this action that have been taken by the PBOC is totally opposite of what we have been seeing in the developed market. You know, in US, we have been seeing Fed uh, talking about rising the interest rate, but in China, they are cutting the interest rate, they are cutting the triple R to support the overall economic growth. So what we think is that right now, we are actually seeing a more supportive uh, monetary policy, but we think that uh, moving forward, we will continue to see the, not, not only from the monetary policy perspective, but also from the fiscal policy perspective, we are going to see a more supportive policy to support the overall growth for China economy. And because of this, we, we do expect that moving a few quarters down the road, we are going to see a positive or upward revision in China GDP and also in China earning estimate. So these are the key reasons why we think you know, in, in the year of 2022, it could be a year for China equity. And because of the, if you look at the current pricing, look at the current price level, we think that a lot of the negative news has already been priced uh, in, in the equity markets. <clears throat> Another segment that I would like to highlight, which is also specific to China, but it's more specific, which is China digital economy, uh, the China technology segment. I believe I mentioned just now uh, in the past one years, the China tech, Know, company like Alibaba and Tencent they has been hit quite badly. This company from the peak levels, their prices have dropped more than 50, 60 percent. You know, uh, but what we are seeing right now is that uh, people, you know, when, when we talk about China, when we talk about China tech, I think uh, one of the key questions that a lot of the investors they tend to have is that uh, investing into China, it, it seems to be like, you know, policy risk at this point in time is seen to be the biggest risk for China equity market. But try to think about it, take a step back and think about it. Over the past five years, 10 years, uh, policy risk has been the key risk that we are taking when we want to invest, when we make the decision to invest into China. So it, you know, this is not the first time that we are seeing policy risk when it comes to investing into China. But one thing for sure is that if you think about all this policy, all this new policy, new regulatory framework being put in place in China, it is actually meant for you know, the future of China meant to deliver a sustainable growth for the China economy and also for the respective sector. So we have been seeing more and more companies within the tech space, they have actually completed their ratification as required by you know, the new regulatory framework. And a lot of these companies, they do acknowledge the fact that if they want to survive and they want to operate in China, they have to follow the new guidelines set up, uh, set in by all these policy makers. So that's why we think that you know, uh, what we have, what have been done in the past six months or nine months is really for the benefit of the Chinese people, and also it is also to make sure that the the technology sector in China as a whole they will be able to register a more sustainable growth in the future. And don't forget one thing, 2022 is really a politically important year for China because the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, they are going to host their 20th uh, National Party Congress in November, which this is going to determine whether or not uh, presidency is going to continue another presidential term. So usually during such a politically important year, uh, the Chinese, Chinese policymaker, they tend to prefer uh, social and economic stability. And if you also take a step back, step back and, and think about it, why they would like to implement and put up so much of uh, new guidelines to, to, to regulate the tech industry and also to, uh, to regulate the property sector as a whole. Uh, another perspective to think about it is that it's also, it could be also because the policymaker, they want to set a low base for the year of 2022, you know, for the country to grow much stronger. And you think about it, after cleaning all this mess in 2021, you know, we are actually having a lower base in 2022. And it's actually set a, a much stronger stage for China economy to grow much stronger this year itself. <clears throat> One very important thing is that uh, apart from sorry, all those Jerry? factors, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Jerry. Uh, it's going. Uh, it's moving to four thirty right now. Okay. Uh, so you need to. You might need to speed up a bit. Yeah, I think this will be my last slide. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh with this slide, I, mean, I mentioned just now, apart from all those uh um, factors that I mentioned just now, from the fundamental perspective, what very important is that if you think about with all this reg regulatory crackdown for the year of 2022 and 2023, the China tech sectors as represented by iShares Hang Seng Tech ETF, they are still expected to register double-digit earning growth of about 15% and 20% 
for the year of 2022 and 2023. So by giving, a, by giving them a, a PE ratio price to earnings of uh, 30 times, we do expect uh, upside potential of more than 80% for the China tech sector by the end of 2022. So those are the factors that I mentioned why we actually like the China digital economy, the China technology sector. So to sum up my presentation for today's session, uh, you know, we like equity market uh, this year for the year of 2022. We do think that equity market could outperform fixed income asset. And uh, we are actually overweighting equity by 5% at this point in time for our portfolio. Within a fixed income segment, we see value within the Asian high yield. We are actually keeping 15% of our total fixed income exposure in Asian high yield while underweighting the Malaysia bond. Within the equity space, we like Asia and Japan equities particularly China and also China technology. So we expect this segment to record a very strong turnaround in the year of 2022. Yeah, so I think that sum up uh, my presentation, my sharing for today's session. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from the crowd and we are happy to answer any questions. Yes, Jerry, please move on to Q&A session right now. You have okay, sure, minutes. no problem. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we have uh, one question that asking about why don't the managed portfolio invest in ETF instead of just unit trust fund? Uh, yeah, I think this is also something that in our pipeline, uh, we're actually considering to uh, include some of the ETF into the portfolio, but uh, it, it won't happen so fast in, in, in the next few, few months time, but uh, this is definitely in our pipeline. And moving forward, we are going to have some ETF in the portfolio. But of course, when it comes to ETF investment, uh, I think... Maybe I, I need to clarify a little bit because when we think about investment within unit trust and ETF, people will always think that it's better to invest into ETF because uh, ETF, the cost is much lower. But we need to also uh, you know, think about which kind of a sectoral exposure or which are the geographical allocation that we want to leverage on ETF because not all markets, you know, not all ETF are at profit for, for, for different uh, equity market. For example, if we want to invest into China equity. If I were to invest into Malaysia equity, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be using ETF because there is a higher chance of the uh, unit trust fund to really outperform the ETF on this kind of an inefficient market. So that's why when it comes to considering whether or not to include ETF, we also have some of these uh, uh, factors to do consider. <clears throat> Yeah, so maybe we have another question asking about uh, equity goes up when interest rate goes up. Previous interest rate high, the equity did not go up as steeply as seen recently. Yeah, so I think we need to think about, uh, I, I think this is mainly referring to uh, the, the steep rally in uh, equity prices. I think this is mainly referring to the US equity markets and you are right to say so because U.S. equity market is also one of the markets that we are currently underweighting. From the valuation perspective, uh, you know, U.S. or U.S. technology, the global tech space, we do think that the valuation is really at a stretch level. That's why we are actually cutting our exposure from this space. But if you think, take a step back and think about the rest of the region, like Asian, uh, like China, or even emerging market, these are the markets that we don't really see a strong value within the equity price. And these are the regions that we really see plenty of our investment opportunity. So that's why there's a key reason why in our portfolio, for this year itself, we are actually overweighting more towards the emerging market, Asian, particularly China equity. <clears throat> um, I think there's another question asking about with the reason 11, close to 11% drop in NASDAQ. Uh, and also with limited funds, which would you choose to invest in between US tech stock, China A, and also China H share? Yeah, no doubt that, you know, NASDAQ over the past couple of weeks it has dropped more than double digit. Uh, but from our perspective, from the valuation perspective, we still think that uh, the valuation for NASDAQ for the China, uh, for the US tech, I still actually had a at a higher end compared to China A or even China technology sector. So at this point in time, our preference is actually still China markets, particularly China A or, and also China technology sector. These are the two segments that we really like at this point in time, despite that, you know, if, we, if you're really comparing the recent performance, the recent two weeks performance, it seems to be China A and also China tech has actually outperformed the NASDAQ. Uh, but 
uh, we don't just look at valuation over a short period of time because if you really look at the whole picture as a whole for NASDAQ, for the US tech and also for China or even China tech, we really see uh, quite, quite good opportunity within this China A and also China tech space as compared to the US tech. All right, Jerry, the time is almost running up. So uh, maybe, maybe you might take, yeah, take, yeah, we two take more one more question. question. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, when you say you expect equities to outperform uh, fixed income, do you mean that equity will have higher return? Yes, yeah, th that, that's the that's the key key uh how, there's a key understanding of this uh outperform means the key the 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 meaning of outperform means that we do expect equity to deliver a higher return compared to the fixed income asset in the year of 2022. Yeah. Wow, that was really a content pack day for myself and I'm sure for all of the viewers back at home too. What about you, Alicia? Well, it's indeed a content pack mm. session for me too. Mm. Nevertheless, I managed to grab some market updates mm. and mm. insights that are beneficial for my upcoming investment mm. in FSM1. Mm. I hope the audiences find the insights as practical as I do. Mm. That's really great to hear. So for me personally, I know one thing for sure is investing can be a very emotional journey if it's done on a short term horizon, right? So I will take the nuggets of wisdom shared today by the speakers to apply to my long term investment thesis. Yep. So not to forget, uh, we are here to remind you once more that in conjunction with our What and Where to Invest 2022 event, we are offering a 0% sales charge for all unit trusts from participating fund houses and also 0% subscription fee on all FSM1 managed portfolios valid until 28th of January. Isn't it great? Yep. So to our investors at home, mm. take this opportunity to add into your portfolio by heading over to www.fsm1.com.my mm. and also to enjoy this one week only special 0% sales charge promotion on the participating funds and FSM1 managed portfolios. Yep. So to our lucky draw contestants, thank you so much for your participation and to the winners, you will be contacted via email in the coming days. Hmm, I shall keep an eye on my email inbox to test my luck then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you should. Okay, so good luck on that. But um, please remember to check your inbox frequently to claim your prizes, okay? All of the participants today can be the lucky one. So stay tuned for the winner announcement. Yeah, last but not least, to the participants that are celebrating Chinese New Year this year, we would like to wish you a Kong Si Fa Tai. Stay healthy, wealthy, and safe in the tiger years ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for staying until now. My name is Ferris. And I'm Elisha Tan. So we are signing out for now and we will see you again next year. Goodbye. Bye.